Hello, hello, the uh, Danger Noodles. It is I, the Great Dark the Bright, and uh, yeah, um, the best of 2022 is gonna be delayed. As much as it's gonna suck, so you know what? I decided let's just take all the horror stories we pretty much read this year on the main channel and put them all in one video. It, with uh, well better transitions than last year but it but yeah and uh well i hope you enjoy and hopefully best of 2022 will come soon after this video see you later the world we live in is full of things we don't understand being the curious humans that we are we naturally try and seek these things out Doing so has led us to remarkable discoveries and inventions that we never could have imagined a hundred years ago. We have defeated disease, built to the sky itself, and even created machines that could take us beyond the clouds and into the stars. If our ancestors could see us in what we have created, I'm sure many of them would see us as gods. Our innate curiosity and lust for knowledge has not always led to us, but led us to greatness. However, true evil and darkness have also been uncovered in humanity's conquest of knowledge. And in the end, I fear this evil will be our doom. I do not say this from the standpoint of a great philosopher who has sat and simply pondered things either. No, I should, I say this because I have seen it, experienced it, I was part of it. The event I am about to relate to you is true in its entirety. This I swear. I feel certain that this will fall on deaf ears, and many of you will believe this to be just another spooky story meant to give you cheap thrills, but I promise you, that this is neither my intent nor my purpose. The purpose of this story is to simply warn you of what lurks beyond the veil of what we can see and understand, to show you what awaits us in the darkness, even if I myself don't understand it. What I am about to tell you has happened, and I feel certain it will happen again. In 1971, a not-so-well-known scientist began preparations for an extremely secretive project known simply as the Harbringer Experiment. I would like to keep the identity of the scientist a secret for personal reasons, so throughout this re recounting, I will refer to him as Zimmerman. Zimmerman's background is unclear, at best beyond 1971. All that is known about him before that time is that he had grown up somewhere in Maryland with a strange fascination of the occult and supernatural. This later made him an outcast among his fellow scientists due to how scoffed upon the metaphysical he was at the time. Sermon's op opinions concerning the otherworldly were not the sole cause for him being an outcast, though. It was his methods that made him widely unaccepted among his peers. Zimmerman was well known during his time for being ruthless and cold beyond measure. He never cared about the means. All that mattered to him was results. And if he predicted results to be valuable enough, anything would be worth obtaining them. It was his sensational and brutal lust for the truth that made him feared among those that knew of him, and the few that knew of him and did not fear him believed in him and followed him and his work closely. The word Harbringer itself has such a mysterious and intimidating taste to it. Maybe it's the way it rolls from our tongues, or maybe it's simply due to its association with the project, but the word always seems to carry a certain amount of doom with it. Which would make sense. The world itself means to warn 
uh, the word itself means to warn, warn or forbade. I can't imagine Zimmerman's reason for giving the experiment this title, but in retrospect, it fits perfectly. Zimmerman came to a select few. He told us he was working on something big and that he needed people who could confidently and not spread idle gossip, gossip of his work. While he did not trust some of us, he did know that we were professionals and that for some reason or another, we were all in dire need of employment. I had worked at a local clinic as a doctor, but I was caught stealing medication and was, fire was promptly fired. This left a dark mark on my resume, so work was hard to find. I was also native to Alaska and lived near where the experiment would take place, so I guess you could say I was a convenient choice. As you can imagine, I jumped at the opportunity. It was hard not to when I saw the project, I saw the payout. Fifteen of us were hired in total. Some were colleagues of his dad and has been working with them for a while. Some were maintenance workers, and a few were hired as private security. I was the only medical professional to be hired. It was still a wonder to me how he even attained the funds necessary for the experiment. I would not be wholly surprised if his financing was not entirely legal. But legal or not, I needed the money. And he was paying. Looking back, this is a decision I have come to regret. After Zimmerman obtained his money, he used it to buy a relatively large plot of land deep in the frozen wilderness of Alaska. And upon that piece of land, a land, Zimmerman built a concrete structure, not dissimilar to a bunker, in fact. The sole difference being that its goal was to keep any potential damage contained within the structure rather than keeping it out, as he put it. Most of the structure dug underneath the earth, which had the effect of making the underground complex seem so much smaller than it really was from the outside as would be expected. There was only one way of entering and leaving the underground structure, and it was via a ladder that led from a small assu unassuming concrete building on the surface to the network below. After everyone had gone to bed at night, the hatch that contained the ladder would be sealed off with a very large and thick metal lid. Zimmerman was very strict about this. Located not too far away from the entrance building was a series of wooden cabins that would serve as a sleeping quarters for the staff Zimmerman had hired. Compared to the entrance building standing on the surface, the underground system was massive. At the center of the complex was, well, it was the control room. This is where all the facilities, electronics, and such were linked to. This included security cameras, lights, and door controls. Consoles, monitors, and computers line the walls of this large central chamber. This is also where the ladder to the entrance building connected to an underground complex. Connected to the control room were three doors. One led to a smaller room that served as, as the infirmary. Another door led to a break room. And the last door led to the hallways. The hallways are where the complex began to feel extremely eerie. There, they were for some reason laid out in an extremely confusing scheme that led in circles and to, and to complete dead ends. These hallways made up a vast majority of the complex, and it would be very easy to get lost in the maze if you were unfamiliar with the complex. But if you knew where you would be going, you would f go find yourself standing before one of the three eight by eight foot rooms before long. Each room had a camera hooked up to one of the corners of the room, and all three of, the, of those cameras were connected to a corresponding monitor in the control room. 
Cameras were also scattered throughout the hallways so that whoever was watching the, their corresponding monitor could see anywhere they wanted to when they wanted to. Thick metal doors stood at the entrance to each of these uh, three 8x8 eight eight foot rooms, and in order to open them, you would, need, you would have to enter a four digit code into the panel located near the door. I remember when I first arrived at the complex, how badly the hallways frightened me. I have always been claustrophobic, you see, and those hallways were so very narrow. The noise was also a tremendous source of fear for me in those bleak, narrow hallways. It was always so unnaturally silent, as if the entire world had stopped moving. It really made you feel like you were trapped down there. Thankfully, though, I only rarely ventured into those hallways, for I was the only medical professional in a facility, and I had virtually no reason to go into them. In the beginning, I found it so peculiar that Zimmerman would ask for a medical professional like me on a project like this, but by the time it was all over, I understood why. The official purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to test and observe the effects of extended isolation on the human mind. This is what was listed on reports being sent out at least. But unbeknownst to all of those who were not participating in the project, excluding the subjects, the true purpose was much darker. Like I said before, Zimmerman had always had an op obsession with the occult and the supernatural. He sought to prove himself to those who did not believe in him. He wanted physical proof that the supernatural was a real phenomenon and he wanted to be the first one to obtain said proof. The true purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to find proof of the metaphysical, a world we could not see. The thought of doing this was naturally a tad bit daunting and even scary, but it was Zimmerman's method of doing so that was truly terrifying. Zimmerman believed that he would be able to open a portal between worlds momentarily, allowing three random entities to cross over to our world, and each one of those beings would be trapped within one of the three rooms. Summerman had a theory that any entity would try and latch onto the nearest living thing that had the capacity for it. He wanted to use his technique to trap a spirit in physical form by allowing it to enter a living being that had been injected with the compound mixture of Zimmerman's creation. In theory, this compound would keep the entity from simply leaving whatever it was attached to. The only way it would be able to leave a host who had been ejected with this compound was through death. According to Zimmerman, the host would have to be something living with a will strong enough to survive the possession. And there was only one known species that possesses the amount of will required for this. Humans. Zimmerman had also done something to ensure that the entities would only enter the three rooms and that there would only be one entity in each room. Though I cannot say I know what exactly he did. In fact, I know next to nothing when it comes to how Zimmerman managed to do what he did. He liked to keep his methodology a secret to his most trusted colleagues, most likely due to his paranoia that someone would steal his ideas and take credit for the success of said ideas. If I had known that this was the true purpose before signing up, I may have, re have reconsidered, but Zimmerman decided not to tell us until we were all gathered in at his for fortress. Even if any of us wanted to leave, I doubt he would have been allowed to do so. The security team our men had hired was loyal to him, and the payout. It is not likely that some men had given them the order to now allow anyone to leave. 
there were three different subjects included in the experiment. All were native to Alaska, and each one was lured into the project under the belief that they would be participating in a harmless study of the effect of isolation on the human mind. As I mentioned before, which is why none of the subjects objected when they realized that they were that they would be confined to one of the three rooms that I had mentioned earlier. The first subject was a young man. He was apparently out of work and desperate need desperately needed the money that had been offered for participating in the study. The second was a woman. By looking at her, I could tell she was an addict of some sort. The third and final subject was an older man, a drifter, if I had to guess. One thing that they all had in common was none of them had any family or friends left. In short, no one would miss them, which is why they were chosen for the project. I am so I am sorry. I wish I could supply more information about the subjects, but all of this has been drawn from memory, and I was given little information on the three to begin with. The experiment did not officially begin until 1987, 16 years after original announcement. I was eager to begin, so I packed up and headed out to the complex as soon as I could. I arrived at the compound a week before the subjects and even signed up, and a whole month before the project even began. I was not the first to arrive by any means. When I got there, Simmerman, his colleagues, and the security team had already arrived. I suppose I, I, you could say I was among the people Zimmerman did not trust to arrive first. Everyone had arrived about a week before the experiment began. There was a noticeable rift between those who were simply for the money and those who were followers of Zimmerman. On October 15th, 1987, all the preparations were in place. Subjects had been sealed in their rooms. The cameras, lights, and speakers were fully operational, and all the staff members had settled in. The time had come for the experiment to officially begin. Someone asked everyone to report the control room around 9 p.m. to witness the beginning of the experiment. He wanted everyone to be present when he proved that all his theories had been correct and that he was not just a madman. He wanted us all to see the fruits of his labor, even when when everyone had finally gathered in the large control room. Someone turned us to us and simply said, Observe. He then turned his back to us, leaned to the microphone that would project his voice through the three rooms, and then he began chanting in a strange language that I feel certain no one but Zimmerman could understand. We all observed the three large monitors on the wall, silently waiting for something to happen. The subjects all stood in their rooms, dumbstuck by Zimmerman's chanting, staring at the monitors, with confused expressions on their faces. After about five minutes, I felt something awful. I cannot explain what exactly it was, but a horrible feeling of dread washed over me, riddling me with fear. It was then that the ground actually began to shake, suddenly, and the lights began to flicker. Zimmerman continued chanting into the microphone as if nothing was off or wrong while the subjects began dashing around their rooms, screaming for help. And suddenly the ground stopped shaking, and a minute monitor's image turned to, into static. The air began to become very heavy as we all stared at the monitors, waiting for them to regain their image and show us what was happening, or what happened in those three rooms. For a while, all was silent, but then there was screaming, the screams of a woman going through unbearable pain and terror began to echo through the compound. 
The similar screams of men began to coincide with the woman's terrified screams, and together they mixed into an awful symphony of pain and fear that beat mercilessly into our ears. Those of us who were here for the money began to give each other's scarred looks, while those loyal to our men seemed completely unfazed. We wanted to leave and never come back to this awful place. But we all knew deep down that Zimmerman would never allow that to happen. We were here for a long haul. There was no escape. It was 10.13 p.m. when the screaming finally stopped. The monitors had yet to reveal to us what had occurred in those three rooms. As soon as the screaming ended, Zimmerman stood and dismissed us all for the night, adding that we were all forbidden to come back to the compound until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Now, like any of us wanted to, we all solemnly made our way out of the compound and towards the cabins and settled in for the night. I feel it is safe to say that not all of us slept well that night, and I was not one of them. The following morning, all of the staff had arrived at the entrance building we all stood inside, exchanging tired or nervous looks as we waited for Zimmerman to arrive and open the hatch that concealed the ladder. I could see palpable fear in the eyes of some of us, while others did not seem to have been remotely affected by what happened last night. Zimmerman showed up five minutes after ten o'clock, apologizing for his tardiness as he came through the door. Of the entrance building. He opened the hatch and without any hesitation began descending the ladder downwards into the black abyss. He almost seemed enthusiastic. It was the first I was the first to follow behind someone's dark descent into the facility. It seemed that the farther I climbed down, the more the darkness closed in on me as if it was trying to swallow me whole. And as I climbed deeper, I couldn't help but feel that this place was different somehow. While before there was only the unsettling concrete hallways and rooms, now there was something else. Something made the eeriness feel so real and person personified. I felt like a horrible and gruesome scene awaited us down there. But I continued climbing downward despite my fear and my hesitation. This was no longer just a spooky bunker. There was darkness and malevolence in the air. A true evil now lived here, and I could feel it. We all could. I finally felt my foot touch ground and let out a silent sigh of relief. To be on solid ground, almost as on cue, the light bulbs came alive dousing the room in their full and their warmth and welcome light. Zimmerman must have turned on the power. I thought I allowed, my, allowed myself to take a couple seconds to examine the control room. It was exactly as we had left it last night, which I gave a silent and thankful prayer. It was almost as if nothing unusual had ever happened. I shook myself from my th thoughts as I remembered the static field monitors from the night before. I let my eyes slowly make their way towards the monitors on the wall, anticipating the grim and fearful scenes that would be on them. My attention was first grabbed by monitor 1 and 3, which were still pure static. It would have been a small relief, but then the motionless image on the monitor 2 caught my eye. Room 2 was entirely still, and everything seemed entirely untouched. I couldn't help but grasp as I noticed the only thing that was different. The woman lay in the center of, of the small concrete room. An expression of fear and terror was frozen into her gaunt face as she lay silent and lifeless on her back. Zimmerman's expression turned angry when he saw this. He ordered that the second monitor be turned off, and it was. We didn't ask why. It's not like any of us wanted to see the dreadful scene any longer. 
He also ordered that if the images and monitors 1 and 3 did not return within the next two hours, the security team would be sent to investigate the rooms. The security team nodded at hearing this. They made it seem as if they had no fear, but I could see it in their eyes. The subtly loud tick-tock of the clock was the only sound that echoed through the control room while I stared at the monitors. An hour and 15 minutes had gone by, and static was still all that occupied monitor 1 and 3. All of the other staff members were working except me. This was due to the fact that the project had been completely injury free thus far, so I essentially had nothing to do but wait for someone to hurt themselves. Zimmerman had a couple of his colleagues and I were the only ones that occupied the room. They quietly chatted amongst each other on the other side of the room. While I spent my time reading and pondering the situation I currently found myself in. I had clearly made a mistake coming here. The corpse living in room 2 was evidence enough of this. And God only knew what awaited us in the rooms 1 and 3. My thoughts were soon interrupted as Monitor's 3 image returned. The clear image now displayed on the screen made everyone's eyes noticeably widen. What was displayed on Monitor was horrifying. A humanoid thing stood in the center of the room staring directly at the camera, unmoving. It was wearing the jumpsuit that the Subject 3 had been issued. But this clearly was not the same man that had entered the room. What caught my attention first was its eyes. They were solid black and twice the size of normal human eyes. They seemed so, so endless and so cold. Its head had also grown with, th with the eyes in such a symmetrical and unsettling manner. The being had also shred all the hair it once had and even from the monitor. I could see how unnaturally smooth and clear its skin was. It had also seemingly grown in height and stature, which could be seen in fact that the jumpsuit was now obviously far too small for its wearer. Its limb had grown exceptionally long, its arms hung almost as low as the creature's knees. What we were looking at was no, in no way the same man we had sent inside. Fear. Fear was all that all I felt as I continued to stare into the monitor at the thing in the room. And my fear seemed to be shared by those around me, which made me feel kind of good. It may sound awful, but it was a bit satisfying to see that Zimmerman and his colleagues could feel fear too. But at the same time, it was worrying because this showed that, that this was not part of Zimmerman's plan. Something had gone wrong. We all stared at the monitor at, at the thing despite our fear. It was almost as if we were in a trance. My already present fear began to grow and spread rapidly through my body as I become lost in the creature's eyes. Trapped in its terrifying hypnotic gaze. After what I what felt like forever, I managed to break eye contact with the creature and divert my attention from the monitor. And when I did so, I felt my fear levels drop considerably. After a short while, Zimmerman ordered his security team to make their way to Subject 1's door just as he said he would do. The security team left without question, armed only with batons and pistols. I focused my attention on watching the men progress through the hallways towards Subject 1's room via the cameras. Even through the not-so-high quality cameras, it wasn't hard to tell that these men were afraid of what awaited them. Their heads were downcast as they walked. They did not possess the same confidence within them that they did when, they f when this project began. They looked like scared boys being sent off to a terrible war. Eventually, they made it to the door. We had perfect vision of them in the door via the hallway camera. One of them said something through one of the walkie-talkies and made a motion towards the camera. 
In response, one of Summerin's colleagues buzzed the door open. The men already had their pistols out by the time the button was pushed. Slowly the door began to open. We all watched eagerly as the man began to approach the door. Guns aimed inside. Suddenly, and without warning, there was a loud shriek, and as something bounded out of the room at the men, the monitor turned into static. Immediately, we could hear screaming echoing down the halls, followed shortly after this, after by the distinct sound of gunshots. We could do nothing but wait. After a couple minutes, the screaming and gunshots stopped. We all waited and prayed, hoping that whatever bounded at them from the room would not be the one to return to the control room. After a couple more minutes, three of the men came back carrying with them the corpse of the fourth. He had massive cuts covering his chest, and his face was shredded. We couldn't even tell who he was even was anymore, or even that he was human. I was used to gore being a doctor and all. So I felt somewhat unfazed by the mass of shredded flesh, flesh and bloodified meat they carried with them. But many of the others were pale and vomited. The security team all wore emotionless expressions and eyes filled with, with terror. One of the men finally looked up at us, stared at us for a while with those widened eyes of his. It's dead, he finally managed to mutter in a shaken and and scared voice. A couple hours went by. The dead man's name was Frank. He was buried outside a cold Alaskan ground. Two of the men were unharmed physically at least. The third was alive, but only barely. His body was covered in bloody slashes, and one of his had been gouged out. I managed to stabilize him, but only just. The other two men vaguely explained what happened. Apparently, Subject 1 leaped out at Frank after the door had opened, only it wasn't Subject 1 anymore. According to them, it had a sleek contorted face and sharp, long claws. They claimed to have sh shot it over a dozen times before it fell dead, and then they emptied another dozen bullets into it just to be sure it was really dead. Only once it was dead did they come back. After attending to the wounded man, I went to investigate the monitors. As afraid as I was seeing what those monitors may have held, I needed to see. Subject 3 was the only one left now, and I needed to see it and make sure the creature was still in his room. It seemed to be more like a jail cell than an ordinary room at this point, though which was probably a good thing. The camera's displaying subject one's room. In the hallway outside, it still displayed a static field screen. No one was sent to repair them or investigate. We just had the hope that subject one was well and truly dead. Monitor's three image was exactly the same as had left it. Subject three was still staring directly into the camera at us. He was still in the exact same position, and if it were not for a small fan in the corner of the room, I would think I was looking at a still image. In a way, I felt relief at seeing this. Relief that he was still in his room and had not escaped while no one was looking. After everything quieted down, I noticed something especially unusual. There was a strange sound animating from somewhere. At first, it was barely noticeable. The only reason I heard it was because of how extremely quiet it was in the infirmary. But as time went by, it slowly began to increase in volume. After about an hour, it was loud enough that everyone else could hear it too. And after a couple more hours, its volume had increased so much that we could determine what the noise was. It was a song. One of the staff members identified as Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim. Apparently, his father loved the song and listened to it frequently. The song seemed to be on a loop and kept replaying itself. 
although we were able to identify the noise, we remained unable to identify its source. We knew that it wasn't coming from the speakers because we had turned them off. It seemed to be animating from the walls themselves. More time ticked by as well as we all began to become increasingly agitated by the song. I spent most of my time in the infirmary attending to Frank or in the control room. Fear hung in the air in the presence of unmistakable darkness and evil was no doubt its source. Such a three still had not moved. He had kept his unblinking gaze fixed on the camera the entire time. It was it always felt like he was staring directly at me, no matter where I was in the room. I think this effect was also felt by others due to the fact that they seemed to move around the room a lot or in for seemingly no reason. After a few hours the song was so loud that people almost had to shut shout in order to communicate. We had been trying to find its source so that we could turn the song off, but it was to no avail. The source was completely unidentifiable. This added to a level of extreme irritation to our already very present fear. It was around 8.30 that the ground itself began to shake once again, just as it had done the previous night. Panic began to spread among my fellow employees and me as the shaking grew intensely. During this, I had a sudden and instinctual feeling to look over Subject 3's mirror. It was gone. Almost as if on cue, the power went out, and thankfully, the song did as well. Ever since the security team came back, panic had been slowly building up among the staff, and Zimmerman with powerless was powerless to stop it. When those lights went out, the calm projections that everyone had been trying to maintain left us, and the fear in all our hearts took over. The emergency backup lights kicked it on shortly after the power went out, which I gave a silent thankful prayer for. The lights were dim, but they still allowed me to see a lot. Total panic seized us as many of of my fellow staff members began screaming or rushing to the ladder in an attempt to escape, but too many were trying to use it at once. No one was able to get very far on the ladder without someone else pulling them to the floor and taking their place. Someone was shouting for everyone to calm down, but his dominating and intimidating personality had no effect here, and his demands fell upon deaf ears. It was total chaos. It wasn't long until people actually started hurting each other in their desperate attempts to get up at the ladder and out of this place. I could only stand against the wall and wait for my opportunity to escape up the ladder. All the screams were soon silenced as the familiar hum of that unsettling song began to rise in volume again, only much quicker this time, and this time it was clear that the noise was coming directly from the maze-like corridors. People stopped fighting and shouting as all of our attention shifted to the door that led into the hallways. The song quickly got louder than it had ever been before, which was forced many of us to cuff our ears with our hands and attempt to silence the noise. Then suddenly, the song just completely stopped. Silence. That was all that filled the room as we all stared at the thick metal door in anticipation for what was coming. It felt like ages had gone by, but in reality, it was probably only seconds before silence was broken. The door suddenly and violently burst open, and the music started again. Louder than it had ever been before, the suddenness and the volume of this caused many of us to recoil from falling to the ground and grabbing our ears in an attempt to block out the noise. I glanced up for just a second in the doorway stood a tall, smooth-skinned figure with long limbs and eyes so dark and malevolent that you could clearly see them in the dim lighting. After I got my bearings, I looked upwards at the creature once again, just in time to see the thing picked up and rip Zimmerman in half in one fluid moment, dousing the room and everyone in it with his blood, intestines, and organs. 
I was no stranger to gore, but the sight of that was too much for me to bear. I hunched over immediately after seeing this and, and followed it all over the cold cement floor. That ladder is my only hope of survival, I thought to myself as I forced myself into a standing position, and as my eyes rose among the rest of me, I could see the thing ripping and tearing through the people as they scattered in an attempt to escape it. It was distracted, and as, as awful as it sounds, this was my only chance to get up that ladder. I forced my legs to move up to move towards the ladder, trying to block out the terrified screams of my fellow staff members and the unbearably loud music. I could hear gunshots co coinciding with the screams and terrible sounds of flesh being ripped apart somewhere in the mass of noise. I reached my hands outwards and felt a wave of relief wash over me as my fingers came into contact with the hard metal rungs of the ladder. I gripped them and began to climb upwards as quickly as I could, in my disoriented state, all the while praying that the monster would not see me and pull me off the ladder and back into the slaughter. It felt like any moment I would feel one of its smoother hands wrap around my ankles and pull me to my death. But I eventually made it to the top. There was no question in my mind. I had to close the hatch and seal that thing down there. Even if it meant certain death for all my colleagues, I could not allow that thing to escape. I gripped the thick metal lid and began push to push with all my might in an attempt to seal the underground complex off. Despite how dense and sturdy it was, the lid was surprisingly easy to move and did not take much effort to put shit over the hatch, even in my weakened state. In seconds, the hatch was completely covered by the dense metal lid. I collapsed on my side and began to vomit some more as exhaustion overtook me. As I lay there, I realized something. Aside from my labored breaths, the only thing I could hear was a faint echo of that song from down below. I felt as though I'd lose more of my sanity if I continued to lay there and listen to that song. So I once again forced myself to my feet and began to make my way to the wooden lodge I had stayed in the previous night. It was where I left my baggage and also where I left my keys to my truck. Of the 15 staff members that, that took part in the Forsaken experiment, I am the only one who survived. I have never returned to the awful place where all of this happened, and I don't intend to. The project was very secretive, and Zimmerman was the only one who knew all the details of it. And as far as I know, no one is aware of my involvement aside from me. In fact, I am probably the only one who knows what the Harbinger experiment truly was, let alone what actually happened. By now, you are probably wondering why I have told you, why I have told all of you about something none of you should be aware of. Maybe you're expecting me to give you a speech about not messing with things you don't understand, or something along those lines. I hope not, for I have no speech to give or lesson to impart. I began hearing a noise earlier today. Almost immediately, I recognized the noise as a very haunting, familiar song. I didn't even try to trace it to its source. I knew it would be pointless. And as the day has progressed, the song has increased in volume. It's loud enough for now that I can very clearly make out the lyrics. I am completely unable to escape Tiny Tim's voice. It has followed me everywhere I have gone. Subject 3 is coming for me. And I know my time left in this world is extremely limited now. I guess you could say that I just wanted to tell the tale of the Harmon Bringer experiment before I lost forever. I hope that you would take some lesson from what I've recounted to you, but I think we both know you won't. Let, let's be honest, you don't believe a word of what I've just told you, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't believe me if I were you. To you, this is nothing more than something to get your cheap thrills from. You are probably mindlessly 
surfing the internet when you clicked a link and found yourself here. Wherever here may be reading this story, and to be honest, I don't care if you believe me or not. Even if you do, it's prob it probably won't stop you from trying to re uncover the truth of a darkness that few of us have ever seen. I certainly never stopped Zimmerman. If you want a lesson, look what happened to him when we went seeking the truth. I pray that none of you will ever discover this truth. I pray that none of you will ever have to see the evil I have seen. I hope that hope you all get to live in the ignorance of what lies beyond the veil of what we can understand. It's here now. I can feel its black eyes burning into me just as I could all those years ago. I am as much to blame as the woman is for this monstrosity that is now free to roam the world, even if I was not the one to create it. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Disclaimer, the following is a dramatized fictional retelling of events. All characters will have, will have been based upon real people, but with different names to to hopefully avoid causing any panic or otherwise harming the parties involved. As such, all characters in the story are fictitious. I felt the need to add a disclaimer just so that I felt better about myself. Okay. It's been a long time, very long time, since so much has mentioned this tale. I always let Pops or Mom or Mary speak on it. They were the ones everyone would listen to more, and I couldn't stomach speaking about what I had seen. Not to mention the looks people gave me any time I talk about it. And yet... As the reaper's knocking on my door, my bad habits are catching up to me. I figured I'd lay this story down on paper before my tar-tainted lungs give out completely. So, it was April 25th, 1973. We'd been living in Enfield, Illinois, for as long as I remember. I was nine at the time, while Mary was 13. Pops and Mom had left us alone for a few hours, and there was a... Ah. Mom had left us alone for a few hours, as there was a city council meeting they had to attend. Mary and I had played a game of Monopoly together, but had since gone into our rooms. It would have been... Round nine, the sun had all but completely set when Sis and I heard it. A sudden scream that lasted no more than a single second came from the neighbor's backyard. We both darted out of our rooms, hairs on our necks sticking up. Mary quickly ran into the kitchen to grab a flashlight. We had a window in the hall facing towards the source of the noise, which I hurried to open up. In the darkness, there was nothing I could make out from the backyard, save for the silhouette of Carl's treehouse. As far as we knew, Carl's family was also at the city council meeting, so he would have been home on his own. I still remember the overpowering scent of iron coming through the window alongside the warm breeze. Though at the time, I think, I think I was more much more concerned with the sounds coming from the treehouse, snapping, crunching, like a heavy boot coming down on twigs in the forest underbrush, mixed in with ripping and squelching. I was frozen in fear by the time Mary came back with the best flashlight she could find. She pushed me a bit to make room for her in the window, shining the light out and toward the tree. It felt like time slowed. Though that glance at that thing was brief, it felt like it lasted for minutes, horrified and awestruck as we were. And that treehouse that Carl and I had played... 
Carl and I had played in not a day before. There it was. The light reflected off its slimy, gray skin, highlighting several hairs or quills ju jutting out from its body randomly. Jutting out from its body randomly. It had three legs, we could see. Holding up a stubby body, it was bent over, gnawing and tearing at something. Almost as soon as the light hit it, turned. Two stubby arms stretched out from its chest, its hands having six digits, with large, dull claws on each one. Its face was large, with sagging wrinkles of skin, reminiscent of a pug. Two massive, flashlight-sized eyes glowing pink bad at back at us, and its mouth, a wide, gnawing hellscape of jagged, glass-like teeth, stained red at that moment. In that very same hellscape we saw entrails, splintered bone, and it looked like one of Carl's shoes. Wait a sec. Carl's shoes. You could see a crumpled heap of flesh on the floor of the treehouse, and one of the creature's feet stamping it down. It quickly swallowed what flesh it, what flesh was in and on its mouth, as it turned to face us, letting out a deafening screech. I covered my ears and dropped down, as it did this, while Mary quickly let out her own scream and slammed the window shut, locking it. Tears were welling up in my eyes, and I think I had started mumbling Carl's name under my breath. Sis grabbed my hand and pulled me back to my feet just in time to see the monster take a leap toward our house, smashing into our siding with a snarling hiss. Sis pulled me through the house and into our kitchen cupboard, gripping my hand as tightly as she could, hugging me close once in the safety of that cramped room. Listen to me, she said under her breath. You're going to be fine. I'm here. You're you're going to be fine. I remember being surprised by how calm she was, able to make her voice, even while she was shaking just as me. But, but, but Carl, he, what, what, what was that thing? I whispered. That's, that was a very good whispering tone, Nathaniel. I whispered as we heard a loud scrape and sound coming from the living room. I, I don't know, but, but we have to keep calm as she whispered back, being cut off by a particularly loud bang toward the opposite side of the house. Then where, the, to the opposite side of the house than where the creature was before. It, I, it's trying to get in. It's going to kill us. It's, she put her hand over my mouth as another loud crashing sound came from the living room once more. No, listen, we're going to be fine. We just, we just need to stay quiet. Mom and Dad should be back soon. As long as we keep quiet, we will be fine. She held me as tight as she could, doing her best to avoid letting out just how scared she was as well, even with her shivering. It felt like an eternity we spent in that pitch black room, both of us quietly crying, not moving at all, all the while the scraping, banging, and clawing sounds continued. Eventually, they started to be fewer and further between, right up until we heard the distinct sounds of Pop's old junker car driving up. We waited until we could hear Pop and Mom talking, calling out our names. Sis opened the door to find Mom in the kitchen turned to see us and quickly ran up to us, hugged us. Seeing that we were scared, Pop quickly came in after Mom called out. The air conditioner in the living room was all torn up. What happened? He yelled while real before realizing how scared Sis and I looked. A, a, a monster. It was trying to get into the house. Sis managed to meekly say. It, it, it ate him. Carl, it... It hate him. I managed to barely whisper as my stiff arms and legs continued shaking. 
Almost exactly at that moment, we heard another roar and more scraping towards the front door. Sis and I hunkered down against screaming. Pops, while normally very skeptical, had all the reason he needed to see we weren't lying. He reached up into the top cabinet, pulled out his M1911 with two magazines. Tam, stay here with the kids, he said under his breath as he slipped one of the magazines in the pistol and pulled back the slide. Mom held us close as we heard the front door open. Again, the screech rang out as we heard eight consecutive shots being fired. There was a high-pitched hiss and then silence. For close to a minute, we sat there, too scared to move, quiet as mice, before Pops walked back in the kitchen. It's, it's gone. He simply said before kneeling and hugging us all. Glad of that thing was, it's gone. Made it point blank and yet it didn't drop. It just hissed and bounded off. He held us tight for a couple minutes before Pop got up and phoned the police. Mom pulled us up and started to take us into Sis's room. The last I heard before getting in there was Pop's talking on the phone. Yes, well, y'all never gonna believe this one. The following months were hectic, to say the least. It felt like we would never be able to have a stable, normal family life again. Cops constantly trying to get more information from the two kids in trauma counseling, who were the only witnesses of the gruesome death of a 12-year-old. And the press wanted to get as many juicy details as they could as a full-scale hunt for that thing started in earnest. Theories and speculation about what the Enfield horror was. Uh, Enfield horror, as they called it, could be. We heard tell about it being a mistaken bear, a hoax, an alien that the government was coming up, a communist super soldier. Hell, there was even one tabloid that proposed that it was an Actually, a drugged-up, wandering hobo who was a cannibalistic murderer who drew great pleasure from killing, thus explaining the uh, third leg. Yeah, tabloids. After a big buzz and a couple of other sightings that didn't end, sightings that didn't end with anyone getting hurt, the horse simply disappeared. Has been seen since as far as I know. Either way, as I lie here, choking and gasping for air, I feel like I can still smell the iron on that breeze, still see Carl's lifeless body, and still hear that thing's monster screeching. All I am left is all I am left with is a hope, a prayer, that the Enfield horror, no, my Enfield horror never shows up on someone's doorstep ever again. Dear Abby, we've never met before. So that's odd. I feel like this is scary. My name is Jake, for starters. I work the checkout line at the grocery store up on 67th Street. You know, the one with the parking lot that's way too big for the store itself? Yeah, that one. Um, I'm 24, really tall, and have a rather scrappy appearance. You probably wouldn't recognize me if I came to talk to you. I don't have a mem very memorable face. <laughs> I, I, I don't really know why I'm telling you all this, to be honest, but... This isn't the point of me writing you. I was working late at night yesterday. It was a very average day for the most part. Nothing too exciting happened, but you'd be surprised at how interesting this job can get sometimes. I've been reading some book. The guy that worked the counter shift, the uh, worked that ca shift, that counter the shift before me had. It was some really crappy murder mystery chalk full of cliches. Incredibly boring, if you ask me, but it's something to do, I guess. When you showed up 
when you showed up though my whole night changed i don't know exactly what it is about you that caught my attention at first but as soon as i saw you i got this odd feeling a weird mix between excitement and terror that's the best way i can describe it at least i saw you walk into my line and i quickly composed myself i'd be slouching down in my chair for a while so since i rarely ever get anyone in my line it was only when you got closer that i realized what about you caught my attention you were absolutely beautiful you walked up and said hey and handed me your cart i could tell by the way you were talking that the way that you looked that you were very sleep deprived though this wasn't surprising considering how late it was after a second two of awkward silences i realized that you'd greeted me i suddenly forced out a yeah, hi in response i cursed myself mentally for that one i sat there for a second trying to focus oh, oh, what's your name i said it's only later that I realized how odd this must have seemed. What kind of grocery bag guy asks what someone's name is? <laughs> I'm glad I did it, though. I remember you said your name was Abigail, but you, that you go by Abby for short. Abby. It, it seemed to fit so perfectly. The name seemed to roll off my tongue as I said it back to myself silently. It was like sweet honey. It just felt good as I said it. You seemed to be perplexed when I looked back at you and I was wondering if I'd done something to upset you. Sh shouldn't you be packing those? You said and pointed to your groceries. Suddenly shocked and embarrassed, I looked up and apologized and clumsily started shoving groceries into bags as fast as I could. I couldn't believe myself. How stupid could I be? And when I looked up, I realized you were laughing. You're kind of cute, you said. I tried to play it off cool, but I was obviously thrilled. A girl like this thought I was cute? <laughs> you are too, I said. And as I hastily packed the rest of your groceries. As you walked out, you... You turned around as you reached the door and said, have a good night. I guess I look pretty stupid writing all this down, so you probably still remember it. I mean, it did happen yesterday, but I went home ecstatic that night with all the confidence in the world. I feel like it's almost unreal writing it back here. Anyways, um, I wanted to write you this letter, Abby, to tell you that um I, I love you i don't know what it was i felt that night it was some weird mix of emotions but all i know is even in the small little transaction we had i i felt as if there was something between us please write me back soon sincerely jake dear abby uh, it's it's been a week since i sent my last letter and i still haven't gotten a response but that doesn't matter how have you been uh, my life's been just as normal as usual get up go to work go to bed i live in a really shitty apartment but i guess that's what you get when your work is a grocery bagger i've thought about you a lot lately and i sometimes wonder if you still remember me i saw you again today at work this time at a more reasonable hour, thankfully. I, I didn't want to bother you to see if you'd approach me on your own. You came in my line again, which made me absolutely thrilled. This time I was less nervous. I was going to act normal, no matter what you did or said. I wasn't going to get a girl like you slip through my fingers. As you walked up, you muttered something that was too quiet for me to make out. And I waited at the end of the counter for me and you waited at the end of the counter for me to finish packing your bags. Oh, this obviously wasn't what I had expected, but it wasn't all too bad. You didn't seem to 
feel anything at all, actually. I was expecting you to either come up and talk to me or avoid me like the plague, but instead you just walked on through as if I was another stranger. That makes me wonder if you got my last letter. You should check your mailbox more often. There was one moment, though, where I felt something. I looked over briefly to see what you were doing, and at the same time, you seemed to look up at me, see how far along I was. Right then, our, our eyes locked. Only for a second or two, but in, in those two seconds, I, I saw so much more in you than I'd seen last time. I felt as if I had known you for years, like I knew all your intricate feelings and emotions. Did, did, you, did you feel anything like that with me? Shortly after I finished packing your bags, you paid and walked out. Obviously, this was a pretty normal process for me, considering I do it 50 times every day. But I had determined, I had been determined since the night that you wrote, I wrote you that letter. The next time I saw you, I was going to get more out of it. <laughs> I kind of screwed that one up. I wasn't satisfied with it. I, I had to have more. There's, there's a little room in the very back corner of the grocery store designated for staff. In there, I, kept, I knew they kept all the security footage from the day. All the staff were informed of this, and the security camera locations were there where they're hanged. Luckily for me, there's one positioned right next to my corner. I waited until the store was closed and everybody left, and then I went in. After flipping through all the TV screens, I found the one that connected to my camera. I rewinded it until about when I remembered you coming in. After a few minutes of scanning, I, I found it. There you were. I paused on the best still shot I could find. I knew the camera wouldn't do you justice, but it was the best I could have for now. Having a longer look at you, I realized how truly perfect you were. Every feature of your body, your hair, your face, your, your legs, your chest, <laughs> was just perfection. I rewinded the tape so uh, when you first came up to my line a few times, I, I, just, I just couldn't help it. <laughs> my, my eyes were glued to the screen. After a few minutes of consideration, I popped the tape. And I popped out the tape and shoved it in my pocket and then drove home. I knew I wasn't allowed to, you know, but I could very well get fired for taking such actions, but I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I had to have you with me at all times, even if it means losing my job. Abby, I love you. I love everything about you. I think about you constantly now. Do you feel the same way about me, Abby? I just want us to be together forever. Right back soon. First truly, Jay. Dear Abby, it's been three days since, uh, and I still haven't gotten a reply. Why don't you want to talk to me? <laughs> I'm still unsure if you've got my last two letters. Please tell me if you have. So, I got fired from my job. They found the missing tape. I got a call from the store owner, my boss, at 6 a.m. on Monday, and was told to come in immediately. They were having a Mandatory staff meeting. When I got there, all the staff were gathered around a small table with the owner at the head of it. Once everyone had arrived, he told us that apparently there had been a minor robbery yesterday. and They had around $200 worth of stuff taken from them and one tape that would have shown the who was the culprit. That was the one that was taken. Just my luck. He told us that no one was going to leave this room until somebody confessed. After a few minutes, I finally gave in. I, I told them everything about how I felt, if me and you had some kind of connection. After explaining the whole story, the entire room was staring wide-eyed at me. After I finished, I sat there in silence for several seconds. Suddenly, the store owner broke the tension. 
Jake, you're fired. Get out of here now and don't come back, he said. I did as I was told and got out of there as fast as I could. Stupid prick. He's always treated me like shit. He's been on my case since I've today I got this job. I swear he's just been waiting for me to do one little thing that could justify firing me. And the one time I slip up, he finds out. Where didn't he understand though? D doesn't he get that you and I are meant for each other? Any any rational man would have understood. Anyone put in my position would have done that, right? I've been searching you up a lot lately with no job. I have all the time in the world to spend learning about you. Do, do you know how much you can find out when someone on someone with just a first name in a town of residence? I found out that your last name's Merritt. What a beautiful name. Have you Merritt? I, I can't help but say it loud whenever I think about you. Abby Merritt. Abby Merritt. I, I also found out that you're 24 and you live a mile away from me. I, I drove down to your apartment complex today. It looks very nice, much nicer than where I live. <laughs> I asked to see you multiple times, but I was told that you weren't there every time. I felt more and more discouraged every time I asked, but I was determined to see you again. Oh, after a few hours of asking, I decided to stay in the parking lot for a while, waiting for you to come back. And after many hours of waiting, you did. It was late at night around 10, 1030, I believe. I saw you pull up in your car to get out. I felt a sudden rush of warmth after seeing your face again. <laughs> I know I have the security camera tape to look at, but it doesn't compare to seeing you in real life. I made sure to record it for later when I was at home, this, this time with a much higher quality camera. I wanted to capture as much detail as possible. I didn't know the next time I would see you in security tape wasn't enough, wasn't enough for me anymore. It just wasn't. I asked the woman at the front desk multiple times where your room number was, but she refused to tell me. She thought it was some sort of creep. See, Abby, these people, they don't understand us. They don't understand what we feel for each other. I ended up waiting in the parking lot a little while longer until someone came out. After talking with him for a bit, he told me where your apartment number was. He, he didn't want to talk at first, but I made him. You'd be surprised what you can make people tell you when you're holding a knife to their chest. Don't worry, I, I didn't hurt him too bad. But we can ha can't have someone interfering with us. Don't you agree, Abby? I'm sick of all these people trying to keep us apart. I ended up watching you from the parking lot for a while once I found your, your room number and how the rooms in this complex were organized. It wasn't hard to locate it. You should be more careful about shutting your blinds, you know. I was easily able to watch you from the parking lot. God, I can't get you out of my head anymore. All I want to do, all I do anymore is watch that video I took of you over and over. Abby, I want to be with you forever. I want to wake up in the morning and see you next to me in bed. I cannot wait until the next time I see you again. Love. Jake. Dear Abby, I have some really exciting news, Abby. I'm moving in with you. <laughs> Aren't you excited? <laughs> we can spend hours and hours and hours together. It'd be just perfect. Uh, let's, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Let me explain. My job paid just enough so I can make rent and pay for food every week. Because of this, I had little to no money in savings, nowhere near enough to last a very long time. When you take that money flow away, it doesn't take very much time until you have nothing left. I was able to get by for a few days, but just today, I got evicted. This could actually be better than I originally thought. <laughs> I wasn't. I wouldn't be surprised if that guy gave me, uh, that gave me your room number has been able to contact the police by now. This way, they won't find out. Uh, they, they, this way, they won't be able to find me, and we could spend all the time in the world together. It's perfect, isn't it? 
I made sure to bring you all my tapes and photos that I've been taking with me, though. And my camera, of course. You should really tell whoever is managing your apartment complex to get better staff. I was able to get by security easy. I went up to your room and knocked on the door, but I got no answer. So I decided to get in by other means. After scanning the footage I took from last night over a few times, I noticed that you have a ventilation shaft in the corner of your room. Not surprising, considered how hot it can get in the summer here. I figured uh, there had to be some kind of maintenance hatch that I could get in through. After a few minutes of looking around, I found a door at the end of your hall. It seemed to be some kind of staff room. Luckily, there was a way to the vents there. <sighs> I crawled through them until I got to your room. It was very cramped and hard to move around, but I managed. When I got there, I felt a sudden rush of success. I figured since the lights were out and I couldn't see that you were, weren't home, but I'm patient. I scanned every part of your room, trying to memorize all the intricate details. Your scent overwhelmed me as I sat there. I caught it briefly during the two times you were at the store, but never this strong. It was mesmerizing. I, I couldn't quite place my finger on it, but it reminded me of something. It was, it was almost like, like peaches. I, I sat there hunched over for a few hours, though I, I taught myself to be extremely patient. I can sit completely motionless for hours at a time, not moving a muscle. No one is going to notice me. And then you finally got home. I felt a wide smile form on my face the second I heard you at the door open. There you were, my love. <laughs> of course, you took no notice of my presence. The light in your room seemed to be angled perfectly, so you couldn't see anything in the vent after the first few inches. I tried to contain my excitement, but <laughs> I started breathing very heavily. I, I tried to cover it up as best I could, but it was hard. You suddenly looked right at the vent. I went completely silent. After a few seconds, though, you seemed to lose interest. Oh, this made me smile. This is the perfect spot. I could tell that it startled you, though. All throughout the night, you were turning over in your sleep and looked at the vent. People seem to have a sense of when they're being watched. It can send them into complete panic. Don't try to fake it, Abby. I can tell when someone's awake and when someone's truly scared sleep becomes impossible. Why are you scared anyway? It's just me. Why would I scare you? You do love me, right? You know I love you. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to spending every day with you now, Abby. Right back as soon as you can. Love, Jake. Dear Abby, I saw you wake up this morning. I didn't sleep a wink last night. You were too enthralling. I spent the whole night watching you. I couldn't help it. Anytime I tried to look away, my eyes seemed drawn back a few seconds later. You look even more amazing when you're sleeping, you know. It, you'd be surprised how much you can learn about a person's personality by watching them sleep. I was tempted to get out of the vent, get a better view of you multiple times that night, but I resisted the urge. I couldn't have you figuring out I'm here. N not yet, at least. You, you seem to spend a lot of time in your bathroom in the morning. I assume that you were taking a shower, putting on makeup. Why, why would you do that, Abby? Anything you could do to change the way that you naturally look would only cover up your true beauty. Why would you want to do that? Don't you want the whole world to see what I see in you? You left shortly after to work, or at least that's what I assumed. After careful consideration, I decided to leave the vent. I slid my hand through one of the slits and felt around for one of the bolts. 
the surface of the vent was very smooth, which made them very easy to find. I grabbed on to one and twisted as hard as I could. And finally was able to pop it off. I did this with all the other bolts, finally removed the grating. The first thing I did was go over to the bathroom. I quickly disposed of everything that I could find that you could use to mask your face. That stuff disgusts me. This way, everyone will get to see how truly beautiful you are. I also found something in there, your, your hairbrush. I grabbed it and brought it close to my face to examine it. It was a, it was a dull blue with a very thick rounded handle. But that wasn't what interested me. Interested me. The hairs. <sighs> it took a good few minutes to pull every one of them I could see out and line them up on your counter. I counted on my god. I got 59. This pleased me greatly. I quickly scooped them up and put them in my pocket. <laughs> I spent the rest of the day going through your stuff to learn more about you, your your interests and stuff. I take it you're a big movie fan, Abby? I found your collection at the back of the closet. I have to say it is quite impressive. I found something in there. I found something in there, though, that made me mad. A picture of you with another man. It disgusted me just looking at him, holding you like he owned you. I'm the only one that can have you, Abby. No one else. <laughs> at about 8.30, I started considering get back in the vent since that's when you'd usually, that's, since that's usually about when you get back from work. Then I had another idea. I looked at your bed. The, the blankets hung low enough for the floor that you couldn't see underneath the bed unless they were lifted up. I first screwed the great vent grating back on and slowly slid under with a smile on my face and waited for you to get home. When you finally came in, you looked completely pale. And I noticed someone else came in behind you. They were talking to you about hearing noises coming from your room throughout the day. I mentally yelled at myself. Oh, I wouldn't need to be more careful from now on. Going under the bed had been a good idea, though, since you, you're, obviously your first thought was to check the vent. You thanked the person and then left. Finally, you and I were alone. I sat there in silence until you went to bed. It seemed to be an eternity before you did. I wanted to get a closer look at you tonight, and this was my chance. You got into bed and slowly turned off the light. I was cautious, though. I waited for hours to make sure you were asleep, and when I was sure you were, I slowly slid from under the bed, and I saw you there. <laughs> you looked absolutely stunning. Every curve of your body was perfect. Every little detail was beautiful. I was just in awe looking at you. I reached out my hand and I, I started to stroke your face. It was soft, like, like silk. I felt myself starting to, I confess, I felt myself starting to get hard. Your, <laughs> your beauty was overwhelming. I, I slowly reached down started to hmm, pleasure myself. <laughs> I tried to control myself out of worry of waking you up, but I just, I, I couldn't help it. It was, I felt pure ecstasy. Everything about you was perfect. Suddenly you seemed to turn, started to wake up. Horrified, I quickly slid back under the bed, trying to be as quiet as possible. A few seconds, I saw you get out of bed. Look around. I could sense your fear without even noticing, without even looking at you. 
You should feel calm around me, Abby. I'll protect you. No one will ever touch you but me. I kill someone for you, Abby. I made sure to pay attention today. You didn't bring in my letter from yesterday or any of the mail at all. You just must not check your mailbox. I'm going to change that, though. I'm going to leave this one on your desk tomorrow. Oh, eh, I forgot to mention, I, I'm making something special for you. <laughs> Check your closet out. Check in your closet after you read this. <laughs> Yours forever, Jake. Dear Abby, I spent more time today working on the surprise while you were at work. You're really going to love it, Abby. Put a lot of work into it, you know. <laughs> I spent a few hours uh, today putting it together, putting the finishing touches on it, and I think finally ready for you to see. You got home at around 8.30 again, and I saw the letter laying, laying on your desk almost immediately. I started to smile as I saw you opening it, waiting to see your reaction. It was really quite interesting welcoming your face. I could see all your different emotions and thoughts. You seem, you seem confused at first, then, then shocked, then, then horrified. You, you started to shake violently, and I, I saw that you were about to cry. Do, do, do you not, do you not like me, Abby? Why? 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 Why were you crying? Don't, don't you love me? Don't you love me, Abby? Everything after that was a blur. You looked over in the closet while you were still sobbing. You seemed to be contemplating whether to open it or not. Instead, you ran past it and out the door. When you came back, you had all my letters in your hand and started going through them. At some point, you seemed to break down and curl up on the floor tears still rolling down your face i could tell you you were desperately trying to say something anything but you but you were paralyzed in fear after about 10 minutes i i saw you look under the bed and the vent anywhere i could be you see though abby i'm smarter than that i knew you'd look those places I found a better place after I finished with your surprise. You'll never find me in here. No one will. Isn't it great? <laughs> I can watch you forever and ever and ever, and there's nothing you or anyone else can do about it. <laughs> you hadn't found your surprise yet, though, Abby, and I could tell that you were still thinking about it. <laughs> I saw you look over to your closet and... I knew, I knew that you wanted to open it, but at the same time, you were nervous. What was going to be in it? What would you find? This couldn't last forever, though. You and I both knew that. I watched you slowly walk over to the closet, fumbling with the handle, trying to get a firm grasp on it. Suddenly, you flung the doors open and saw it. It was a scrapbook of me and you. <laughs> I saw you flipping through the pages. <laughs> you, you, you seem to be shocked. Do you not, do you not like it, Abby? I, I got pictures of you and I when you weren't looking. Pictures of you sleeping, pictures of you at your computer. I, I, I even scattered the hairs I collected throughout it all, along with pictures of couples together and, of course, our faces on them, though. I got that picture of you with the other guy, and I put it at the very back. Except I didn't leave it like it normally was. I scratched a little fuck's face off it. I hate him. I hate him so much. If I knew who he was, I would hunt him down and make him suffer. 
Don't you get it, Abby? <laughs> no one, no one is allowed to have you but me. Me and you are meant for each other and no one else. But uh, I watched you sob for another 30 minutes and then get up and run out of your apartment. Shortly after, you came back with multiple policemen. This, this shocked me. Did you not like the surprise, Abby? Why would you... Why would you bring these people into our room? It doesn't matter. They'll never find where I am. But if they did, it could ruin everything. All my work for the last few weeks would be for nothing. You wouldn't want that, right, Abby? I'm exhausted from today's work. As much as I love you, I need sleep. Have a good night, baby. I love you. Love, Jake. Dear Abby, do you see what you've done, Abby? Huh? Do you see what you've done? I woke up at 8 a.m. to see you frantically packing your bags. I was confused at first, but then I understood. You were leaving me. You don't love me. <laughs> you don't. Love me. How could you do this to me, Abby? You were the only thing I wanted in life. I had nothing else to live for. But when I first met you, I saw a shimmer of hope. I thought that I'd finally have a reason to wake up in the morning and go on with my shitty life. And then you went and you took it away. How could you do this to me? To me, Abby? How? A few seconds after you left your room, I got out of my hiding spot and followed behind you. I saw you throw your bags in the back and get in your car and start it. But I, I wasn't going to let you get away, though, Abby. I would never let that happen. I ran as fast as I could to your car window and smashed it open and dragged you out. Do you really think you could get away from me, Abby? I had to hit you over the head and knock you out. You were making too much noise. Someone else, someone that wouldn't understand. They could have seen and ruined everything. Well, your information, I had a plan if you reacted like this. I drove out in the storage unit at the edge of town. I reserved a slot for the day I decided to move in with you. I drove up and unlocked it. I grabbed you and carried you inside with me. It had only been a few minutes, so you were still unconscious. I made sure to check your pockets and make sure you didn't have your phone with you. I said it very back of the small room, and then I got in and lowered the door. I called the owner of the storage unit and told him that I had visited the lot that day and forgotten to lock it, and asked him if he wouldn't mind locking it for me. Of course, he said yes, and I'd hung up. I threw the phone. I then threw the phone on the ground and stomped it to make sure that it never work again. Shortly later, I heard the owner come up and lock the door. <laughs> About an hour later, I saw you start to get up. I first heard a very faint grunt, and then I saw your legs start to move. Shortly after, you were fully awake. And when you saw my face, you, <laughs> you started to scream which then subsided to a whine and then to a whimper. That's when you saw it. The other thing in the room. My knife. It was obvious why it was there, and after a second or two of realization, you jumped up and grabbed it. I looked you square in the eyes and said, Abby, I love you. <laughs> And then I felt the searing pain of the knife being driven into my side. I felt it being pulled out and jabbed back in with great force. I can feel it go in each time. Like a fire burning a hole through my chest. <laughs> I fell to the floor, laughing while coughing up blood. 
saw you back away, trembling, and sit back in the corner. And now, as I sit in a puddle of my own blood writing this, I wonder how you'll go out. Will you use the knife to take your own life? Or will you let starvation take you? Either way, we'll be together. In death, Abby. <gasps> together. From the day I saw you till this day, we both die. Just the way I wanted it. And as you sit there crying, I can tell that you've come to this realization too, Abby. This is all that I've ever wanted. And for that, I have to say, thank you. Love, Jay. <laughs> True nervousness. Very, very dreadful nervousness I had been. And am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was n object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For this gold, I have no desire. For his gold, I have no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes. Yes, it was. It was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye. With a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually... I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the week, whole week before I killed him. But every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door, opened it, oh, so gently. And then when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, the no that no light shone in it, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. <laughs> oh, no. I deeply apologize for my outburst. <laughs> that one okay with old English. Oh no, I'm having a great time. It was just that that uh that that uh how cunningly I thrust it in got me. Okay. Let me let me do this. Okay. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening. So far, I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would a man-man have been so wise as this? 
And then, when my head well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I would boldly, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how has passed, how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. <clears throat> upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute head hand moves more quickly than did mine. Yeah. Never before, never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, <laughs> of my sagis sagacity. So, of my sagacity, I could scarcely search. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there was opening the door little by little. He not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly, I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was black as pitch, with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, I was about to open the lantern, and my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up, sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet, still, and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul, and overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo of the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I know I knew he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. When he had turned in the bed, his fears had been e his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them careless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, "It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp." Yes. He had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. I had waited a long time, very patiently, 
Without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was it was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it was I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones, but I could see nothing else but the old man's face or person, for I directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And I, and have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the sense? Now, I say, there come to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart increased my fury, and as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder and louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no, there was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still, if still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I work, worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse, cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out. No stain of any kind, no blood spot anywhere. I had been too wary for that. The tub had caught all. 
<laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what I now, for what I, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfectly suavity, with perfect suavity, suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been roused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been depu de deputed, deputed, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what I, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed, in the enthusiasm of my undisturbed, in the enthusiasm of my confidence. I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still they chatted. The ringing became more distinct, and continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length. I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt, I now grew very pale. But I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in high key with violent gesture gesticulations, gesticulations. Words are hard, ladies and gentlemen, and enemies, and with violent gesticulations, but the nose. But the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. The noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder and louder and louder, and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. It was impossible they heard not. Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought. And as I think, but anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear these hypocritical smiles no more. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 villains. I shrieked. 
Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear upon the planks here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Let me start by saying that Peter Terry was addicted to heroin. We were friends in college and continued to be after I graduated. Nothing that I said. Not that I said I. He dropped out after two years of barely cutting it. After I moved out of the dorms and into a small apartment, I didn't see Peter as much. We would talk online every now and then. There was a period where he was on the line for about five weeks straight. I wasn't worried. He was a pretty notorious flake and drug addict, so I assumed he, would, he just stopped caring. Then one night I saw him log on. Before I could initiate a conversation, he sent me a message. David. Man, we need to talk. That was when he told me about the No End House. He got that name because no one had ever reached a final exit. The rules were pretty simple and cliche. He reached the final room of the building and he won $500. There were nine rooms in all. The house was located outside the city, roughly four miles from my house. Apparently, Peter had tried and failed. He was a heroin and who knows what the fuck addict. So I figured the drugs got the best of him and he wigged out at, the paper, at a paper ghost or something. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. I didn't believe him. I told him I would check it out the next night and no matter how hard he tried to convince me otherwise. $500 sounded too good to be true. I had to go. I set out the following night. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. Have you ever seen or read something that shouldn't be scary, but for some reason, a chill crawls up your spine? I walked towards the building, and the feeling of uneasiness only intensified as I opened the front door. My heart slowed, and I let a relieved sigh leave me as I entered. The room looked like a normal hotel lobby decorated for Halloween. A sign was posted in place of a worker. It read, Room 1. Eight more to follow. Eight more to follow. Reach the end, and you win. I chuckled, and I made my way to the first door. First area was was almost laughable. The decor resembled the Halloween aisle of a Kmart, complete with sheet ghosts and animatronic zombies that gave a static growl when you passed by. At the far end was an exit. It was the only door besides the one I entered through. I brushed through the fake spider webs and headed for a second room. I was greeted by a fog as I opened the door to room two. The room definitely upped the ante in terms of technology. Not only was there a fog machine, but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. Scary. They seemed to have a Halloween soundtrack that I would find in a 99 cent store on loop somewhere in the room. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they, they must have used a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked in a Puff chest across the ne to the next area. I reached to the, for the doorknob and my heart sank to my knees. I did not want to open that door. A feeling of dread hit me so hard I can barely even think. Logic to overtook me if, after a few terrified moments and I shook it off and entered the next room. Room 3 is when things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of the wood paneled floor. A single lamp in the corner did a poor job of lighting the area, casting a few shadows across the floors and walls. That was the problem. Shadows. Plural. With the exception of the chairs, there, was, there were others. I had barely walked in the door and I was already terrified. It was at that moment that I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think as I automatically tried to open the door I came through. It was locked from the other side. That set me off. Was someone locking the doors as I progressed? 
there was no way I, I would have heard of them. Was it a mechanical lock that set automatically? Maybe. But I was too stressed to really think. I turned back to the room and the shadows were gone. The chair's shadow remained, but the others were gone. I slowly began to walk. I used to hallucinate when I was a kid, so I wrote off the shadows as a figment of my imagination. I began to feel better as I made it to the halfway point of the room. I looked down as I took my steps, and that's when I saw it. Or didn't see it. My shadow wasn't there. I didn't have time to scream. I ran as fast as I could to the other door and flung myself out, thinking into the room beyond. The fourth room was possibly the most disturbing. As I closed the door, all lights seemed to be sucked out and put back into the previous room. I stood there, surrounded by darkness, not able to move. I'm not afraid of the dark, and never have been. But I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I held my hand in front of my face. If, and if I didn't know what I was doing, I would never have been able to tell. Darkness doesn't describe it. I couldn't hear anything. It was dead silence. When you're in a soundproof room, you can still hear yourself breathing. You can hear yourself being alive. I couldn't. I began to stumble forward after a few moments. My rap rapidly beating heart. The only thing I could feel. There was no door in sight. Wasn't even sure there was one this time. The silence was then broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me. I spun around wildly, but I could barely even see my nose. I knew it was there, though. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder. Closer. It seemed to surround me, but I knew whatever was causing a noise was in front of me inching closer. I took a step back. I had never felt that kind of fear. I can't really describe true fear. I wasn't even scared I was going to die. I was scared of what the al alternative was. I was afraid what this thing had in store for me. Then the lights flashed for a second and I saw it. Nothing. I saw nothing. And I know I saw nothing there. The room was again plunged into darkness and the hum be became a wild screech. I screamed in protest. I couldn't hear th this goddamn sound for another minute. I ran backwards away from the noise and fumbled to the, for the door handle. I turned and fell into room 5. Before I describe room 5, you have to understand something. I am not a drug addict. I have no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis short of the childhood hallucinations I mentioned earlier. And those were only when I was really tired or just waking up. I entered Nino End House with a clear head. After f falling in from the previous room, my view of room 5 was, f was from my back, looking up at the ceiling. What I saw didn't scare me. It simply surprised me. Trees had grown into the room and towered above my head. The ceiling in this room were taller than the others, which made me think it was I was in the center of the house. I got off the floor, dusted myself off, and took a look around. It was definitely the biggest room of them all. I couldn't even see the door from where I was. Various brush and trees, uh, various, yeah, various brush and trees must have blocked my line of sight with the exit. Up to this point, I figured the rooms were going to get scarier, but this was a paradise compared to the last room. I also assumed whatever was in the room or stay back there. I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs and the occasional flap of birds seemed to be my only company in this room. There was one thing that bothered me the most. I heard the bugs and, and other animals, but I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big this house was. From the outside, when I first walked up, up to it, it looked like a regular house. It was definitely on the bigger side, but this was almost a full force in here. The canopy covered my view of the ceiling, but I assumed it was still there. However high it was, I couldn't see any walls either. The only way I knew... 
I was still inside was that the floor matched the other rooms. The standard dark wood. Wood. A paneling. I kept walking, hoping that the next tree I passed would reveal the door. After a few moments of walking, I felt a mosquito fly onto my arm, shook it off, and kept going. A second later, I felt ten more laying on my skin in different, at different places. I felt them crawl up and down my arms and legs, and a few made there across my face. I felt wildly to get them all off, but they just kept crawling. I looked down and let a muffled scream. More of a wh whimper, to be honest. I didn't see a single bug. Not one bug was on me, but I could feel them crawl. I heard them fly by my face and sting my skin, but I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and began to roll wildly. I was desperate. I hated bugs, especially ones I couldn't see or touch. But these bugs could touch me, and they were everywhere. I began to crawl. I had no idea where I was going. The entrance was nowhere in sight, and I still haven't seen the exit, so I just crawled. My skin wriggling at the presence of those phantom bugs. After what seemed like hours, I found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree, propped myself up, mindlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from crawling and dealing with whatever it was that was on me. I took a few shaky steps to the door, grabbing each tree on the way for support. It was only a few feet away when I heard it. The low hum from before. It was coming from the next room. And it was deeper. I could almost feel it inside my body. Like when you would stand next to an amp at, the, at a concert. The feeling of the bugs was on me lessened as the hum grew louder. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, the bugs were completely gone. But I couldn't bring myself to turn the knob. I knew that if I let go, the bugs would return. And there was no way I could make it back to the room four. I just stood there, my head pressed against the door, marked six, my hands shakily grasping the knob. The was so loud I couldn't hear, even hear myself or tend to think. There was nothing I could do but move on. Room six was next, and room six was hell. I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut, and my ears ringed. The, the hum was surrounding me. As the door clicked into place, the hum was gone. I opened my eyes in surprise and the door I had shut was gone. It was just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was identical to room three. The same chair and lamp, but the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door. And the one I came in through was gone. As I said before, I had no previous issues in terms of mental instability. But at that moment, I fell into what I know was, in, was insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't make a sound. At, at first, I scratched softly. The wall was tough, but I, I knew the door was there somewhere. I just knew it was. I scratched at where the door knob was. I clawed at the wall frantically with both hands. My nails filled. My nails being fouled down to a skin against wood. I fell silently to my knees, and the only sound in the room hurt. The insistent scratching against the wall. I knew it was there. The door was there. I knew it was just there. I knew if I could just get past this wall. Are you alright? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me. And I saw what, what it was that spoke to me. To this day, I regret ever turning around. There was a little girl. She was wearing a soft white dress that went down to her ankles. She had long blonde hair to the middle of her back and white skin and blue eyes. She was the most fright frightening thing I had ever seen, and I know that, that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. While looking at her, I saw something else. Where she stood, I saw that it looked like a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. It was naked from head to toe, but his his head was not human, and his toes were hooves. It wasn't the devil, but at that moment it might as well have been. The form had had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying, and it was synonymous with the little girl in front of me. They were the same form. I can't really describe it. 
after I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot in that room. But it was like looking at two separate dimensions. When I saw the girl, I saw the form. And when I saw the form, I saw the girl. I couldn't speak. I could barely even see. My mind was revolting against what it was attempting to process. I had been scared before in my life. And I have never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth room. But this was before room six. I just stood there staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped here with it. And then it spoke again. David, you should have listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl. But the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound. The voice just kept repeating that sentence over and over in my mind. And I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness. Yet I couldn't take my eyes off of what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I, I thought I had passed out. But the room couldn't let, wouldn't let me. I just wanted it to end. I was on my side, my eyes wide open, and the form staring down at me, scurrying across the floor. In front of me was one of the battery-powered rats from the second room. The house was toying with me. For some reason, seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed, and I looked around the room. I was getting out of there. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. I knew this room was hell, and I wasn't ready to take up residency. At first, it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room wasn't that big, so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. The demon still taunted me, the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hands on the floor, lifted myself up to all four, and turned to scan the wall behind me. Then I saw something I couldn't believe. The form was now right at my back, whispering into my mind how I shouldn't have come. I felt his breath on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. A large rectangle was scratched into the wood, with a small dent chipped away in the center of it. Right in front of my eyes, I saw a large seven. I had mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall, where room five was moments ago. I don't know how I had done it, or maybe it was just my state of mind at that time, but I had created the door. I knew I had. In my madness, I had scratched into that wall what I needed the most. An exit to the next room. Room 7 was close. I knew the demon was right behind me, but for some reason it couldn't touch me. I closed my eyes and placed both hands on the large 7 in front of me. I pushed. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me I was never leaving. It told me that, that this was the end, but I wasn't going to die. I was going to live there in room and six with it. I wasn't. I pushed and screamed at the top of my lungs. I knew I was going to push through the wall eventually. I clenched my eyes shut, shut and screamed, and the demon was gone. I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and was greeted by the room as it was when I entered. Just a chair and a lamp. I couldn't believe it, but I didn't have the time to well. I turned back to the, to the seven and jumped back slightly. What I saw was a door. It wasn't one. I had scratched in, but a regular door with a large seven on it. My whole body was shaking. It took me a while to turn the knob. I just stood there for a while, staring at the door. And I couldn't stay in room six. I couldn't. But if this was only room six, I couldn't imagine what seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour, just staring at the seven. Finally, with a deep breath, I twisted the knob and opened the door to room seven. I stumbled through the door, mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed and I realized where I was. I was outside. Not outside like room 5, but actually outside. My eyes stung. I wanted to cry. I fell to my knees and tried, but I couldn't. I was finally out of that hell. I didn't even care about the prize I was promised. I turned and saw the, that the door I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car and drove home, thinking of how nice a shower sounded. 
As I pulled up to my house, I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving no end house had faded, and dread was slowly building in my stomach. I shook it off as a residual from the house that made my way to the front door. I, I entered and immediately went up to my room. There on my bed was my cat, Baskerville. He was the first living thing I had seen all night, and I reached to pet him. He hissed and swiped at my hand. I recoiled in shock, as he never acted like that, I thought. Whatever, he's just an old cat. I jumped in the shower and got ready for what I expected to be a sleepless night. After my shower, I went to the kitchen to make something to eat. I descended to the stairs and turned into the family room, where I saw would be forever burned into my mind. However, my parents were lying on the ground, naked and covered in blood. They were mutilated to near unidentifiable states. Their limbs were removed and placed next to their bodies, and their heads were placed on their chest faces me, facing me. The most unsettling part was their expressions were smiling, as though they were happy to see me. I vomited and sobbed there in the family room. I didn't know what had happened. They didn't even live with me at the time. I was in a mess. Then I saw it. A door that was never there before. A door with a large eight scrawled on it in blood. I was still in the house. I was standing in my family room, but I was in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider, wider as I realized this. They weren't my parents. They couldn't be, but they looked exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room behind the mutilated bodies in front of me. I knew I had to move on, but at that moment, I gave up. The smiling faces tore into my mind. They grounded me where I stood. I vomited again and nearly collapsed. Then the hum returned. It was louder than ever and filled the house and shook the walls. The hum compelled me to walk. I began to walk, slowly making my way closer to the door and the bodies. I could barely stand, let alone walking, and the closer I got to my parents, the closer I came to auto homicide. The walls were now shaking so hard it seemed as though they were going to crumble, but still their faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their eyes followed me. I was now between the two bodies, a few feet away from the door. The, the dismembered hands clawed their way across the carpet towards me, all while the faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me as I walked faster. I didn't want to hear them speak. I didn't want the voices to match those of my parents. They began to open their mouths, and the hands were inches from my feet. In a dash of desperation, I lunged towards the door, threw it open, and slammed it right behind me. Room 8. I was done. After what I had just experienced, I knew there wasn't anything this fucking house couldn't throw at me that I couldn't live through. There was nothing short of the fires of hell that I had been ready for. Unfortunately, I underestimated the abilities of No End House. Unfortunately, things got more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in room 8. I, s I still have trouble believing what I saw in room 8. Again, the room was a carbon copy of the rooms 3, 3, and 6. But sitting in the usual empty chair was a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the man was sitting in the chair was me. Not someone who looked like me. It was David Williams. I walked closer. I had to get a better look, even though I was sure of it. He looked up at me, and I noticed the tears in his eyes. P please, please don't do it. Please don't hurt me. What? I asked. Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Y yes, you are. He was sobbing now. You're going to hurt me, and I don't want you to. He sat in a chair with his legs up and began rocking back and forth. It was actually pretty pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was now a few feet from the doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet, standing there talking to myself. I wasn't scared, but I would be soon. Why are you? You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. You're, go you're going to hurt me. If you hurt... If you want to leave, you're going to hurt me. What are you saying? Why are you saying this? Just calm down, all right? Let's just try to figure this. And then I saw it. David sitting down was wearing the same clothes as me, except for a small red patch on his shirt. 
embroidered with the number nine. You're gonna hurt me. You're gonna hurt me. Please, don't please. You're gonna hurt me. My eyes didn't leave that small number on his chest. I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors were plain and simple, but after a, a while, they got a little more ambiguous. Seven was scratched in the wall, but, but by my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents, but nine, this number, was on a person. A living person. Worse still, it was on a person that looked exactly like me. David? I had to ask. Yes, you're, you're gonna hurt me. You're, you're gonna hurt me. He continued to sob and rock. He answered to David. He was me, right down to the voice. But that nine, I placed around for a few minutes while he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door, and it's, it's similarly to room six. The door I came through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time. I studied the walls and floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath and seeing if anything was below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair was a knife. Attached to it was a tag that read, To David, from management. The feeling in my stomach as I read that tag was something sinister. I wanted to throw up, and the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under the chair. The other David was still sobbing uncontrollably. My mind was spinning for, into the an attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here, and how did they get my name? Not to mention the fact that I, that I was now on a cold wood floor. I also sat in that chair sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. process. The house and the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts, for some reason, turned to Peter, and whether or not he got this far. If he died, I, I, if he did, if he met Peter Terry sobbing in the very, this very chair, rocking back and forth, I shook those thoughts out of my head. They didn't matter. I took the knife from under the chair, and immediately the other David went quiet. David? David, he said in my voice, what, what do you think you're going to do? I lifted myself to the ground and clenched the knife in my hand. I'm going to get out of here. David was still sitting in the chair, though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Solo, he got up from the chair and stood facing me. It was uncanny. His height and even the way he stood matched mine. I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand and gripped it tighter. I don't know what I was planning on doing with it, but I had the feeling I was going to need it. Now, his voice was slightly deeper than my own. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you. And I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond. I just lunged and tackled him to the ground. I had mounted him and looked down. Knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror. Then the hum returned, low and distant. Though I still felt it deep in my body. David looked up at me as I looked down at myself. The hum was getting louder, and I felt something inside me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on his chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room, and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had experienced up to that point. Room 4 was dark, but it didn't come close to what this was completely engulfing me. I wasn't even sure if I was falling after a while. I felt weightless, covered in dark, then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed, and auto-homicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind. I knew it wasn't real, but I had seen it, and the mind was troubled differentiating between what is real and what isn't. The sadness only deepened. I was in room 9 for what seemed like days. The final room in what... That's exactly what it was. The end. No one house had an end, and I had reached it. At that moment, I gave up. I knew I would be that in between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. 
I had lost all senses. I couldn't feel myself. I couldn't hear anything. Sight was completely useless here. I searched for a taste in my mouth and found nothing. I felt this disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room 9 was hell. Then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. I felt the ground come up from below me, and I was standing. After a moment or two, I gathered my thoughts and senses. I walked. I slowly walked toward that light. As I approached the light, it took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of an unmarked door. I slowly walked through the door and found myself back where I had started. The lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I left it. Still empty, still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything that had happened that night, I was still wary of where I was. After a few moments of normalcy, I looked around the place trying to find anything different. On the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered up the courage to open the envelope inside. It was a letter again handwritten. David Williams. Congratulations, you have made it to the end of No One House. Please accept this prize as a token of a great achievement. Yours forever, management. With the letter were $500 bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. I laughed as I walked out of my car and laughed as I drove home. I laughed as I pulled into my driveway. I laughed as I opened my front door to my house. And laughed as I saw a small tent etched into the wood. <laughs> In 1983, a team of deeply pious ancient scientists conducted a radical experiment in an undisclosed facility. The scientists had theorized that a human without access to any senses or way to perceive stimuli would be able to perceive the presence of God. They believed that the five senses clouded our awareness of eternity, and without them a human could establish contact with God by thought. An elderly man who claimed to have nothing left to live for was the only test subject to volunteer. To purge him of all his senses, the scientists performed a complex operation in which every sensory nerve connection to the brain was surgically severed. Although the test subject remained full muscular function, he could not see, hear, taste, smell, or feel, with no possible way to communicate with, or even sense the outside world. He was alone with his thoughts. Scientists monitored him as he spoke aloud about his state of mind in jumbled, slurred sentences that he couldn't even hear. After four days, the man claimed to be hearing hushed, unintelligible voices in his head. Assuming it was the onset of psychosis, the scientists paid little attention to the man's concerns. Two days later, the man cried that he could hear his dead wife speaking with him, and even more, he could communicate back. The scientists were intrigued, but were not convinced until the subject started naming the dead relatives of the scientist. He repeated personal information to the scientists that only their dead spouses and parents would have known. At this point, a sizable portion of the scientists left the study. After a week of conversing with the deceased through his thoughts, the subject became distressed, saying the voices were overwhelming. In every waking moment, his consciousness was bombarded by hundreds of voices that refused to leave him alone. He frequently threw himself against the wall, trying to elicit a pain response. He begged the scientists for sed sedatives so he could escape the voices by sleeping. This tactic worked for three days until he started having severe night terrors. Subject repeated said that he could see and hear the deceased in his dreams. Only a day later, the subject began to scream and claw at his non-functional eyes, hoping to sense something in the physical world. The high the hysterical subject now said the voices of the dead were deafening and hostile, speaking of hell and the end of the world. At one point, he yelled, No heaven, no forgiveness. For five hours straight, 
he continually begged to be killed, but the scientists were convinced that he was close to establishing contact with God. After another day, the subject could no longer form coherent sentences. Seemingly mad, he started to bite ch off chunks of flesh from his arm. The scientists rushed into the test chamber and restrained him on a table so, so he could not kill himself. After a few hours of being tied down, the subject halted his struggling and screaming. He stared blankly at the ceiling as teardrops silently streaked across his face. For two weeks, the subject had to be manually rehydrated due to the constant crying. Eventually, he turned his head, and despite his blindness, made focused eye contact with a scientist for the first time in the study. He whispered, I have spoken with God, and he has abandoned us. And his vital signs stopped. There was no apparent cause of death. <laughs> You have to puke it up, said C. You have to get it down there and puke it up. I mean down past where you can feel it, you know? She gestured earnestly at her chest. She had this old, this old fashioned cotton nightgown on. Lace colored brilliant under the bathroom lights. Above the collar, her skin looked gray. She had bones like a bird. She was so beautiful. She was completely beautiful and fucked. I mean, everybody at camp was sort of a mess. We were even supposed to be that way. At a difficult stage. But C looked at But C took it to another level, hurting us into the bathroom at night and asking us to puke. It's right there, she said, tapping the nightgown over her hollow chest, where you've got less nerves in your esophagus. It's like weird into the side, into the muscle. You have to puke really hard to get it. Did you ever get it out? I asked Mac. I asked Mac. Ah, that ah, Max. She was sitting on one of the sinks. She'd believe anything. C nodded. Follow him as a cons uh, counselor. Two years ago, they caught. They caught me and gave me a new one. It was beautiful while it was gone. I'm telling you, it was the best. Like. How? I asked. She stretched out her arms, like bliss. Ev like everything. Everything all at once. Your raw, just big raw nerve. That doesn't sound so great, said Ellie. I know, said C. Not annoyed, but really agreeing. Turning things around. That was one of her talents. It sounds stupid, she nodded. But that's because it's something we can't imagine. We don't have the tools. Our bodies don't know how to calculate what we are missing. We can't know till we get there. And that's the same time. It's where you come from. It's where you started. She raised her toothbrush. So, who's with me? Oh. Definitely not me. God, see. You were such an idiot. Apparently a girl named Puss had told her about the bug. And see, being C, was totally open to learning new things from a person who called herself Puss. Puss had puked out her own bug and was living on the streets. I, I guess she'd run away from camp? I don't really know. She was six feet tall, C said, had long red hair, the hair that was dyed, which was weird, because if you lived, if you were living on the streets, do you care about stuff like that? It's the kind of thing you keep... It's... It's... This kind of thing can keep me awake at night. I lay... I lie in bed, or rather I sit in the living room because Pete hates me tossing and turning, and I leave the dark room and open all the curtains. I watch the lights of the city and think about this girl, Puss, d getting red hair dye at the grocery store and doing her hair in, in the bathroom at the train station. Did she put newspaper down? And what if somebody came and saw her? Anyway, eventually C met Puss in the park, and Puss was clearly down and out and a hooker, but she looked cool and friendly, and C sat down beside, beside her on the, wing, on the swings. You have to puke it up. We'd only been at camp for about six weeks. It seemed, it seemed like a long time, a long enough for, a long enough to know everybody. 
telling everything felt stretched out at camp days and nights yet in the end it was over so fast as soon as you could blink camp was on its own calendar a special time in life that was jody's phrase she's she was our favorite counselor she was greasy and and greasy and enthusiastic with a skinny little ponytail only a year or two older than the seniors camp is so special the thing with jody was she believed believed every word she said it made it really hard to make fun of her that night the night in the bathroom she was asleep down the hall underneath her mother figure which was a little stuffed doll a little stuffed dog with florida on its chest Come on, said C, and she stuck her toothbrush down her throat. Just like that, I think, Max screamed. C didn't start puking right away. She had to give herself a few really good shoves with that toothbrush, while people said, oh my god, and backed away, and clutched one another and stared. Somebody said, are you nuts? Somebody else said something else. I might have said something. I don't know. Everything was so white and bright in the moment. Mirrors and fluorescent lights and sea and that goddamn Victorian nightgown jabbing away with her toothbrush and sort of gagging. Every time I looked up, I could see all of us in the mirror. And then it came. A spatter of puke all over the sink. She leaned over and braced herself. Bam, Ellie said. Oh my god, that is that is disgusting. She gasped. She was just getting started. Ellie was next. All of a sudden, she was spun around, her hands over her mouth, and let go in the sink right next to C. Splat. I started laughing, but I could already... F but I already felt sort of dizzy and sick myself. And also scared, because I didn't want to throw up. C looked from her own sink and nodded at Ellie, encouraging her. She looked completely bizarre. Her wide cheekbones, her big crown of natural hair. Sort of a retro supermodel with glistening with a glistening mouth. Her eyes full of excitement. I think she even said, Good job, Ellie. Then she went to it with a toothbrush again. We have to stop her, said said Katie, taking charge. Max, we have to get Jody. But Max didn't make it. She jumped down from the third sink, and when, but when we got halfway to the door, she turned around and ran back to the sink and puked. Meanwhile, Katie was dragged, was dragging C away from the sink and trying to get the toothbrush, but also not wanting to touch it. And she kept going, ew, 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 and help me, you guys. It was all so hilarious, I sank down t on the floor, absolutely crying with laughter. Five or six other girls, too. We sort of just looked at each other and screamed. It was mayhem. Katie dragged C into one of the stalls. I don't know why. Then Katie started groaning and let C and let go of C and staggered into the stall beside her. And then, spoosh. There she went. Bugs. It's such a camp rumor. Camp is full of stories like that. People say the ice cream makes you st uh, sterile. The bathrooms are all full of hidden cameras. There's fanged, flesh-eating kids in the lake. If you break into the office, you can call your parents. Lots of kids break into the office. It's the most common camp offense. I've never tried it because I'm not stupid. But of course, you can't call your parents. How would you ever get their number? And bugs. The idea of bugs planted under your skin to track you and feed you drugs. That's another dumb story. Except it's not. Because I saw one. The smell in the bathroom was terrible now. An animal smell. Hot. It thrashed around and it had fur. I knew I was going to be sick. I clawed at the closest place. The stall 
I crawled into the closest place, the stall where C knelt, and grabbed a hold of the toilet seat. C moved aside from me. Would she believe... Would you believe she was still hanging onto her toothbrush? I think we both threw up a couple of times. Then she made this awful sound beyond anything, her whole body taut and straining. Something flew into the toilet with a splash. I looked at her and there was blood all over her chin. I said, Jesus, C. I thought she was dying. She sat there coughing and shaking, her eyes full of tears and triumph. She was on top of the world. Look, she breathed. I looked, and there, in the bowl, half hidden by puke and blood, laid an object made of metal. It actually looked like a bug. Sharp, smeared legs. The blood-smeared legs. Shit, I said. I flushed the toilet. Now you, said C, wiping her mouth and on the back of her wrist. I can't. Tisha, come on. C, I couldn't. I really couldn't. I could be sick. In fact, I felt sicker than ever. But I couldn't do it that hard. I remember the look in your eyes. You were so disappointed. You leaned and spat some blood into the toilet. I whispered, don't tell anyone, not even the other girls. Why not? We should all know. Just trust me. I was already scared. So scared I couldn't bear the idea of camp without you. Yeah, I have no idea what the fuck is going on. We barely slept that night. We had to take uh, we had to take showers and clean the bathroom. Max cried the whole time, but at least for wait, but for at least part of the night, I was laughing. Me and Katie fighting disinfectant powder everywhere, or flinging dis disinfectant powder everywhere. Katie was cool, always in sweatpants, didn't give a shit about anything. You know your friends. Your friend has is a headache, right? She said. It was the first time anybody'd call see my friend. We'd got out the mop and lathered up the floor. Everyone slipped and swore at us, coming out of the showers. She skidded by it by in a towel. We she shrieked. You cannot feel your bug. I've pressed so hard on my chest. I know. I could feel it, said C. After they put it back in, it wasn't exactly a physical thing. She couldn't trace the shape of the bug inside her, but she could feel it working. Bug juice, she said, making a sour face. She could feel bug juice seeping into her body. Every time she was going to be angry or afraid, There'd be this warmth in her chest, a feeling of calm spreading deep inside. I've only noticed it after I've had the bug out for a couple of weeks. How how did your parents know you needed a new one? Didn't need one. How did they know it was gone? Well, I kind of had this fit. I got mad at them and started throwing food. We were sitting on my bed. Under my mother figure, a lamp with a blue shade, a blue light brought on, uh, brought out the strains of C's Victorian nightgown. We were both painting our toenails cherry pink, bal balancing the polish of my life's on my life skill book, skill life skills textbook, taking turns with the brush. We should do it, he said. I feel better. I'm so much better. I thought... I thought how in a minute we'd have to study for our life skills quiz. I didn't think there was bug juice in my body. I couldn't feel anything. I'm so much better, C said again. Her hand was shaking. Oh, C. The weird thing is, I started writing this after Mac came to visit me, and I thought I was going to write about Max. But then I started writing in my book. Of writing in your book. What? Why is... Why? This book you left me, my mother figure, you practically threw it at me. Take it. It was the worst thing you could do. Take somebody else's parent figure, especially the mom. Or maybe it was 
only us girls who cared about, cared so much about the moms. Maybe for the boys, it was about, it was the dads. But anyways, but anyways, taking, taking one was the worst. You could practically expect the other kids to kill you. A kid got put in the hospital that way in a different camp. The one on the east side. We all, but we all knew about, about it at our camp. They stung him up with electric wires. Oh, they strung him up with electric wires. Whenever we told the story, we ended by saying that we would have done it to that kid. And that it was always much worse. But you threw this book at me, see? And what could I do? Jody and Duke, uh, Duncan? Duncan. Were, were trying to grab your arms. And the ambulance was waiting for you downstairs. I caught the book clum uh, clumsily, crumpling it. I looked at it later. And it was about half full of your writing, I think. They're poems. Dank smells underground. Want to get back. No pill for it. I need you. I don't know. Are they poems? If they are, I don't think they're very good. A nap? Could be a door in a, an abandoned car. Does that even mean anything? Eat my teeth. I know them all by heart. I picked up this book when Max left. I wrote, You have to puke it up. All of a sudden, I was writing about you, surprising myself. I just kept going, remembering camp, the weird sort of humanoid, excite, a humid excitement here. The cafeteria louder than the sea, the shops. Remember the shops? Lulu's was the best. We'd save up our allowance and go there. Down in the basement, you would get used use stuff for cheap. You got your leather jacket there. I got those red shoes with flowers on the toes. I loved those shoes so much. I wonder where they went. I wrote... I wore them every mixer. I was wearing them when I met Petey. When I met Pete. Probably with my white dress. Another Lulu's purchase I don't have now. It was summer. The mixer had an island theme. The counselor had constructed the sort of deck overlooking the lake. God, they were so proud of it. They gave us green drinks with little umbrellas in them and played lazy, sighing music. And everyone danced. And Pete saw a shooting star and we were holding hands. And you were gone forever. And I forgot you. I forgot you. Writing isn't so wrong. It's a life skill. I don't remember what my parents looked like. A parent figure cannot be a photograph. It has to be more of a natural object. It's supposed to stand for, in for someone, but not too much. When we got to camp, we were su all supposed to bring our parent figures to dinner the, the first night. Everyone squeezed in at the cafeteria tables, trying to find a place beside their dinners, uh, their dinner trays for their figures. Those calendars and catcher mitts and scarves I felt so stupid because my mother figure was a lamp and there was no place to plug it in. My father figure was a plaque, a plaque that says, always be yourself. Jody came by as the counselors were all going around meeting the parents and she said, wow, Tisha, that's a good one. I don't even know if I picked it up. It picked it out. We want you to have a, fab a fabulous time at camp, Jody cried. She was standing out uh, at the front of the other counselor, uh, Paige and Veronica and Duncan, who we'd call, later call Husky Duncan, and Eric and Carla and the others. Of course, they'd chosen Jody to speak. Jody was so perky. She told us that we were beginning a special relationship with our parent figures, that is very important to not fixate. We shouldn't fixate on parent figures, and we definitely shouldn't fixate on the counselors. My stupid lamp. It was so fucking blue. Why would you bring something blue? 
The most important people in your life are the other campers, Jody uh, burbled. These are the people you'll know for the rest of your life. Now, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, Hi, neighbor. Hi, neighbor. And later in the forest, she's saying to the sky, Fuck you, neighbor. Camp was special. You were told it was special. At camp, you connected with people and, na and with nature. There was no personal tech. That freaked a lot of people out at first. We were told that later we'd be able to get online again, but we'd be adults and our relationships would be in a place and we would know we would have learned our life skills and we'd be ready. But now this is special. This was special. Now was the time of friends and of the earth. Svi raised her hand. What about earthquakes? What, said Veronica, who taught the natural world. Veronica was from an older group of counselors. She had gray hair and le uh, leathery skin from ta uh, ta yeah, taking kids on nature hikes. And she was always stretching to show that she could be flexible. That you could be flexible when you were old. What about earthquakes? She asked. What about fires? Are those natural? What about hurricanes? Veronica smiled at us with her awesome white teeth because you could have aunt, could have awesome white teeth when you were old. It was all a matter of taking care of yourself with the right life skills. What an interesting question, Sia. We were told that all of our questions were interesting. There's no such thing as stupid questions. The important thing was always to participate. We were told to participate in class and hikes and shopping sprees and mixers. In history, we learned that we that there used to be that there used to be prejudice, but now there wasn't. It didn't matter where you came from or who you loved. Just join in, and that's why even with the queer girls, uh, had to go to the mixers. You could take your girlfriend, but you had to go. Katie used to uh, to go in a tie, and Ellie would wear flowers. They rolled their eyes, but they went anyway and danced, and it was fun. Camp was so fun. C raised her hand. Why is it a compliment to tell somebody, somebody it doesn't matter who they are? We were told to find a hobby. There were a million choices we tried. All We tried them all. Sports and crafts and art and music. There was so much to do. Every day there was some kind of program, and then there were clothes, and then we would study for class. No wonder why we forgot stuff. We were told that forgetting was natural. Forgetting helped us survive. Jody told us life sk in life skills class. Tears in her eyes. She cried as easily as Max. She was more like a kid sister than a counselor. Everybody wanted Jody to be okay. You'll always be reminded, she said again. She said in her hoarse, heroic voice, You'll always have your uh, parent figure. It's okay to be sad. But remember, you have each other now. And it, it's the most important bond in the world. She so raised her hand. But, if, but what if we don't want us? She so raised her hand. But of course, she raised her hand. She was C. She was C. She'd always been C. Do you see what I mean? I mean, she was like that right from the day she arrived. She was brash, me messy. He before the night in the bathroom. She was supposed to, before she supposedly puked out her bug. I couldn't see any difference. I could not see any difference. So, of course, I had second thoughts. I wished so bad I hadn't flushed the toilet. What if there wasn't anything in it? What if somebody dropped a piece of jewelry in there, some necklace or brooch, and I thought it was a bug? What what could have happened? Camp was so fun. Shaving my, leg, uh, my legs for the mixer, wearing red shoes. We were all so lucky. Camp was the best thing ever. Every child at camp. That was the government government slogan. E-C-A-C. She used to make this gag face whenever she said E C A C. Ick. Sick.
He took me into the forest. It was a mixer. Everybody, everybody else was crowded around the picnic tables. The lake was flat and scummy, and the sun was just going down. Clouds of biting insects. Insects golden in the haze. Come on, C said. Let's get out of here. We walked over to the, so uh, the sodden sand into the weeds. A couple of counselors watched us go. I saw Husky Duncan look at us with his binoculars. But because we were just two girls, they didn't care. It only mattered if you left the mixer with a boy. Then they had to stop at the self-care stand for condoms and an injection because becoming a parent is a serious uh, decision. Duncan lowered his binoculars. We stepped across the rocks and into the trees. This is so cool, C whispered. I didn't really think it was cool. It was weird and sticky in there, and it was sort of dark. The weeds kept tickling my legs, but I went further because of C. Uh, it's hard to explain this thing she had. She was like an event just about to happen, but you didn't want to miss it. I didn't want to. Any, Anyway. It was so dark that we had to hold hands after a while. He walked in front of me, pushing branches out of the way, making loud crunch, uh, crackling sounds, sometimes kicking to break through the bushes. Her laugh sounded close. Like we were trapped in a basement at Lulu's. In the basement at Lulu's. That's what it was like. Being trapped in this amazing place where everything was magical. Magically half price. I was so excited and then horrified because suddenly I had to take a dump. What? There was no way I could hold it in. By the second, I told C, too embarrassed to, her to go away. I crouched down. I went to wipe myself with leaves. I'm sure she knew what was up, but she took my hand right again after I was done. She, looked, she took my disgusting hand. I felt like I wanted to die. And at the same time, I was floating. We kept going until we stumbled into a clearing in the woods. Star, stars above us in a perfect circle. Woohoo! C hollered, fuck you, neighbor. She gave the stars the finger. The silhouette of her hand stood out against the bright. I gave the stars the fingers, too. I was this shitty, disgusting kid with a lamp and a, pla a plaque for parents. But I was there with C, and the time was exactly now. It was like there was, an there was a beautiful, sorry place we'd never get into didn't deserve to get into but at the same time we were better than any brightness two sick girls underneath the stars fuck you neighbor it felt great if i could go anywhere i'd want to be there the counselors came for us after a while a circle of them with big flashlights talking and headsets jody told us they'd be looking everywhere for us we were pretty worried about you girls. The first time, I didn't feel sorry for her. I felt like I wanted to kick her in the shins. Shit, I forgot about that until now. I forgot so much. I'm like, a, I'm like a shiv. Sometimes I tell Pete I think I'm going senile. Like a premature senile dementia. Last month, I, just, I suggested go. we go to Clearview for our next vacation. And you said... And he said, Trish, you hate Clearview, don't you remember? It's true, I hate, I hated Clearview. The beach was okay, but the night there was nothing, there was nothing to do but drink. So we're going, going to go to Palace Toots instead. At least you can gamble there. See, I wondered about you so much. I wonder what happened to you. And where you are. I wonder if you've ever been. Ever tried to find me. It wouldn't be hard. If you linked to the register. You'd know. Our graduating class ended up in food services. 
I'm in charge of inventory of a food chain of grocery stores. Pete drives delivery. Ke uh, Katie stocks the, sh the shelves. The year before us, the graduates of my camp went to the army. The year after us, they went into the army. The year after, they went into communication technologies. The year after that, they st I stopped paying attention. I stopped wondering what life would be uh, be like if I graduated in a different year. We're okay, me and Pete. We make it work, you know? He's sad because I don't want to have kids. But he hasn't brought it up in a couple of years. We do the usual stuff. Hobbies, vacations, work. Pete's into guardian, uh, guardian, guardian, guard, gardening? Gardening. Once a week, we have dinner with some, some of the gang. We keep our parent figures on the table. On the hall table like everyone else sometimes i think about how if we if you'd graduated with us you'd be doing some kind of job in food services too weird is weird right but you didn't graduate with us i guess you never graduated at all i've looked for you on the buses and in the streets wondering if i'd suddenly see you god i'd jump off the bus so quick I wouldn't even wait for the, for it to stop moving. I wouldn't care if I fell in the gutter. I remember your tense face, your never your nervous look when you found out that you that we were going to have a checkup. I can't have a checkup, you said. Why not? Because you said because they'll see my bug is gone. And I just I don't know. I sort of feel embarrassed for you. I. I'd convinced myself the whole bug thing was a mistake, a hallucination. I looked down at my book when I, and when I looked up, you were standing in the same place, with an alert look on your face, as if you were listening. He looked at me and said, "I have to run." It was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. The whole camp was monitored, monitored practically up to the moon. There was no way to get outside, but you tried. You left my room, and went straight out your window and broke your ankle a week later you were back you were on crutches you looked wrecked destroyed somebody had cut your hair shaved it close to the scalp your eyes stood out huge and shining they put in they put they put in a, a bug in me you whispered and i just knew i knew that you were going to Max came to see me a few days ago. I've felt sick ever, uh, sick ever since. Max is the same hunched, timid you'd know if uh, you'd know her if you saw her. She sat in my living room, and I gave her coffee and lemon cookies, and she took a bite, uh, took one bite of a cookie, and started crying. See, we miss miss you. We really do. Max told me she's pregnant. I said congratulations. I knew she and Evan had been wanting one for a while. She covered her eyes with her hands. She she still bites her nails. One of them is was bleeding, and she just cried. Hey, Max, I said. It's okay. I figured she was extra emotional from hormones or whatever. Or maybe she was thinking of the short time she'd have with her kid. Now that can't, that, now that camp, uh, now that kid can't, kids start camp at eight years old. It's okay, I told her. Even though I've, I'd never have kids, I couldn't stand it. They say it's easier on the kids going to camp earlier. We, me and, me and you and Max, we were on the tail end of graduation teen. Max's kids will belong to graduation eight. It's supposed to be a happier generation, but I'm guessing it will, will be sort of like us, like us. The kids of graduation eight will be told that they're sad and that they all, they need their parents and that's why they have parent figures so that they can always be reminded of what they've lost so that they can remember they need what they have now. I sat across the coffee table from Max. She was crying and I wasn't hugging her because I don't really hug people anymore. Not even Pete, really. I'm sort of mean that way. It's just how I turned out. And Max said, Do you remember the night in the bathroom with with C? Do I remember? 
Her eyes were all so uh, all swollen. She hiccuped. I can't stop thinking about it. I'm scared, she said. She had sent a report to her doctor every day on her phone about how she was feeling. As she vomited, her morning sickness wasn't too bad. She'd thrown up twice, and both times she had to go in for a checkup. So, I said, so, they always put you to sleep, you know. Yeah? I just said, yeah. Just sat there in front of her and said, yeah. Like I was a rock. After a while, I could tell she was feeling uncertain. And then she felt stupid. She picked up her stuff and blew her nose on and went home. She left the tissues on the table. One of them spotted with blood from her bit her bitten nail. I haven't really been sleeping since she left. I mean, I've always had trouble sleeping, but now it's a lot worse, especially since I started writing you in your book. I just feel sick, see? I feel really sick. All those checkups so regular, everyone gets them. But you're definitely supposed to go in if you're feeling nauseous, if you vomited. It might be a super flu. The world is so full of viruses, good health is everybody's business. And yeah, they put you to sleep every time. Yeah, they put a bug in me, you said camp was so fun. Jody came to us, wringling her hands. She has been having some problems, and it's still, and it's up to all of us to look after you, after her. Girls, campers stick together, but we didn't stick together, did we? I woke up. You were shouting in the hall. I ran out there, and you were hopping on your good foot, your good foot, your toothbrush in one hand, your mother figure notebook in the other. I knew exactly what you'd caught. Uh, what they'd caught you doing. How did they catch you? Where... Were... Were there really cameras in the bathroom? Jody called Duncan, and that's how I knew how bad it was. Husky Duncan in the girls' hallway, just outside the bathroom, wearing white shorts and a seriously pissed-off expression. He and Jody were grabbing you, and you were fighting them off. Trisha said Jody. It's okay. She's just sick. She's going to the hospital. You threw at you you threw the notebook. Take it, you snarled. Those were the last words, your last words to me. I never saw you again, except in dreams. Yeah, I see you in dreams. I see you in your white lacy nightgown. See I feel sick. At night I feel so sick. I walk around in circles. There's waves of sickness, the waves of something else. Something that calms me. Something that's trying to make the sickness go away. Up and down it goes. I'm just in it. Just trying to stand it. And then I sleep again. I dream you're beside me. We're leaning over the toilet. And down at the bottom there's something like a clump of trees. And two tiny girls are standing there giving us the finger. It's not where I come uh, came from. But it's where I started. I think of how bright it was in the bathroom that night. How some kind of loss swept through all of us. Electric. You'd started it. You'd started it by yourself. And we were so... Wi we were with you. And it was hilarious. And a total rage of loss. Let loose of it. L let loose it. Let's lose it. Let's lose everything. Camp wasn't fun. Camp was a fucking factory. I had to get out of the factory on Fridays to check my lists over coffee with Ellie. The bus passes shattered buildings, stick people rooting around in my garage. Three out of five graduating classes joined the army. Give me serenity to accept the things I cannot change. How did I even get here? I'd ask my mom if she wasn't a fucking lamp. See, I feel sick. I should just grab my keys and get some money and run to Max's house. We should both We should both be sick. Everyone would lose it together. We shouldn't have I shouldn't have told you not to tell others. We should have gone together. My fault. I dream I find you and Puss in the bathroom in the train station. There's blood everywhere. 
and you laugh and tell me it's hair dye. See, it's bright. It makes me sick. Now I have to go. It got come out. Just send me a text when it's done. Hi, called to Dr. Roberts as, as she closed the large metal door. She could hear the automatic locks sealing her off from the outside world when the metal plates set into place. The locking system was excessively sexist and annoying at times, but I knew what it, what it, that it was necessary. She traveled down and confined walls of Site 100 until she stood before the one-way mirror that looked over the containment chamber. There it stood, stationary on top one of several hexagonal pillars found in, the, in this enclosure. The deer was looking directly at high parking through the glass. The researcher could tell if it stared with wonder, confusion, or some emotion beyond human comprehension. I moved on. She could see plenty more of the deer in, in the following days. It was not worth looking at more than she had to. She walked over to room TA-209 and peeked inside. She could see many of her colleagues practicing their lines for procedure 410-Cassini. Most people would smile at the crazy display before her, but Hyde did not smile. This play was not a laughing matter. If they screwed up, they'd be good as dead. Hyra arrived at the lounge room to make herself a cup of coffee and her anxiety medic and take her anxiety medication. It gave her life at a time when she desperately needed it. Containing SCP-2845 wasn't physically exhausted, but it was sure was mentally taxing. The secretary had just begun pouring water into the coffee machine when her phone buzzed. I sighed. Did Roberts want to come back inside already? I burst into the center communica of communications room, already out of breath, having raced across half the facility. Five of her colleagues were already present in the chamber, and none acknowledged her arrival despite her abrupt entrance. They all had their eyes trained on the monitor, hooked up to the western wall. She was about to yell at them, demanding an explanation. The words left her when she saw what they were captivated on. It was a live feed of a massive pileup in Times Square. A fire was raging from a car when it exploded, and a building adjacent to it caught a blaze. This carnage wasn't what filled High with a sense of dread. It was the people she saw. They were melting right before her eyes. They were screaming in pain and terror as their skin slowly sank into a shape with that no longer resembled anything human. Muscle tissue peeled off until you can make out the distinct white coloration of the bones. The bones visible do not appear to be broken despite mass dislocation. She saw a skull float seamlessly atop a mountain of flesh and half a custom ribcage with tendrils wrapped around it in various intervals, now slowly receding into the general mass. She looked on in horror as she saw a lower jaw of a man melt off of his face and fall onto his clothes. One of his eyes slid down to what should have been his throat. The eye appeared to look as if fully operational despite being dislocated to such a degree, and in spite of most of the people being officially disfigured at, at a point, the people continued to crawl along the asphalt. Are, are, are they? She watched in, in horror as a little boy was being dragged into the flame. In, into the frame. He kicked and screamed as he melted. Remains of the victims dragged him outside of, her, of a little restaurant and into the light. He cried for his father as he struggled against the flesh. He desperately grabbed onto the door frame until he lost his grip and fell forwards into the mass. The screaming faded into the gurgling noise as he appeared to be choking due to his vocal cords melting into the, his esophagus. His body melted and mixed into the black mash of bodies. Soon she couldn't make out the boy amongst the mountains of flesh. He was a part of it now. An emergency broadcast message cut the footage short. The Foundation's logo and slogan was plastered in white at the top. It was then followed by a passage detailing others, but Hai didn't say to, to find out what it was saying.
Haya backed out of the room and her legs trembled slightly. She felt like she was going to vomit. Haya was used to horrific sights. She had seen procedure 460 Ophelos performed firsthand after all. But what she had just witnessed filled her with a new sense of dread and disgust. Highest thought were cut off by a buzzing of her phone once again. She reached into her pocket with trembling hands and glanced at the screen. Now who was calling her? Daniel Roberts. She felt goosebumps once again crawl over her body. She completely forgot about him. She was the only person she was the only person who knew he was outside. Her mind flashed back to the boy on the screen, causing her to grimace. D Dan! Daniel, I, 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 I'm sorry. She turned on her heels, running back down the hall. I, I am so sorry. I, I have no idea what's happening. I saw, I watched, I... Hi? Is that you? Where have you been? You have to come out here for a second. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, something's going... I, I am so sorry. Oh my god. I'm coming to get you right now. Hold on. Hi ran past the glass of the deer chamber without so much as a glance in his direction, unaware at any changes to its position or activities. Th th there must have been a breach or something. A breach? Hold on a second. You need to calm down. Everything is just perfect right now. Come see for yourself. It's such a nice day out today. I arrived at, the, at an elevator and slammed her hand on the down button. She was panting profusely from having just ran full speed through the halls of the site. N no, Dan. It it's New York. The, the whole city. It's burning. It's boiling. It, it didn't. I was not gasping for air now, her ice racing faster than a bullet train. It's something... I don't... Oh, God. What are we? Tears sort of run down her cheeks as she knelt o over, beginning to feel lightheaded. I wanted to scream, but she couldn't. She couldn't. She could barely speak now. Hey, 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 now. Calm down, hi. You're all right. You're all right. I'm here for you. You need to calm down. Just relax. Let's do some breathing exercises. Just breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Come on, do it with me now. Breathe in, breathe out. She listened to the calm words of her companion. She started to take large breaths of air with audible gasps. It was now dawning on her how out of breath she was. I had just had filled her lungs with CO2 from how badly she was handling her breathing during during her full-on sprint up and down the facility just moments ago, on top of her racing heart. Slowly, she felt herself coming down with only a little. The down arrow blinked to life above, and a pleasant ding was heard. I looked at the metallic doors parted ways for her. She felt a twang of relief wash over her body as she stepped inside. Thank you, Daniel. I, I think I'm starting to feel better now. She exhaled as she leaned against one of the walls. You, you always know how to help me. Thank you. There you go. You shouldn't overwork yourself like that. You took your medication today, right? I pressed the button that led to the ground floor. No. No, I didn't. There was no time. Come and open the door for us. You'll feel much better out here. Getting fresh air always helps calm the nerves. She had her phone pressed against the... Her right ear when an alarm rang out. She yelped and extensively moved her phone away from her ear. Her call was terminated automatically, and her screen was now on lock menu without warning in the middle of the screen. She put on a hand to her left ear as she opened the message. The foundation logo with the words SK Class Scenario and white font at the top of the screen. Below, it was a message in similar white font. To all Foundation personnel, you are to shelter in a place until further notice. We are experiencing an, an XK class end of the world scenario. We don't fully understand what is happening at the moment, but rest assured we will be relaying updates as soon as we can. What we do understand, however, is that making contact with the outside world will result in immediate death. You are to stay inside and shelter in place. Do not, under any circumstances, go outside. Be on standby for further instructions. The Administrator. All, all the work she had done to stabilize her breathing became inconsequential as she read the message. Her phone was ringing. For the past hour, the device had only brought her nothing but bad news. She knew no, nothing good could come from it, and yet she answered the phone again despite herself. Hi. Hi. 
Where are you? You said you, you had opened a door for me. What's going on? Tears began to well, well up in her eyes, but her voice did not waver. D Daniel, I can't. We, um, we have to shelter in place immediately. It's an XK. Some kind of XK event is happening. Oh no, that sounds horrible. Please come open the door, hi. I don't want to be alone without you. N no, Dan, I, I can't. We've been told to shelter in place. It's dangerous out there. I, I'm so, so sorry. What? Are you okay, hi? What are you talking about? The sun is so warm and nice right, right now. This can't be an XK. N no, Dan. I saw it. It was on the cameras. It, it, it was horrible. Children were melting. Melting, goddammit. Her eyes voice cracked. Tears began running down her face. What do you mean? You aren't making any sense. We're, we're outstanding. Okay, let's just talk about this later. Just please let me inside. I want to be with you again. I can't handle being separated from you like this. I saw the massive doorway just down the hall with its automatic locks sealed into place. It was more of a prison vault door, keeping the most dangerous and valuable locked inside. I shook her head and hung up the phone. She quickly, she quickened her pace, making her way to the door in seconds. Her friend was right. She had let him in, in the right way. She couldn't just leave him out there to die and melt. Maybe she had time to save him. He, yeah, New York is like hundreds of miles away. <laughs> There's no way he could have reached us by now. Hi grunted her teeth and looked fearfully into the terminal. On the side of the wall, she was talking to herself again. Hi ignored it and quickly began inputting her credentials. What, what the hell are you doing? Hi jolted at the start of commanding voice. Uh, no, sorry, that was the wrong person. What the hell are you doing? Hi jolted at the start of commanding voice that boomed from behind her. Hi spun around and terminal saw an NTF agent, Rem Donnie, play. She was fully dressed in her uniform, and you couldn't see an inch of skin on her except for her helmet, which she had pressed underneath her elbow. Rem scowled at High, in her deep violet eyes, which I could clearly make out despite being over ten meters away. We were told to, to shelter in place. What do you think you're doing? Rem began quickly advancing towards High. Step away from the door now! Rem started making making her way across the room to confront her colleague more severely when the vault door opened up. I had already finished unlocking the door before Rem had demanded her to stop. The automated system slowly slung the door inwards. The sunlight engulfed the left side of the room with fresh air and familiar rays of sunlight. Rem gasped as she was caught right in the sun gaze. As soon as the rays embraced Rem, she let out a horrific scream and she attempted to shield her uncovering face from the beams, but it did nothing. Rem pressed her hands against the face and and tried to nullify the pain, but as soon as she did, her gloved hands slipped right under her skin. Now overcome by a new sense of panic, she tried to pull her hands away from her face, but it was no use. Her hands had melted into her head, appearing as if she had always been structured like this. She tried to walk away, but her legs gave way, falling to the floor. I watched it in horror as the MTF agent melted into her clothes. The room filled with pungent stench of iron blood pulled onto on the floor amongst the guts and pus. The mass that was her colleague twitched and writhed onto the floor. Hissing sounds could be heard as her body seemed to boil. Bubbles of air floated to the top and popped. Meanwhile, the screaming soon trailed off and instead seemed to melt into groans and moans. Hi, Perkang screamed and triggered an emergency alarm on the terminal. With the alarm initiated, the door slammed shut, leaving the only light visible to be fluorescent lights that hung above. Even now, being isolated from the outside world, Rem could continue to melt. Hi could no longer find her face. It had sunk below the flesh, and yet it spoke. There you are. I was so worried about you. Come over here and into the light. It, it's such a wonderful day today. That's not a, there's not a cloud in the sky. Rem's eyes had, had resurfaced, thrusting at ground level. Her deep violet eyes were unmistakable. It stared up at High and blinked. High felt her heart drop. This thing that stood in Rem's place did not sound like Rem. It didn't, even her speech patterns. Come on, dear. We are no longer need to hide our true selves. We can f be together and be a family.
Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they only had microphones and five-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dry food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the f first five days. Subjects hardly complained, having been promised that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversation took on a dark aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones in one-way mirror portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the, the other subjects in captivity, with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was the effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly, yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but, the, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives rejected to it, or reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the, the glass portholes. The screaming really promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working since they thought it was it was impossible that no sound could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a heavy level of str strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used an intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you or your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military for forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed with the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and the soldiers were sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. 
the food rations past day five have not been so much as touched. There are chunks of meat from dead test subjects' thighs and chests stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was act actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inf inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs show the ribcage of all four tests such as have had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The, di the digestive tract of all four could be seen be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that had, that they ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber or remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in, in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his area ripped off and an artery in his leg sever severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count the ones that co committed auto homicide in the weeks following the incident. In a struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured, and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with m more than ten times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When hearts was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point where there was more air in his vascular system than blood, even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach, and repeating the word, MORE, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility, the two with intact focal cords continuously begging for the gas demanded to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing, preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought ferociously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four-inch wide weather strap on, on one wrist, even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding the wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under. In an instant, his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of, of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones and in a struggle did not be subdued most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them the second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming his focal course destroyed he was unable to beg or object to surgery and he was he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him he shook his he said yes when someone suggested reluctantly they tried the surgery without anesthetic and did not react to either six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. 
surgeon reciting stated repeatedly that it should be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with their paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the intending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in the abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. Researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber, awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of the military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of the project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer and ex-KGB instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but they were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for a long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three of them were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his his head hit the pillow. His brain waves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brain waves showed the same flat lines as one who just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, and then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed the gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed, as, as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I, w I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at the mo every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal heaven where we cannot th tread. The researcher paused then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly croaked out. So nearly free. Some of you may have heard that this Disney Corporation 
is responsible for at least one real live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew $30 million on this place. Yes, $30 million. Then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the Shadow Waters. And there was even a blame cast on the workers saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of the story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because of foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt the, those reasons are legitimate. Why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mogili's place, palace, near the beachside city of Emerald Isle, Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mogili's palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guess it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character of Mogli, then you might better remember the story, The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli was, is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened by other animals. Mowgli's pl palace was a co controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed amendment domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned, with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was a concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney Co. actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. Then they showed a concept art in gigantic Indian palace surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in lion cloths and tribal gear. Well, suffice to say, everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and lion cloths not only in the center of relatively wealth area, but also somewhat a xenophobic area of southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it o over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the lane was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about, about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but... Some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came to play, and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounding communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irrit tourists. Then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down, and nobody knew what the hell to think. But they were pretty happy about it. Disney loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give the place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so really, I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. 
then I read this article from someone who had explored Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy shit he found there. Stuff just left behind, things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by disgruntled former employees who had lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's palace. Plus, there are rumors that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that this blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace. Take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there's anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there, because honestly, it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the palace resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made my mention of the place that had been succumbed cleaned. Even older, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about that place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about that place. It, though, that, that was to be expected since they all had swung Disney's way. They wouldn't be out there lo loading their embarrassment, you know. Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results. Basically, for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort. Rather... Their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find a place. All I had to go on was an old as hell map I received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World. And I guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I only remembered it months into my research. And even then, it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had showed it, shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years, or old residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, for what I find Mowgli's. The dr drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth, tropical, tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area mixed with native species of flora that actually belonged there and, and had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side look like they must have been cut from giant sequo sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal with some random scrap with hand-painted letters scrawled in the back in black, abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not to drive. So grabbing my digital camera and the map, whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the place were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood unintended and ragged among piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood at, in their own stinking, bud-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos as carefully planted rows of 
perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting wood and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris, chopped up past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of country yard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave toward no one, staring into empty space with a silly toothy grin as bird shit covered whole swaths of its fur and vines has snarled its platform. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint had peeled and chipped away. The front doors were, weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or, or the grepping mall where they had been, someone had once again painted, Abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I saw inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums, but no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fake trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat a of a machine gun. I checked the floor pan plan and headed all to all the locations that might seemed in any way interesting. The kitchen, as well you imagine, an industrial food prep area with all appliances and space. No expenses spread. Every glass surface was broken. Every door knocked off its hinges. Every metal surface kicked and dented. The entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat, and I stood inside for a moment. I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it must have been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it to my fist then carefully letting go, but within seconds it started to swing once more. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place. Just like treasure, the Treasure Island Resort, someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and sinks all dripped, leaked, or, or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have shut the water off long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have time to look through them all. A few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there were actually a television or radio in one room as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though, it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in a silence, or just another case of the sound flowing water playing tricks on my mind. This is what it sounded like. I, I don't believe it. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Your father told you. I know, I know that sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced, why I thought there might have been something running in that room, or worse. Some vagrants who had holed up in there and probably would have knifed me. 
At the front doors of the palace again, I feared I hadn't found anything of note and have washed the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed. Something that would have given me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There was a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 feet long, coiled up and, and stunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the arena uh, area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting till light fell onto the object in the perfect way for our photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo. Then I stood on my tones and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the details of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked at, looking, looked directly into my eyes, turned and slithered off the pedestal across the grass and into the trees, all 80 feet of it. Its head long disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the stunning spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds right there on my four-pan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I've read about the sharks at Treasure Isle. And I should have known they've done this. I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been back toward the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances. I backed my way into the building. It took a few deep breaths and slapped to my own face to get myself right in the head after that. I looked for a place to sit down and my legs were feeling like a bit like jelly at this point. Of course there was no place for to sit down unless I wanted to recline in the broken glass and dead leaf carpet or hole myself on a desk of unquestionably great reliability. I had, I had seen some stairs near the palace lobby and decided to go and have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be rel relatively clean, save for a starting accumulation of dust. I pull a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the Abandoned by Disney motto I had been accustomed to. I placed a wedge on the stairs and sat on it, to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level, using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock, a sign on the door, a real sign, red. Mascots only. Thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would have definitely had some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wannably steal. I had come to the palace essentially, agreeing with myself that it had been okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually, that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock ha ha was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me, and I was able to be bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall. Something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at that time. The mascot's only area was star startling and very welcomed change from the rest of the building that scene. For one, every second of or a third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were definitely taking their toll. 
Tables had notepads and pens. There were clocks, even a punch-in clock on a wall com with complete with filled-out time cards. Chairs were scattered around, and there was even a small break room with an old static-filled television and long-rotted-out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalypse movies where everything is left in a state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of Mascot's only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over, paper scattered, and almost melded with the damp floor. And a large carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the large, rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything would disintegrated into mush when I applied even the least amount of force. And clothing items hanged on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dark, suffocating depths of the place. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words, Character Prep 1. Then sighed on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was where... That was when there was a slight popping sound, and the door creaked open slowly. Inside the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch in the wall by the door, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. A row of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to keep getting brighter until all the bulbs exploded. But just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly as I pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers, hung from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of flying cloths and native clothes on hangers towards the back. What I found odd and what I wanted to photograph right away was a Mickey Mouse costume at the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was lying on its back in the center of the floor, like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even odder, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was a like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should be white, and white where he should be black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting, though that I actually put off photographing a thing until last. I took a picture of the costume that's hanging on the walls, upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show an entire row. A frozen, putrid cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot, just one of the bed ragged characters' heads on a slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of wide eyed, moldering head, a loud clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down my feet, and between my shoes was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot's head and scattered into pieces at my f my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, you know. I had to. For any number of reason, that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. 
I need proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind right from the start that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, the photo negative opposite Mickey, in the middle of the floor started to get up. First sitting up, then climbing to its feet, the Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me, as I mumbled, No. Over and over and over. With shaking hands, I violently flash thrashing heart and legs had once again turned jelly i managed to lift the camera and aim aim it at the opposite creature now quietly sizing me up the digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing it was a perfect silhouette of the mickey mouse costume as the camera show moved in my unsteady hands the dead pixel spread, marrying the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then the camera died, went black and quiet and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. Hey, it said in a hush, perverted but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Want to see my head come off? It started to pull its, at its own head working its clumsy glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing impatient movements similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaws as it worked its digits around its neck so much blood so much thick chunky yellow blood i turned away as i heard the sickening tearing of cloth and flesh I only cared about getting away Above the doorway, out of this room, I saw the final message clawed into the middle with bone or fingernails. Abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out, out of the camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, fled for my sanity, if not even my very life. I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. They didn't want anything like that getting out. I first met a person with Mary E. in the summer of 2007. I had arranged with her husband of 15 years, Terrence, to see her for an interview. Mary had initially agreed, since I was not a newsman, but rather an amateur writing gathering if information for a few early college assignments and if all went according to plan some pieces of fiction we scheduled the interview for for a particular weekend when i was in chicago on unrelated business but at the last moment mary changed her mind and locked herself in the couple's bedroom refusing to meet with me for half an hour, I sat with Terrence as we camped outside the bedroom door. I listened in taking notes while he attempted fruitlessly to calm his wife. The things Mary said had made little sense but fit with the pattern I was expecting, though I could not see her. I could tell from her voice that she was crying, and more often than not, her objections to speaking with me centered around an incoherent diatribe on her dreams, her nightmares. Terrence apologized profusely when we ceased to exercise and I did my best to take it in stride. Recall that I wasn't a reporter in search of a story, but merely a curious young man in search of information. Besides, I thought at the time I could perhaps find another Similar case if I put my mind and resources and my mind resources to it. Stop cutting me off, Discord. Sorry about that. Mary E was a sysop for all Chicago based bulletin board systems in 1992 when she first encountered Smile.jpg. And her life changed forever. She and Terrence had been married for only 
for only five months. Mary was one of the estimated 400 people who saw the image when it was posted as a hyperlink on the BBS, though she was the only one who had spoken openly about the experience. The rest have remained anomalous, or are perhaps dead. In 2005, when I was only in 10th grade, Smile.jpg was first brought to my attention by my burgoing interest in the web-based phenomena. Mary was most often cited victim of what is sometimes referred to, to as Smile.dog. The being Smile.jpg is reputed to display. Try this. What caught my interest was a sheer lack of information, usually to the point that people don't believe it even exists, other than as a rumor or hoax. It is unique because, though the entire phenomenon centers on a picture file, that file is nowhere to be found on the internet. Certainly, many photo manipulated Smilarkla littered the web showing up the most frequency on sites such as the image for 4chan, particularly the slash x slash dash focus paranormal subboard. It is suspected these are fakes because they do not have the effect the true smile.jpg is believed to have, namely sudden onset temporal lobe epilepsy and acute anxiety. This Reported reaction in a viewer is one of the reasons the phantom like smile dog that JPEG is regarded in such disdain, since it, it is pa patiently absurd. Though, depending on whom you ask, their reluctance to n acknowledge smile dot JPEG's existence might be just as much out of fear as it is out of disbelief. Neither smile dot JPEG nor smile.dog is mentioned anywhere on Wikipedia, though the website features articles as such other, perhaps more scandalous shock sites as hello.jpg, or can't say that, and I mean, sorry, and any attempt to create or page pertaining to smile.jpg is similarly deleted by any of the encyclopedia's many admins. Encounters with Smile.jpg are the stuff of internet legend. Mary East, Mary East story is not unique. There are unverified rumors of Smile.jpg showing up in the earliest days of un of Usenet, and even one persistent tale that in 2002 a hacker flooded the forums of humor and satire website. Something awful with a deluge of Smile.jpg dog pictures, rendering almost half the forum's users at the time epileptic. It is also said that the mid to late 90s that Smile.jpg circulated on Usenet as an attachment of a chain email with the subject line, Smile, God loves you. Yet despite the huge exposure, these stunts would generate there are very few people who admit to have experienced any of them, and no trace of the file or any link has ever been discovered. Those who claim to have seen Smile.jpg often weakly joke that they have, were far too busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. However, all alleged victims offer the same description of the photo. A dog-like creature, illuminated by a flash of the camera, sits in a dim room. The only background detail that is visible being a human hand extending from the darkness near the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, but is usually described as beckoning. Of course, no attention is given to the dog. The muzzle of the beast is reputedly split in a wide grin, revealing two rows of very white teeth. Very straight, very sharp, very human-looking teeth. 
This, of course, not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eye during the time they are, in reality, having epileptic fits. These fits are reported to continue indeterminately, often while victims sleep, resulting in very vivid and disturbing nightmares. These may be treated with medication, though in some cases it is more effective than others. Mary E., I assumed, was not effective medication. That is why, after my visit to her apartment in 2007, I sent out feelers to several folklore the, and urban legend oriented news groups, websites, and mailing lists, hoping to find the name of a supposed victim of Smile.jpg who felt more interested in talking about his experiences. For a time, nothing happened, and at length, I forgot completely about my pursuits. Since I had begun my freshman year of college and was quite busy, Mary contacted me via email. However, near the beginning of March 2008, Dear Mr. L, I am incredibly sorry about my behavior last summer. When you came to interview me, I hope you understand that it was not it was no fault of yours, but rather my own problems that led me to act out as I did. I realized that I handled the situation more decorously. However, I hope you will forgive me. At the time, I was afraid. You see, for 15 years, I have haunted, I've been haunted by Smile.jpg. Smile.dog comes to me in my sleep every night. I know that sounds silly, but it is true. There is an ineffable quality about my dreams, my nightmares, that makes them completely unlike any real dreams I have ever had. I do not move and do not speak. I simply look ahead, and the only thing ahead of me is a scene from that horrible picture. I see the beckoning hand, and I see the smile.dog. It talks to me. It is not a dog, of course, though I am not quite sure what it really is. It tells me it will leave me alone, if only I do as it asks. All I must do, it says, is spread the word. That is how it phrases it demands, and I know exactly what it means. It wants me to show it to someone else. And I could. The week after my incident, I received the mail a millennia envelope with no return address. Inside was only a three and a half inch floppy diskette. Without having to check, I knew precisely what was on it. I thought for a long time about my options. I could show it to a stranger, a co-worker. I could even show it to Terrence as much as, as, as the idea disgusted me. And what would happen then? Well, the smile that dog kept its word, I could sleep. Yet if it lied, what would I do? And who was to say something worse would not come for me if I did as the creature asked? So I did nothing for 15 years, though I kept the diskette hidden amongst my things. Every night for 15 years, smile that dog has come to me in my sleep and demanded that I spread the word. For 15 years I have stood strong, though there have been hard times. Many of my fellow victims on the BBS board when I first encountered smile.jpg stopped posting. I heard some of them committed auto-homicide. Others remained completely silent, simply disappearing off the face of the web. They are the ones I worry about the most. I sincerely hope you will forgive me, Mr. L. The last summer when you contacted me and my husband about the, an interview, I was near the breaking point. I decided I was going to give you the floppy diskette. I did not care if smiled that dog was lying or not. I wanted it to end. You are a stranger, someone I had no connection with, and I thought I would feel s not feel sorrow when you took the diskette as part of your research and sealed your fate. Before you arrived, I realized what I was doing. I was plotting to ruin your life. I could not stand the thought, and in fact, I still cannot. I am ashamed, Mr. L, and I hope that, that this warning will dissuade you from further investigation of Smile.jpg. You may in time encounter someone who is... If I'm not weaker than I, then whom will more depraved? Someone who will not hesitate to follow Smile.dog's orders. Stop while you're still whole. Sincerely, Mary E. Terrence contacted me later that month with the news that his wife had killed, uh, had 
on a homicide. While cleaning up the various things she left behind, closing email accounts and a like and tapping the, upon the above message, he was a man in shambles. He wept as he told me to listen to his wife ad, wife's advice. He found the skit he revealed and burned it until it was nothing but a stinking pile of blackened plastic. The part that most disturbed him, however, was how the skit had hissed as it melted. Like some sort of animal, he said. I will admit that I was uncertain about how to respond to this. At first, I thought perhaps it was a joke, with a couple politically playing with the situation in order to get a rise out of me. A quick check of several Chicago newspapers, online obituaries, however, proved that Mary E. was indeed dead. There was, of course, no mention of auto homicide in the article. I decided that for a time at least, I would not further pursue the subject of smell that JPEG, especially since I had finals coming up at the end of May. But the word world ha has odd ways of testing us. Almost a full year after I returned from my disastrous interview with Mary E, I received another email. Subject Smile. Hello. I found your email address through a mailing list. Your profile said you are interested in a smile dog. I have saw it, and it is not as bad as everyone says. I have sent it to you here, just spreading the word. Smiley face. The final line chilled me to the bone. According to my email client, there was one file attachment called naturally smile.jpg. I considered downloading it for some time. It was most likely a fake. I imagine and even if it wasn't, I I was never wholly convinced of Smile.jpg's peculiar powers. Mary E.'s account had shaken me, yes, but she was probably mentally unbalanced anyway. After all, how could a simple image do what Smile.jpg was said to accomplish? What sort of creature was it that could break one's mind with only the power of the eye? And as such things were patiently absurd, then why did the legend exist at all? If down if the, if I downloaded the image, if I looked at it, and if Mary turned out to be correct, if Smile Dot Dog came to me in my dreams, demanding I spread the word, what would I do? Would I live my life as Mary had, fighting against the urge to give in till I died? Or would I simply spread the word, eager to be put to rest? And if I could the latter route, how could I do it? Whom would I burden in, tr in turn? I went through my earlier intention to write a short article about Smile Dog. I decided I could attach it as evidence, and anyone who read the article, anyone who took interest, would be affected. And even assuming the Smile Dog JPEG attached to the email was genuine, would I be capricious enough to, to save myself in that matter? Could I spread the word? Yes. Yes, I could. <laughs> in the cold night looking towards the sky it was a regular it was a regularly cold and cloudy night which would have been fine if we weren't on a field trip the teachers tried to say nonsense like the stars being bright far from the city lights but how could they tell with the clouds covering everything my class was in the fourth grade field trip to experience the gold rush it sounded cool at the time but it was before I realized there'd be no phone chargers, no computers, no heaters. How were we supposed to go from apartments with heating? This cold middle of nowhere nonsense. These old people have no idea what they're talking about. Saying they would in, we they would enjoy experiencing the way miners did during the gold rush. I rolled my eyes a bit at the thought. This is stupid. My voice was caught quiet in the muttering. There was no point in risking a teacher, one of the parents that came hearing. They probably wouldn't appreciate another kid complaining. Food was being cooked over a big campfire while one kid's grandpa was trying to tell some old stupid stories. He was currently on the tail of something called the jackalopes, but 
Before that, he talked about ghosts of miners, dogs, some headless horsemen, nonsense with some ranger. The old man was smiling at the fire towards the other kids. Some looking interested, but most looked tired or bored. You can probably guess which camp I was in. The jackalope is a creature of the Wild West. It's antelope and it's an antelope and rabbit mixed together. Looks like rabbit as big as a horse, but with fierce deer antlers. Fast as lightning and will attack head on if it thinks you're after it. But be careful, they're intelligent and wary. The only thing that will stop an attack is whiskey. So none of you kids start nothing. We've got none of that here, so you'd be done for. The old man looked serious. Man, how did he tell those stupid old people stories without even laughing about how ridiculous they sounded? At least I wasn't the only one who thought that. A few of the others who were around the fire started to laugh. One of the girls even started speaking loudly. There's n there's no way things like that exist. If they did, I'd just kill all of them with rocks. That's so stupid. It's buddies with antlers. You really expect us to be scared? That was pretty normal behavior for kids who looked like they heard more than enough of share of, of random fairy tales of a of random fairy tales to stuff a closet with. However, it was like she triggered something. Multiple voices in the dark started to repeat. You really expect us to be scared? Out in the sandy desert, suddenly no one was laughing anymore. The rabbit leapt up from the dark. It landed next to the fire. It looked like a normal big jackrabbit up with antlers? Is this a... One boy started to say before the creature jumped towards a kid who spoke last. Before I even knew what was going on, my stomach was impaled by the antlers. I kid barely a piece of fruit standing up against the chef's knife. The creature pulled out their jagged antlers, eviscerating and dragging parts of the intestines out. And for some odd moment, the boy's stomach looked like it had just plopped open like a balloon. The rest of the organs gave way and ejected the remains of intestines outside his now limp body. He splayed across the sand, mounted by the things that should have definitely stayed within his body. The rabbit's nostrils flared open several times as though it wasn't done quite yet. As it then wiped the gore off its antlers across the now motionless body of the victim. Then began to move towards the next person. Run! Someone screamed. I didn't move. They, grow, they got aggressive easily, right? There had been a lot of voices out there. I didn't want to end up like that kid. I kept still. Their kids started screaming and running. The ones I'd been sitting by the fire couldn't get up fast enough. The teachers and parents were trying to say something about keeping calm, but whatever they were saying wasn't finished. I didn't, I didn't look up from the ground to see if anyone was still by the fire. A, ja a rabbit jumped into the, my line of sight, so I closed my eyes. They weren't cowards, right? Maybe this would work. That's when I realized the old guy had been speaking still. How long had he been? He was just repeating the same thing over and over in a calm voice. They won't, they won't attack you close. Your eyes talk um, and stay still. Maybe he was, maybe he, we had listened to him. <clears throat> maybe if we had listened in the first place, none of this would have happened. Let's admit this. I was crying at this point. Convinced. Even after everything went quiet, I didn't open my eyes. Getting more and more tired wasn't convincing enough either. 
some point I fell asleep, though. Woke up feeling like everything had all been some big nightmare. But for some reason, it felt like I was sitting, like in that horrible dark dream. When I opened my eyes, I saw a jackalope sleeping in my lap. There was still a little blood on its antlers and a, the bottom of it, the paws. I escaped alive. East Side London. Also, I guess warning for British people. <laughs> East Side London, 1889. Charlie sobs into the dark. He doesn't want to be one of the abandoned boys. When Patch got stuck, Master Smith left him in there for a week until the landlord complained. They had to break uh, th- had to break the wall with a hammer to get him out. Charlie hadn't seen it, but the other apprentices apprentices said they found him curled up like he was asleep, but all stiff like. Patch didn't sweep any more after that. Charlie's knees are level with his chin. His head presses against the sweathering bricks, and the brush he was holding is wedged against the backside. Duck. Wiggling around will only make it worse, so he stays still, thinking how to get out. Little John, uh, little Johnny got stuck once, and he said you just had to stuck, uh, s- yeah, suck in your belly real small and push off with your feet. But Johnny isn't called little for nothing, and besides, he was only five and a half when it happened. It usually happens to older boys who get stuck, like Charlie. And most of the time, in a stuck chimney sweep, is a dead chimney sweep. His thighs are already cramping, his left arm is free, so he uses it to push down one knee, trying to unfold his leg. It won't budge. His right arm is still pinned above his head, right where it was when he dropped the brush. Somehow it landed behind him, and the bristles poked into his back painfully. He reaches upward, feeling for a loose brick to pull himself up with. The chimney is so dark he can't tell the difference if his eyes are open or closed. His fingers so s- finger, uh, fingers brush a soft clump of soot. It falls onto his face, already mid-breath. He pulls some into his lungs, and the coughing fit that follows reverberates up and down the shaft. The efforts... The effort leaves him grasping for air. What are... What are ye doing up there? Fast or I'll burn ye. Burn your backside raw, Mr. Smith hollers from below. Help, Charlie chokes out, but a gloom dampens his words to a whisper. Astrid smoke stings his uh, his nostrils, and a heat licks his bare feet. Fire is meant to make him work faster, but since he can't move, it does all it does is scorch scorch the bricks around him. His neck is already blistering from the from being pressed against the chimney shaft behind. He squirms in in panic and only gets himself wedged deeper. Help, he screams. I'm stuck, Master Smith. I'm stuck, sir. Please help. The echoes sound like a hundred ghosts are with him inside the chimney. The thought The thought makes Charlie's stomach curn. What if he isn't the first sweep to get stuck in there? It's so dark he would never see a ghost coming. It takes him a minute to notice the bricks have cooled. Stuck are ye, Master Smith shouts. Yes, sir, please send help, Charlie shouts back. There's no reply at first. In his mind, Charlie sees the master comp- uh, contemplating a fingertip running through his soot-stained beard as he leans on his bundle of sweet brushes, thinking about how how much he'd have to pay to train another chimney sweep. Try and get out, the master says. I can't. I'm really stuck. Sir, can you please- uh, can someone pull me out? You out of your mind? Can't risk losing another one, and you're not even my best sweep. Try to get out, boy. Cramps and coughing forgotten. Every inch of Charlie's skin prickles with fear. He doesn't want to be one of the abandoned boys. Please, sir. Anybody. Little John, he'll help me. He will, sir. Please, Charlie cries. But the master is already gone. 
tears run stark lines through the soot on his face, not dribbles out of his nose on into the back of his mouth until until he spits it down the shaft. He wipes his face with his free hand, but it only gets gritty specks into his eyes. Blinking really fast just makes it worse. Charlie cries until he, he's sure all the water in his body is gone. His tongue is dry and his throat makes a rough scratching sound whenever he swallows. Whatever came out of his nose was all dried. Was had has dried all crusty like it pinches his skin whenever he sniff sniffs which is often his legs are numb the bristles in his back feel sharper and his toes feel like hot pins are poking them the cramps have spread to pin uh, who is pinned right arm and the back of his neck and uh it was evening it was evening when he first uh, scrambled up the chimney. Master Smith said it would be a quick job before Christmas supper. Now, Tommy rumbling. Charlie is sure he missed all, all of the fun. Christmas is the only day of the year. Uh, coster mongers will give out apples and oranges for free. Coral, car, carol singers roam the street, and for once, everyone is smiling. He stands, strains his ears, hoping to catch a stray note of music or any hint of the world outside. All he, he can hear is his heartbeat and ragged breaths keeping him alive. But how much longer? He needs food and some water, and he needs to piss. Help, he screams once, twice, a dozen more uh, times more. The chimney shaft mag magnifies his voice and his fears with it. The echoes are louder now, as if the ghosts are closing in and the bricks are freezing cold. He thrashes about, free and scrambling against the walls, but he is no longer, he is no less stuck than before. The walls close in around him, suffocating. A warm heaviness fills his trousers, spreading to wet his belly and drip down from his toes. Shame smothers Charlie even worse than the soot. If he ever gets out, the others will never forget he pissed himself. Somehow it's worse than the idea of dying here. Charlie sobs again as he drifts away. He's like a patch. He is one of the abandoned boys. O oh, town of Bolemith, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the, sil the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets... Shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met of in the, li the night. Charlie wakes to pain, but he blinks, confused. It is not the pain he expects. He is still stuck, unable to move ev anything except his left arm. But the cramps throughout his body have fade away, faded away to numbness. The brush still spoke, still pokes him from behind. The pain that woke him is from his head. Something hard had fallen from the shaft above, bouncing off his head before nest nestling neatly on his knees. He feels for it in the darkness. His fingers brush something firm and rubbery. When he lifts it to his nose, his stomach growls in response. Red, a whoosh, echoes from above like a breath of air. He has followed followed by a dull sliding sound. The thing sounds big, but expecting it this time, Charlie duck, sticks his, out his arms to block its path. He sends, he sets it in between his knees and his chin, feeling all over the shape. A bottle. Help, he screams, tilting his head back. You up there, get, help me get out. The only, only silence responds, darker than soot. He calls up the shaft again and again, no response. A sob escapes through dry lips as he looks back to the heavy package on his knees. The cloth uh, wrapped around the side of outside is thick and all soft like. It might be wool. He's seen it before, worn by fancy rich people. Charlie's first thought is that he's not the biggest apprentice 
or the oldest or even the best is one so one of the others bound is bound to take it from him then he remembers he's abandoned he pulls the cloth across to cover himself it sits awkwardly but warms him all the same the bottle is big and heavy and has a cork in the top charlie rips it out with his teeth sniffs the liquid at all inside it has no smell at all without a second thought he gulps down so much water that the bottle isn't heavy anymore worried he shakes it but the sluicing sound makes him feel better the bread follows gobbled up in seconds despite himself he feels better his body begins to hurt again as if it now has the energy to remain to remind him that he's stuck the weight of the bottle on his knees is a comfort a comfort he waits for something else to fall down the shaft hours pass he stays awake as long as he can but knowing he'll fall asleep eventually he folds his left arm over his head for protection time and space losing their meaning since neither of them seem to change the next time bread arrives from above charlie is awake and waiting he plucks out it out of the air and wolfs it down with a less with the last of the water a second regret comes and goes then to his surprise another chunk of bread lands on his knees as he chews charlie tries moving again still stuck Worry gnaws at him. How long can someone live all squished like? What if food makes him fat and even more stuck? He shudders. What if the ghosts are sending food to fatten him up for their supper? He doesn't scream for help again. Over what must be days, food and water come through the shaft three more times, but Charlie's hunger overcomes his fear. He scoffs bread and chugs the water until his tummy rumbles again, this time for another reason. He whimpers in shame, unable to hold his night soil anymore. It smears into his trouser, and watery parts trickle down his ankles. The smell has him wrinkling his nose in disgust. The pain in his limbs are unbearable now, a deep ache that makes him weak all over. He bows his head, tears falling again, as he thinks about living the rest of his life in his own muck. When they find his body... The other apprentices will laugh and point, saying Charlie pissed and soiled himself in tune of ring of wing, ring of ring of roses. Master Smith will shake his head, muttering that he was good for nothing anyway. He will find another chimney sweep. Charlie will be forgotten, and that'll be that abandoned. A soft thud wakes Charlie, so soft that he thinks it might be his own heartbeat at first. But it's not inside of his chest. It's coming from somewhere else, all muffled like thud. It's louder. He's awake now, looking about in panic. Even though there's nothing to see, thud. Another chim. Uh, the entire tim- uh, chimney shakes. He cries out in fear. The fear turns to anguish when the half full bottle of water topples over before he can grab it. Since he hasn't replaced the cork, all the water pours onto his already sodden trousers. Sodden trousers. Thud. Charlie buries his fingers in his ear. Terrified, he shakes his head all over. When he imagined the ghosts coming from him, he thought they would be all quiet, like sneaking through the dark. He never thought that they would break the whole chimney down and rip him to pieces. Thud. The next one is even louder. Fine powder spills from the walls, left trickling his nose. Tickling his nose, he wriggles around, and something sharp bites into his back. Thud. Something cracks. He shuts his eyes tight and waits for the pain. Which bone did they break? Which part of them? Him are they going to eat first? Thud. He screams and screams and screams and screams. Thud, thud, thud. The breaks, uh, the bricks to his left shatter, and all Charlie sees is a blinding light. YouTube is a remembered piece of history. Back then in 2006, not much was known and all that you can see in a community were just people uploading cat videos. But one particular user has caused enough controversy to be called the channel that had, po- that had posted a ton of gore videos and blood videos that the user was recently removed for playing with the TOS. 
but it can still be accessed. One day, a person on YouTube has posted their experience with the channel from the defunct blogging website. I worked for YouTube during 2006. I was a busy worker and I recently uploaded videos here. But I didn't know that some of the YouTube moderators suspended a YouTube account. I told them what it was, but they wouldn't want me to. I was wondering why I wasn't allowed to go on that page, rather than what it was. But just then, one of the moderators handed me a piece of paper with a writing on it. It was a link. He pleaded me not to ask about the secret username ever again. The link was a YouTube user link. It said www.youtube.com slash 666. I went home after work and typed it in on my computer. I found out that the account was suspended, so it's no worry. Then I refreshed the page several times. Some things changed. All the video tags turned into letters, X666, and every single text on the screen said 666. I thought someone was hacking my computer, but I denied it and then refreshed it. Just then, a channel popped up. It was 666 channel. I looked at some of the videos. Most of them are crazy. One video contained four babies twisting their head. Another video showed swirling graphics. I decided to get off the video and went to another one, but a blank pop-up was shown. I clicked the blank button and it took me to another video by 666. The video was shown a, a woman drowning in a blood pool and discussing things happening. I thought it was disgusting, so I decided to pause the video. It didn't let me, because it wasn't responding. I decided then to close Internet Explorer. It wouldn't budge. I also tried another video too, but it didn't work either. I thought there was no way out until I thought, Shut down button. Horse. I decided to shut down my computer so that the virus would, wouldn't get through my computer again. But the button wouldn't work. Shut down buttons respond all the time. I knew that I was hacked. All hope was lost. I couldn't get out of the explore. And the video just kept going on and on. And there was nothing to stop me. The girl in the video kept staring at me. Looking at me with random sounds and, and beatings playing. Just then, the woman from the video's hand popped out of the video and crashed my Internet Explorer. After a few days, I recently, I was recently fired after going through the horrid experience within 666 channel. That's when I thought of this. Could this actually have been made by the devil? Was it a joke to scare YouTubers? Either way, this myth was very mysterious. I haven't gone through s sleep after watching those videos. I wonder who made them. This blog spot was, was then defunct after two days when the blog was done. When anyone enters the blog, a message will pop up saying, Removed by admin. Error code 666. The blogger was sent to, has sent to me his experience by mail, asked me to post this on this website. He also left a note. Never go, nor refresh username 666. Once you have finished, it will never stop. It won't come out. I hope no one has ever tried this.
This is a document called The Expedition. Ooh. Log 201. Schedule check-in. We have arrived at the study site. Local specimens seem to be thriving, despite the high levels of intracommunal conflict. These curious creatures are docile, for the most part, but turn incredibly violent when startled or provoked. We have trained our field scientists in the best strategies to collect data without risking provocation. The first mission squad has been sent out a couple days ago. The reports have been encouraging so far, despite how hostile the natural environment is to our bodies. The weather is unrelenting, and the terrain unforgiving. It's frankly a miracle that there's so much of this species here. Wonders never cease in the world of science. Signing out. Log 205. Schedule check-in. The first mission squad has returned. All was well until it came time to depart. We were careless and were spotted by one of the local specimens, who somehow alerted all of the others to our presence. We cannot discount the possibility that they may, in fact, be some sort of hive mind. However, this means their means of defense and attack are rudimentary on a larger scale. They cannot touch our base. We will have to be more careful with future missions. It seems they do not take kindly to knowledge of our true appearance. Individually, our scientists will be vulnerable to the native species' hostility. They will be waiting before being sent out again, to allow the specimens to resume their routines and forget us. In the meantime, we will take what we have learned and apply it in new ways to both improve our safety and our data collection technique. Signing out. Log 280. Schedule check-in. Enough generations of the local specimens have passed that it is now safe to resume our field studies. We feel much more confident this time around, and we have made plans to take one of the bodies of the specimens to observe. Hopefully, we can keep them alive, but every scientist knows how that goes, especially with new species. It doesn't seem to matter either way, however, given how many of them there are. We simply need to avoid drawing the attention of the rest of this presumed hive mind. Despite extensive distance observation from base, the readings have been inconclusive on the matter of how interconnected they really are. It's truly fascinating, and a large part of the reason why we've endeavored to obtain one of them for observation. 
These specimens seem to thrive very well in their current atmospheric conditions, as well as mainly protein-based diet. Curious, as one of our scientists claimed they have mostly flat teeth akin to herbivores. They must be omnivores. I digress. We have created an observation chamber for the specimen with the atmosphere replicated and a diet prepared for their arrival, as they are often seen eating after traveling. Hopefully our team can capture one, alive. Signing out. Log 285. Schedule check-in. The field team has returned. They managed to capture a specimen, but regrettably it perished during a quick trek back to base. Clearly, they need the same living conditions as their natural area while they travel outside of it. We suspect atmospheric pressure in tandem with composition may also play a role, as its extremities swelled and bulged in ways uncommon with their, while in their natural habitat. We will have to come up with some sort of way to protect these specimens while we remove them from, for study, as despite how inconsequential it is for one to perish when there are so many, we'd rather avoid it when possible, like any good scientist would do. Some scientists care not for the well-being of their specimens at all, and will go to any length to extrapolate any information they desire. Not us. We will be better. And it's why our expedition was funded, after all. To prove without a doubt to the whole community that scientific discovery can be moral and relatively painless for all involved. While we are, while we are working on a solution to our current obstacle, we will be studying the poor corpse of the specimen. The species seems to mourn and care for their dead a great deal, much like some of the animals back home. So we will be returning the specimen to the location we first found them as soon as we're done. Signing out. Log 293. Schedule check-in. We have returned the body, and though we were not spotted, it seems to have caused a great deal of distress to the specimen's community. Yet again, news has traveled fast between members of the species, leading some of our scientists to become absolutely convinced they are a hive mind. But one must wonder, why such a delayed reaction if so? Surely, they must have felt the life of the poor thing snuff out when it first happened. Perhaps they did, but chose not to worry. Perhaps the appearance of the body is what frightened them, not what happened to it. We should consider whether, if this situation should happen again, as I'm sure it will, what the best course of action would be. Clearly, following the customs of the species has off-put them. We may have simply done it wrong. If that is the case, it might be better to hold on to any future corpses as so, so as to not alarm the species with an increase in the appearances of their members' bodies. On another note, we have almost finished constructing a better means of transportation for the next captured specimen. With any luck, we will be able to study the next one alive and up close, then return them home where they belong. Signing out. Log 313. Schedule check-in. We have obtained and have been keeping a live specimen. It seems their socio-emotional needs are much higher than we assumed which is in line with our hive mind theory. However, it could also be that they just happen to be a very social species. It calls out and cries most of the time, before falling quiet for about 6 to 12 hours of self-induced sleep-like stasis. There seems to be a pattern to its calls, which is truly gratifying. I fought the board for months to bring linguistic specialists with us, just in case the species we find has a fully developed language. This deepens the mystery. After all, what use does a hive mind have for a fully developed language? The species has begun to calm around our presence, and I believe this may be indicative that they, are, that they no longer see us as enemies, but as potential allies. I would love for this to be the case. Imagine an allyship with such a unique and creative species in such a remote and lifeless location. We have high hopes going forward, and with any luck, We'll soon be able to return the specimen home once we have enough data. Signing out. Log 315. Schedule check-in. Once again, we have severely misjudged the species of this specimen. 
Despite progress in establishing communication and offering regular sustenance and optimal environmental conditions, the specimens still saw us as their enemy all this time. They had tricked us into believing all was well, then enacted their plan. They assaulted one of the linguists during their communication session, damaging their hazard suit, and made a break to escape their enclosure. We tried to warn them that they would not survive outside of it to prevent them from hurting themselves, but they were quick and we could not stop them in time. Their body failed much in the same way as the last specimen we tried to collect. Such a shame, really, is becoming increasingly clear how unique and clever each of member of the species is, despite their uncanny ability to simultaneously communicate with others of the species, making each death a stinging and tragic loss of life. As their living conditions were satisfactory, we will need to investigate and study the psychology of the species more, so that this can be avoided in the future. As for what we did with the body, we did not return it to its species this time, Instead, we opted to imitate their burial rituals and lay the corpse to rest in the ground of their natural habitat. As for the linguists, they are perfectly fine. Their suit only sustained minor damage, and they were able to leave the enclosure in time to spare their life. In any case, we have a lot of work ahead of us now, more than we ever expected. Signing out. Log 402. Schedule check-in. After intensive field study to make sense of their social rules and psychology, we have determined that our next sample from this species should be a biologically connected unit, or family. This species seems to be very attached to those they are related to, as, generally speaking, they spend the most time around these individuals. I hate to let emotions and deadlines affect the quality of our work, but we really need this next sample to be worthwhile. The board is breathing down our necks, and I don't know how much more time and funding they're willing to give. We are the bright future of our field. We cannot fail now. Signing off. Log 421. Schedule check-in. So many things have gone wrong in such a short amount of time. I'm beginning to be of the opinion that this species is too dangerous to continue studying in close quarters, and all who plan to engage must cancel those plans. I repeat, no one should engage with this species. We have made many important findings by bringing in this family, and have finally deciphered their language, but this knowledge has only served to cement my opinion. They're stronger together, and quite smart. Somehow, they used the control panels in their enclosure to hijack the base, and sent out an announcement for all to hear. Translated, it amounted to, You cannot keep us here. We will escape and we will seek out revenge. Never come near our species again. True to their word, they managed to escape alive, and upon reconnecting with their species and relaying their experiences, the species as a whole has begun to target us with a technology that we have never seen from them before. We have left the system. I cannot stress this enough do not engage with this species. We have dubbed them Pericrosum Kuncat, but they call themselves, what was it? Ah, yes, humans. Lost episodes. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble here, so if you believe in haunted lost episode legends or enjoy living in that world, maybe this isn't the post for you. Don't get me wrong, I hate when people complain about lack of realism and entertainment. I think all kids need to believe in Santa and the Tooth Fairy for as long as possible, but this, this is different. Back in the 80s, I met this dude, Sid, who cut old vhs tapes and shit it was more of a hobby for him it was more than a hobby for him it was pretty much his entire life his parents were a bit more wealthy than i'd been blessed with so when we were teenagers and i was slaving away at scats yes scats a fast food restaurant he just hung out 
around the house cutting tapes all day, all night. Of course, as you get older, things in your past become a bit clearer, and I think he might have had some form of autism, or maybe he was a very high-functioning person, but of course I'm no expert, and I'm not saying that 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 was the case. It's just the best and quickest way I can think of to explain his personality and this obsession with cutting tapes, cutting tapes, cutting tapes, cutting tapes. It started when he was, when he saw Old Yeller as a little kid. For whatever reason, his parents let him watch that shit. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's the tale of a boy and his dog. I hope I don't have to announce the spoiler on such an old-ass movie, but in the end, the boy has to shoot his own dog because it's rabid. Sid didn't appreciate this. His dad photographed and videotaped weddings, so he showed Sid how to operate some of the machines, and Sid cut out the ending, replacing it with an earlier, happier scene, as if old Yeller just suddenly got better off-screen. He watched the tape obsessively after that, even into his early teens when I'd first met him. He'd make me watch it once just to show how he fixed it. And I could actually picture him as a little boy once. He started applauding and cheering his own faux ending. I didn't want to say I was a bad influence, but after I saw it, I, I asked if he could do that with other movies. My major interest my major interest was perhaps taking a film or two and cutting into some nude frames the actresses hadn't really been done. <laughs> Don't worry though, I n- I never had the guts to actually ask if he would. I just imagined how cool it would be often. Sid told me that yes, he could fix any movie he wanted. In fact, he had done it with a few others. Um he had a copy of a Ghostbusters cartoon, and I shit you not, every single ghost was completely removed. The story made no sense, there was no continuity, but he had accomplished it, and I was very impressed. I guess in the time of VHS, these things seem more magical than they do nowadays. As, as time went by, though, I encouraged Sid to edit more movies, but with different purposes. Instead of whitewashing all the scary stuff like he'd wanted to. I got him to see the light on how awesome he could make things. Somewhere out there, this chubby Star Wars nerd from our high school had all three original films flawlessly cut together with edited in effects that made George Lucas himself cry out enough meddling. (laughs) We charged him like $20 for the only copy because we were idiots. Anyway... This went on for a while before I lost most of my interest in it. It was more of a goof for me than it was for him. That's the point when I started working, started driving, started taking bases with local girls. While he just got more and more involved in cutting those tapes. I think his favorite were the cartoons. When the Simpsons came around, he went ape shit on those. Now, his edits weren't so much fixing things as just breaking them in interesting ways. Another thing that sticks out in my mind is when he recorded an episode of MASH and cut it with a glory old war flick. Halfway through this version, the camp gets bombed, soldiers invade, everyone dies. And at the end, he specifically worked in freeze frames of each cast member's face. Eyes closed. He completely reversed his interest and embraced what once terrified him. Scary endings. He seemed to love things like long, drawn-out sequences and terrifying violence. He'd maybe be quiet while they played, too. You may have heard about this mysterious fellow named Banksy who goes around creating interesting graffiti and whatnot. At one point, he went to a music store 
and replace some Paris Hilton CDs with his own fakes. Uh, Banksy has nothing on Sid. Every other week, he'd tell me about some store or a video rental place he'd snuck in some of his tapes into. He'd swap out the real ones for his versions, and then he'd start all over again by cutting the ones he had stolen. At one point, when I hadn't heard from him in a long while, I stopped by his parents' house and found him in the garage. He set out his own little movie studio there, complete with a drawing board. He was actually animating entirely new content. All at once, I was blown away by his artistic skill I'd never seen before and very concerned about when this guy was going to come out of the dark and start acting normal like me. He barely looked up from his drawings as we spoke. I asked him what any kid now in his late teens would ask. What the fuck is wrong with you? Hmm? Huh? S seriously, dude, this is some crazy shit. It's work. I'm working. My work is just as important as anyone else's. Are, are you even selling these anymore? Or are you just sneaking them into places? How, how much is all of this costing your dad? I don't care. I looked at what he was so feverishly illustrating. Is, is that a headless body dancing? Yeah. Th th that's pretty dark, man. I know. That's the point. I, I don't get it. Those tapes? I thought they were wrong. But over time, I figured out the truth. Which is? The scary stuff is right. The happy endings are the lie. He just kept drawing as I stood there. The silence was disturbing, and in that moment, I could smell the, the B.O. coming off of him. It wasn't just sweat, either. It was a mingling of that and a foul ass and piss-soaked cloth. I... <laughs> I, I hate to say it, I really do, but I gave up on him right then. It's that moment when you look at someone, someone you thought you knew, and all you can think is, holy shit, I never realized they were this far gone. It wasn't until my 30s that Sid crossed my mind again. I was perusing the internet, just aimlessly wandering the, the web. When I came across a series of urban legends about strange VHS tapes, recut movies, and lost episodes. Some of these I recognized. I watched them from Sid, or I'd actually seen him in the middle of working on them. Every disturbing scene, every unbelievable anecdote, I believed it because I had been there. Others, Spongebob cartoons, episodes of iCarly or whatever. Those shows came long after I'd made my break with Sid, but the style was all too familiar. Even the ones that didn't sound like his work seemed like they could have been broken copies or attempts at mimicking his work. He was still doing it after all these years. My God. It, it, it boggled my mind. I called up Sid's old number. Not entirely sure I'd still find him there. It rang for minutes on end. And I knew that the search was hopeless. Even if he still lived with his parents, it wasn't likely they'd all still be at the same house by now. Still... I made a point to drive out to his old place to see if he was still in that garage cutting tapes or manipulating them via computer or 
whatever he was up to or he would be up to. When I passed by the house, the unkempt lawn was overgrown with huge waist-high weeds. The dilapidated facade of the building with its peeling paint on the shutters, missing roof tiles and muck-filled gutters told me that no one had lived here for a long time. I saw a note on the door, but I couldn't read it from the road. Maybe it was something I could use to locate Sid and see if he had gotten the help I now realized I should have given him. <sighs> Pulling into the driveway, my headlights illuminated the garage door. It was windowless and vandalized and the gang tags of some traveling band of assholes. The note on the door as one might expect, spoke of a certain bank now owning this property. It noted that trespassing was heavily discouraged and that at a certain point someone would be out to make sure the house was winterized, whatever the hell that is. As I walked back to the car, defeated, something was, something was a nagging at me. See, I, I knew that Sid's parents kept a spare key under a false rock by the back stairs, basically a virtue of Sid locking us both out on several occasions. And when I found that key, a sense of cold, gnawing dread swirled in my stomach. Who would move out and leave everything in place like this the, the key was the most obvious thing, but the flower pots and lawn decorations were still there. Sid's old, rusty, rusted-out huffy bike was leaning against the house and had created thick, rusty streaks along the aluminum siding. I didn't know what I expected to find, but using the key, I entered the house. The smell was overwhelming. Not a, not a putrid smell, nothing rotten or decaying, just the smell of... I don't know if this would make any sense to you, but the, the smell of electricity. Like, like, like a burning dust on a light bulb or a, or a heater giving off a peculiar warmed metal odor. That was the least of my concerns, however, as everything I saw was just as we had left it. Everything Sid's family owned was frozen in time. The dining room table we all sat out on many occasions was dust covered and supported, an emaciated dead rat which had all but turned to dust. Television, that bulky, oversized television set we all sat around to watch Sid tapes at and laud his creativity, said where it had always been. Silently displaying a violent bombardment of black and white static. As I moved through the rooms, the sense of panic and discomfort within me only grew. Every fiber of my being was shouting, Run! Run, you fucking idiot! Still, I pressed on into Sid's bedroom. It was now empty and in disrepair. His prized action figures and blank videotapes, hundreds of videotapes, stale and water damaged. I almost wanted to call out to shout, Sid, and wait for him to appear as if nothing was out of the ordinary. I went into his parents' bedroom. There, lying in bed, 
were two motionless bodies. Gaunt, gray, half turned to dust. Just like the rat in the dining room. I could scarcely believe what I was seeing with my own eyes. Not only were there two dead bodies slowly dissipating within the confines of this once idyllic suburban household, but nobody, nobody had even checked on them. Nobody had discovered this until now. My mind raced. My heart raced. The only thing that wouldn't move were my feet, which remained glued to the spot. Sid, I thought, Sid must have done this. There was no way that the two of them would just lie down one night and simultaneously die of natural causes. Sid had said he didn't care about his parents and... and <laughs> when was the last time I had seen them? God, I, I hadn't seen them in days, maybe, maybe weeks before the last time I talked to Sid. When I finally left the room, I took out my cell phone and began dialing 911. However, as soon as I lifted it to my head, an ear-splitting shriek of interference nearly caused me to fling the object across the room. I rushed to the kitchen phone, squealing static. I tried the living room phone, just to be thorough. <sighs> static. It wasn't until I put the receiver back down that I heard it. Music. Faint, barely audible music that I hadn't noticed before. It, 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 seemed, it, it, it seemed to be some sort of repeating melody, happy and light, some flutes. It maybe maybe a whole horn section. I I followed the peppy tune to the in-house door to the garage. Pressing my ear to the door's dirty surface, I determined that the music was indeed coming from just beyond. Sid, I called out, barely managing to form the name with cold, bloodless lips. Sid, are are you are? Are, are you in there? Are you all right? I tried the door only to find it somehow locked from the other side. It was no matter since one wild kick nearly knocked the rotting wood off the hinges. Sid! I shouted out as the dust slowly cleared. Through the haze, I could only see the light of the television screen. Vibrant colors, blue, yellow, green. Soon, as I got further in, I, I, could, I could make out a cartoon playing on the screen. Then the, the silver wires running from the set itself to some dark mass. Then the dark mass took shape as my eyes adjusted to the odd lighting. It was Sid, or, or, or rather, his body, not, not dead nearly as long as his parents, seated in an old office chair. The wires from the television set led directly into his body, eventually disappearing into several old crusted over holes, his leathery flesh. Through a small, worm-eaten opening in his ribs, I could thought I could see more metal inside of him. I walked, I walked to Sid's side, holding my hand over my mouth for fear of vomiting. His face was a twisted into a hideous wide grin. His empty socket seemed almost happy, hooded with a pleased brow line. Hi there! 
I heard a jarring voice. The, the, the voice was upbeat, high pitched. It, it sounded almost like Sid, but, but, but different. Bubbly, cartoony. I, I turned to the screen. The green grass, the blue sky, the yellow flowers. And Sid, perfect caricature of him. It strolled along the infinite loop of that utopian cartoon background. It waved at me. <laughs> Sid? I whispered. Oh, oh God. Oh, God, Sid. He, um, the cartoon version of him turned his attention away from me and continued to merrily stroll across that unending cycle of the same backdrop. He passed a shrub and then passed it again and again and again and again. The same blue bird chirping happily flew through the sky in a perfect figure eight. Sid, I shook my head, unable to comprehend the scenario. I'm sorry. I. I should have never let you leave reality. <laughs> I thought about what Sid had done to his mom and dad. I thought about how the bank would come by soon and all of this would come to light. I watched Sid walk along for nearly half an hour. And then I unplugged the set. Changeling's sick joke. 12 hours. 12 fucking hours straight of driving. The sun set three hours ago, making these dirt roads even more treacherous. The tank is getting low. My eyes are heavy as hell, but is it safe to stop yet? I can feel my empty stomach cramping. My mind is starting to panic again. I glance over to the passenger seat to get a bit of my composure back. Nikki, my little angel. She's curled up in the seat, wrapped in a blanket, sleeping softly. The cut on her cheek still seems angry, but it's human. And she's still cradling that shotgun like it's a stuffed toy. Why? Why does this have to be happening? She never heard a fly in her life. And, and now she has to keep that thing close. Running for our lives like this. What kind of sick joke is this? What did we deserve? What did we do to deserve this shit? Why? I hear Nikki cry out as the car starts to swerve. Having drifted off, this startles me awake and quickly steady the wheel, stopping us from ending up in a ditch. Babe, you need to rest. Let me take the wheel, she hurriedly says, gripping my hand. Wouldn't be much point at this rate. We're running on fumes. I... I don't know. I... I don't know if we're far enough to be safe. I managed to say between yawns. We... We can't stop the car and get stranded out here in the middle of the woods. I... Nikki tries to object, but can't seem to find the words. I'm fine, babe. Just... Just keep... Just help me stay awake. And keep an eye out for... For, like, a... A place to stop? She says, pointing towards a medium-sized cabin off the side of the road. Her voice seems about as surprised the luck as I am. I can't help but feel pessimistic about this good fortune. No way is this going to turn out well. Right? Though, knowing our options, I turn to the place's driveway. An automatic light suddenly brightens the area near the garage, 
It's a two-story house with an old-fashioned log design, rustic and beautiful. There are a few larger windows on the second floor than any I see in, on the bottom. The lights are on, so we assume the owners are home. We get out of the van, grabbing our hastily packed bags, pretty much all we have left. Nikki leaves her shotgun to not scare the owners while I keep my 45 in my belt holster and a spare in my bag along with spare magazines, just in case. We quickly walk up to the front door, keeping an eye out on the woods. Nikki knocks while I keep looking around. After a moment, the door is opened by a middle-aged woman with a concerned expression on her face, no doubt due to the very late night knock at the door. Sorry to bother you, ma'am. My friend and I were taking a road trip, and we were kind of dumb and managed to run out of gas. Could you put us, or could you point us to a place where we could fill up and get some rest and eat, please? Nikki says fairly quickly, being an extrovert. I really don't know what my antisocial ass would do without her in this situation. Oh, here. The lady says in a soft, concerned voice. That's a shame. Well, we don't get many visitors, so you are more than welcome to stay the night. Come on in. I can get you girls some warm drinks and something to eat. My man can show you to the nearest gas station in the morning. She smiles warmly as she opens the door wider, gesturing us in. We can see a middle-aged man in a recliner in the front of the TV who is getting up seemingly to welcome us in as well. Nikki looks back at me with hesitancy. We're both a bit wary of such a spontaneous amount of generosity, but we don't have much choice given the situation. Thank you so much. You don't have to do this for us. I, it, it wouldn't be an inconvenience, would it? Nikki says gratefully, turning on her heel. Nonsense. You're more than welcome, young ladies, the man says, patting both our shoulders as we walk in. After all we've been through, it is almost unsettling for me to treat, be treated so kindly by a stranger. And I imagine Nikki feels much the same, though she's better at hiding it than me. We're encouraged to sit down on the couch in the living room. What looks to be a foreign romance film has been paused on the TV. He, says, he sits back down in his recliner to the right of the couch as the woman moves towards the kitchen. You girls allergic to anything? She calls out from the adjacent room, both of us replying to the contrary. So then, what are your names? The man says calmly as if to avoid startling a wild animal. I'm Ronald, and my wife in there is Margaret. I'm Nikki, and my friend is Sophie, Nikki goes on, beginning to exchange and small talk with them. While they chat, I slowly observe the house just in case things turn sour. The living room has a high ceiling with a chandelier hanging down about five feet above us. Behind us, I see some stairs going up, as well as an open door that seems to lead downstairs into the basement. To the left of that is a hallway, the same one that Margaret had walked down to enter the kitchen. Everything seems fairly homely, so I start to let my hackles down. Is something the matter there, Miss Sophie? And come to think, Nikki, why do you have that cut on your cheek? Looks painful. Ronald says worriedly. Oh, I, uh, I was just looking around. You have a lovely home, sir. I say fairly quickly back, hoping to be convincing enough to avoid suspicion. Though, he probably was just consumed. Sophie isn't the best with strangers and new things. I I practically had to kidnap her to get her out on this trip with me. As for the cut, I fell down a short flight of stairs earlier today. It isn't as bad as it might look. Nikki responds jovially, elbowing my side. How she can so easily come up with a fictitious backstory is beyond me. Well, I'm going to think that it's more twisting of the truth than anything. Ronald lets out a hearty laugh alongside Nikki's fake chuckling. The more I hear her talk, the more I can tell how anxious she is. 
So you want to be able to tell if you didn't know her as I do. Every fiber is my being. Every fiber of my being is telling me to hug her and comfort her, hold her hand and kiss her. But no, not here. We can't. We have to be careful. If those things show up now, I don't think we could get it right. Let alone if these two, these two are. No. I can't think like this right now. Giving myself a panic attack won't help any. I've had a few friends like that in my life. It's always good to explore and push your boundaries. Either way, thank you. This house has been in my family for three generations. I had to renovate it a bit for me and the missus, but I think it turned out well, he says looking up at the ceiling. It does feel a bit empty at times, though. It is all grown up and we're rarely getting visitors, so for me it is quite a gift to have something unexpected happen like this. What did I tell you, girls? You can feel at home here, Margaret's voice chimes out from my left. She sets two sandwiches and two mugs of hot tea on the coffee table in front of us before sitting down in a chair just to the left of the couch. We both give our thanks to Margaret before digging in. I feel my stomach rumble as the first bite of food for half a day enters it. Even if this sandwich wasn't incredible on its own, it would still taste like ambrosia to me. Judging by how quickly Nikki goes through hers, she more than agrees. Both her sandwich and her tea are gone in a matter of three or four minutes, or I try to take my time in mine. Well, I try to take my time with mine. That was so good. Thank you so much, Nikki says ecstatically, stretching her arms above her head. You're very welcome, Margaret replies with a quiet smile. So, you girls said you're on a road trip, right? Where are you headed? Well, it was kind of a last minute thing, in all honesty. We didn't really leave with a destination in mind, just decided to hit the road and see where it takes us. Nikki chirps back with some more half-truths while I continue savoring my meal. Ah, uh, just adventuring for the sake of it. That takes me back. Ronald replies with a sigh. Me and some old buddies fresh out of high school did that. Just piled in a van and went across the country for a week or so. Went from Louisiana to D.C., Long Island to Mount Rushmore. Just singing all the songs that came on the radio and seeing as much of this beautiful country as we could. He goes on for a bit while Margaret continues the Sudoku puzzle she had been working on before we showed up. Maybe another ten minutes go by before I finish my sandwich and partially my sandwich, partially because I found myself getting absorbed in Ronald's stories. I place the plate back down and pick up my mug of tea and start sipping at it for just a bit. For just a few moments, I... I've been able to forget about all the fucked up shit lately. Nikki seems to be in the same state, starting to truly relax for the first time in hours. Ronald pauses his story in response to Nikki letting out a long yawn. Oh, where are my manners? You girls must be getting real tired. It's getting pretty late, ain't it? I shouldn't keep you too up with this, he says, standing up with a grumble. I suppose so. What time is it? Nikki jumps to attention, reaching reaching into her pocket to pull out her phone. However, it slips from her grasp, landing face down on the ground. Ronald bends over to pick it up, discovering that the lock screen had become visible. Oh, thanks, Nikki says, snatching it back with a nervous and scared tone. She goes to put it back in her pocket, but is stopped. Ronald grips her wrist tightly and pulls her hand out. Seeing this, I instinctively reach my hand toward my holster. Please. Please, may this just be paranoia. Please, not after all this good fortune and hospitality. It feels like... It feels like minutes pass as the screen becomes visible. My gut's fear is realized. Nikki forgot to change her lock screen background. It's an image of Nikki and me from our first anniversary, a breathtaking view from 
the boardwalk of a shore house amusement park or a shore side amusement park with Nikki and I kissing. Of course, a fucking course that memory has to be tainted like this. Again, it feels like minutes on end as we all collectively stare at the screen. I feel every bead of sweat stream down my face and I can hear that sickeningly familiar sound, a slow, blood-curdling crunching and tearing fills the room from both sides. All the while, the sickening stench of decay assaults my nose. I slowly disable the safety on my pistol while gripping my mug on. While gripping my mug, hard enough I feel I could break it. I can see Ronald's hand tighten around Nikki's wrist, his fingers and arm twitching wildly. Both his and Margaret's breathing starts to sound labored, as if gasping for air. Why? Why does it always end up like this? Why can't we just be free? Why? What did we do to deserve this sick joke playing on repeat over and over again? Why? My thoughts are interrupted by a raspy, gnarled voice behind me. Before that accursed word is finished, I swing the mug as hard as I can, smashing it into Margaret. A shrill scream pierces my ears along with Nikki's own crying fear. In a blur, I draw my pistol, aiming for Ronald's head. And at that moment, I get a good look at what he is. Bulging, glazed over eyes, bloodshot, manic. His cheeks are concave, his nose shrunken, his lips all but non-existent, and his mangled teeth gnashing. His body is contorted and emaciated, like a rag doll fresh out of the dryer. Dirty his distorted voice screams out as he shoots his mangled, elongated hand toward me. And then, like every time before, no matter its face, no matter who it was before this point, I do what I have to for myself and for Nikki. The deafening sound of my pistol fire drowns out his hate-filled screech. It takes two shots through its face before it stumbles and another three before it lets Nikki go and simply rides on the floor. The fine carpet, the homely seating, this beautiful living room, are all stained with the resent-filled blackened sludge-like blood that pours out of its wounds. I grit my teeth as I feel my tears starting to stream down my face, and my stomach twists and cramps. Before I can turn to deal with the other one, however, I'm flung across the room, losing my grip on my gun and having the wind knocked out of me. I hear Nikki scream out my name. The mangled thing that flung me, whatever Margaret is now, crawls on all fours and is on me within half a second, gripping my throat. It's much the same as the first, save for the long hair and thicker nails that start to dig into my skin. Its gnashing teeth and frenzied gaze come within a foot of my face, screeching jumbled syllables approaching the words Sodom and Sinner. I push back on its face with my hands but can barely fight its strength. It bites my left hand in response, tightening its grip and sending saliva spraying across my face with its hate-filled rambling. I feel my arms fall away from its face and my vision becomes blurred before another shot rings out. I gasp for air and roll away from the thing as it falls to the floor, writhing. I hear Nikki unload the remainder of my pistol's magazine into its head and neck. I cough several times before I feel my senses return to me, and I can hear Nikki sobbing beside me. Soph, please, Soph, be okay, she says, gripping my hand and holding out my canteen that was attached to my back. Her clothes and hands were covered in the, those things putrid blood. I, I, I'm fine, babe. 
It's all right. Thank, thank you. I stutter out before taking the canteen and taking one chug. Thank you, I say as I pull her close and hug her. We are both trembling from the adrenaline and shock. We cling to each other for what feels like minutes, letting both our heart rates settle. I, I can't take this anymore. They, they were so nice. Why does this keep happening? Why can't, why can't we just be over with this? Nikki says between sobbing breaths. What did we do? What did we do to deserve this shit? We didn't do anything wrong, babe. I say after a moment's pause. It's, it's not our fault. We have to do this. What are we supposed to do? This, this life is nothing but pain right now, but. But we have to try to see the end of it. We have to. I don't know if I'm trying to comfort her or myself. Both, probably. We take a bit to calm down, but we never get a break. Our small moment of peace is shattered by that sound we both know too well. A shrill screech from the woods outside, followed by another and another until there is an unearthly chorus descending upon the house, their twisted gospel music dripping with hate and anger. We both stand, grabbing our bags. I hand Nikki the pistol from my bag while I reload my own. I take a moment to look down at the shrilled husks on the floor, Ronald and Margaret. Such kind-hearted people, reduced to such horrid shells of what they had been. What a sick joke. We open the door before Nikki screams out. Looking outside, there are tens of them, stumbling out of the trees. Some on all fours, some trailing elongated arms behind them. Some having their heads dangle upside down from limp necks. All of them chanting mantras of loathsome words. Sinner. Sodomite. Reprobate, degenerate, groomer, and on and on. Upon noticing this, they all let out ear splitting shrieks or screeches and charge for us. I fire off a couple rounds to no avail before slamming the door shut just in time for one of them to smash head first into it. They smash their distorted faces and hands through the windows, gnashing and grabbing at us. We both fire off more rounds from the guns, but we hear glass breaking and wood cracking from all around us. So, what? What do we do? I hear Nikki cry out desperately. My mind races, hearing some of them breaking through the windows upstairs and loud, heavy thuds before one of the monsters come careening down the flight of stairs. We both jump out of the way fast enough to avoid getting hit, and it smashes over the couch, flailing to get its bearings before charging us again. I fire three shots and Nikki fires the rest of hers before it slumps over, letting out one final gasping sting. <laughs> I look around the room before remembering the basement. Downstairs, now, I yell out, pointing towards the entrance. I unload the rest of my magazine into one that into one that I notice at the top of the second floor stairs. It sprints down, grabbing onto my bag and ripping it away from me before I'm able to follow her downstairs. Or down. I shut the heavy door, or the heavy wood door, and call out, Find something to block the door with! More crashing and glass breaking comes from upstairs as I feel heavy thuds at the door to my back. A loud, scraping sound comes from the dimly lit basement as Nikki pushes an old desk toward the stairs. I run down to help her. We try to push it up this steep flight together, but... Before realizing how futile it is, as weak as my sleep-deprived body is, we look at each other out of breath. My head is splitting. I feel I can barely stand. The longer we look, the more obvious it is to both of us. 
with the breaking and screeching upstairs and the door being hammered on. No more ammunition and nowhere left to run. Only that deafening, repugnant chorus calling out from above us. I grab her and I pull her onto the back of the dusty, mildew-covered room. We huddle down in the corner furthest from the door. Any of the old, thin windows furthest from the door and any of the old thin windows to the outside. Gripping my head from the pain, I try to think of a way out of this. After all, after all we've suffered through, after all the fighting, this, this can't, this, this is it, isn't it? Nikki whimpers, hugging her knees to her chest. After all the running, the fighting, this is it? She voices my thoughts while looking at me. Her feet filled eyes, streaming with tears. My body, sh her body shaking like a leaf. They've taken, they've taken everything from us. And now? I turn to her and grab her, hugging her as tight as I can. I want to comfort her. Tell her everything will be fine, but I can't lie to her. The screams only drone on above. The banging at the door reverberates to our bodies, accompanied by the sounds of its wood cracking. I pull away so I can look into her eyes, my own tearing up. They haven't taken everything, and, and they can't. We... We still have each other, right here, right now. They can't take this away from us. They, they can't. I'm interrupted by the ear-splitting sound of them breaking through the basement windows, unable to get in, but making the sound of their hateful cries reverberate through the room, even loud. Nikki turns her head away and screams, but I put my hands on the cheeks and pull her eyes back. They can't. They won't take us from each other. They can't take what we have between each other. They can't. I try to reassure her, as well as myself. A moment passes as I start to question my own reassurance. However, Nikki calms herself a bit and reaches her hand up and grips mine, pulling it off her cheek slightly. Her eyes are red and streaming with tears. But still, she smiles and says softly, No, no, they can't. Selfie, she says, leaning in. Selfie, I, I love you. With those words, she closes her eyes, bringing her face up to mine. They try as they might truly can't take this from us. My eyes close as I hug her even tighter. Our lips meet. Despite them all, we love each other here and now, even as the door breaks from its hinges. <laughs> Alright, this story is simply titled, Innocent. On Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022, a group of four hikers found a suitcase discarded near Jefferson Lake, Colorado. Upon breaking it open and having seen the contents, they immediately turned it over to local authorities. While several pieces of evidence from this case have yet to be made publicly available information, the select few have been in an attempt to gather leads, including several small glass vials, a two-inch pocket knife with the initials RFD engraved on its wooden handle, a large ladle, a pair of well-worn leather loafers, men's size 10, pairs of between three to eight individuals, an NIV pocket Bible, and finally, a loose, connect a loose collection of notebook papers with handwritten text. All of the context of the case have been confirmed to have traces of human blood on them. The remainder of this document will be dedicated to the oration of the papers that were found in the case having been pieced together in what is presumably the correct order.
looking back on my life, it feels like the majority of it was pulled straight from a bad comedy, confused, pointless comedy, consisting of a man constantly toiling in the dark, finding answers to the simplest of questions. Ones we should have already known the answers to. Ones that were as obvious as a fog hole on the open ocean. Ones that he would eventually be able to answer so very easily, as if reciting his name or the number of fingers on his hands. For so long, so very, very long, I was the lead to that pathetic excuse for a comedy. But now, now the curtains have closed. It all started with my genius of mother. I remember distinctly that the first part of my childhood, she was kind and constantly attentive. I wanted for nothing and was always cared for deeply, passionately. We never fought or argued, save for the rare few times when I felt particularly incensed by the presence of vegetables on my plate. I would complain and cry and scream, but she would never raise her voice or lash out. She would simply say something to the tune of, You have to eat your vegetables. You are what you eat, so you need to eat something that will keep you healthy. Though even then, I noticed that she didn't like to say it. That something was a bit off. In fact, looking back, she never particularly liked giving more realistic answers to my questions at the time. I suppose I understand why now, but back then, these few moments of clarity seemed strange to me. Then came my tenth birthday. On that day, there was no cake, no presents, no happy tunes or motherly love. No. On that day, there was nothing but mother crying to herself in her room. Any time I knocked or called out to her, she would simply smack, snap back, telling me to go away. I didn't know what had happened, why she was acting this way, though I should have. The following morning, she did not smile. She gave no kisses or hugs. She only looked at me with disgust and sadness. I went to school hungry that day, and every day after. Suppers were never more extravagant than a barely warm microwave meal or, or a bowl of dry cereal. I would ask her why she changed and why she was always angry or sad, and she would simply respond with, You're not innocent. I at first thought that this was merely something that would pass by waiting long enough, but days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years, and nothing truly changed. I, I longed so desperately for her attention, for her love, but as hard as I tried, as good as my grades, as clean as my record, she would always respond with disdain. You're not innocent. To every last thing I said to try to get her approval. I would constantly look back, trying to think of what I had done wrong, what I was guilty of, but come up with a blank. I would ask her what I had done wrong, but she would simply make a pained expression, never answering the question. The same treatment never changed. I stopped having her make my meals for me and made my own meals, focusing on nutritional value, yet nothing changed. I became independent, cleaning my own clothes, cleaning the house, all without her asking, yet nothing changed. I graduated from middle school at the top of my class, yet nothing changed. I graduated high school as valedictorian, and nothing changed. I went to college and got a degree in economics, and nothing changed. She never congratulated me on my achievements. She never expected anything from me. She simply looked upon me with disdain and sadness, saying, You're not innocent. I never came to an answer to my questions, though they were right there, right in front of me. I never understood her words, 
and simply stewed, dwelled on them, slowly losing myself to them. Why? Why was I not innocent? I never heard a fly. I founded my own company and worked to pay my employees fairly. I gave more than five, more than half of my income to charity. I did philanthropy, community outreach, youth programs, and founded health care for the needy. So why? Why was I not innocent? What was I guilty of? Why did I deserve this treatment from the person that I loved most? The person I did everything I could for. The person I kept well fed, bought a house for, a car for, everything. The person, the person I made sure would never want for anything. Why? Why? For four decades into my life, I still couldn't answer why. Eventually, my mother fell ill. In her 80s then, she didn't have a strong enough immune system to fight it off. And so I soon began to spend most of my time with her, attempting to comfort her as she lay there slowly dying. Yet, even then, even on her deathbed, she didn't speak to me or ask anything. She simply stared off into the distance and struggled with the pain she was in. I eventually brought myself to ask it, to, to ask it one last time. Mother. I've tried to understand your words, understand what your words mean my whole life, yet I still, under, I still don't understand. Why? Why did you become so distant? Why have you always refused to answer me? Please. I need to know why. I remember distinctly. She turned her head my way, her eyes pale and her voice hoarse. After all this time, you, you still haven't pieced it together. You still don't get it. For a millionaire pro prodigy, you really are quite stupid. Fine. I'll spell it out for you. She paused after this, coughing and gasping from her ailment. Yet... I felt as if the world had lifted away. Mother was finally talking to me. I could finally be free of these nagging questions. Innocence is pu purity. And purity is youth. To age is to let this fallen world ch change you from your purest, youngest form. It is age that rusts the strongest metals, renders the tallest mountains to sand, and the, that rendered my body into this husk. To age is to be tainted. When I saw you age, I saw you become like the rest of us. It impure. I wanted to keep you safe from this corruption, but I couldn't bring myself to do the only thing that would have ensured that, that you weren't corrupted. I was weak, and I let you become like the rest of us. None of us are innocent. We are all tainted. Our, our blood is impure. We are not innocent. You are not in innocent. The blurring sound of her flatlining, the ruckus sound as nurses, nurses and a doctor rushed to her room. The feeling of my tears streaming down my face rendered me completely dumbstruck. I was paralyzed with grief, but more so with a newfound purpose, with an all-encompassing understanding of my life. Everything clicked into place, and the curtains closed on that sick, futile comedy that was my life up until then. She only became disgusted and saddened by me when I got older.
when I had lived in this fallen world for a decade. I knew at that moment that I had to find a way. I had to find a way to become innocent again. I had to be rid of this tainted blood, tainted by the world, tainted by age. If I was to honor her, the one I loved, as she lost herself to this vile world, to the sickness that is age, I had to find out how to become pure. I had to become innocent again. And yet, I replaced my blind questions with clarity that only inspired more questions. How would I become innocent again? I was once again left dwelling on her words, over and over and over again. I spent many sleepless nights trying to piece together this puzzle. The first question I answered was, If to age is to be tainted, then what was the one solution she spoke of? How could that corruption have been stopped? So long I pondered this, but I eventually remembered some little fragments of my childhood that made the answer clear. All the little times my mother looked at me, seemed pained, and was near the kitchen knives. All the time she was preparing a nice dinner and looked toward the medicine cabinet over and over again, but never opened it. Oh, it became so, so very clear why she was weak and why she could never bring herself to do it. I could not have been corrupted if I had been taken, no, no, released from this world before I could age. It is very clear now why she couldn't bring herself to save me. But, but I... I am not weak as she was, and I know many who I can save from this world's corruption. The second question I answered was, if my blood, my body is tainted by this world, by age, by this impurity, if I am already tainted, is it ever possible to become innocent again? Oh, again and again I nod on this question. Until the answer came to me, oh, yes, did it ever come to me. For the blood to be tainted, the person would have to age. In other words, those who were pure have pure, untainted blood. The innocent, the innocent are pure, and the innocent are those I need to save. But how could I be innocent again? How could I make her life meaningful by becoming innocent again? How? Oh, oh, but I found the answer. Killed, I killed two birds with one stone. One stone, you see. And I, I'm finally innocent. Thanks to my mother, thanks to her words, thanks to my carefully honed memories, I am innocent again. And I have saved so many from losing their innocence. They have helped me, yes, they have helped me too. Thanks to Mother, thanks to the, those I've saved, I am innocent again. My blood isn't tainted. My blood isn't tainted anymore. How could it be tainted anymore? Af after all, you are what you eat. <laughs> So this is NES Godzilla, Chapter 1, Earth and Mars. When I was a little kid, the two things I loved most in life were Godzilla and NES games. So naturally, when Godzilla Monster of Monsters came out, it was like a dream come true. Well, almost. To sum it up, most of the game revolved around getting through very repetitive outer space levels while smashing up tanks and jets, then fighting against and then fighting against Godzilla's monster enemies. Overall it was pretty mediocre, but back then I didn't care. But when I got the game as a present for my tenth birthday, I played it night and day. 
as much as I could. Unfortunately, I traded the game for Amagon a year later. Much to my regret when I found out what that game was like. Recently, I bought a new NES system and through a lot of hunting and asking around, my friend Billy managed to find a copy of Godzilla Monster of Monsters. I was pumped to play my favorite childhood game. It never occurred to me to ask where Billy found it. He also gave me some other games like Legend of Zelda, Bomberman, and some stupid thing called Action 52, but Godzilla had to come first. So I started the game, and the nostalgia came flooding back like a tidal wave. Godzilla's 8-bit theme song flooded proudly through the speakers. And I was soon grinning like an idiot. <laughs> Some people laugh at me playing such outdated games, but I've never had as much enjoyment for any games other than the, those on the NES. Those 8-bit games take me back to when things were much simpler, more, more safe. But after what's happened with this game, I don't have those feelings anymore. I'd forgotten how quick the fun of smashing things as Godzilla wore off in the scrolling level levels. The game bombards you with bullets and things you, crashing into you from every direction, and you're too big to avoid most of them. Although my excitement had worn down some, it wasn't long at all before I got to my first boss battle. My first opponent was Gizera, an obscure squid kaiju who had never been in a Godzilla movie. The most annoying thing about fighting Gizera is that he always backs you into a corner and starts smacking you with his tentacle. And you're unable to move until he gets off you. The move doesn't do any damage, but it can stall you until the timer runs out and you have to start the fight over. And he, gains some hel and he regains some health. It is annoying as it sounds. Uh, and of course, he did it when I fought him, only for some reason this caused the game to glitch up. Because once he started smacking me around, he never stopped. The timer was supposed to end the fight about in about 40 seconds, but this lasted nearly five minutes. After a while, the graphics started to mess up with little red blocks all over the place. Which was weird, but I just took the game out blew on it and started it again. I wasn't about to let this little glitch, let a little glitch stand in my way. So I started again and this time defeated Gizera and the level's other boss monster, Mogera, without any pro pro problems. So then it was on to the next planet, Mars. I browsed around the board and found something unexpected. Where Varan's piece should have been there was instead a piece representing Titanosaurus. There were only 10 kaiju in the game, and Titanosaurus was not one of them. Or so I thought. Perhaps Titanosaurus was originally intended to be in the game, but was swapped out with Varan for some reason? So I began to feel very excited. Not only was I playing my favorite game, but I was playing a prototype of some sort of... with prototype of some sort with a new monster... Uh, needless to say, I ran through the levels as fast as I could to see Titanosaurus in action. Fought Gizera again and beat him before he could do his tentacle smack. But this time, the glitch started happening when he died. Gizera's sprite didn't sink to the bottom, but instead seemed to be devoured by the glitch and his eye started randomly spawning all over the screen. I know now that these glitches with Gizura were my first warning sign that something was very wrong with this game, but foolishly, I ignored it and proceeded to on to fight Mogera, which this time had a glitch of his own. Mogera was twice the size he should have been, which startled me, 
it was considerably harder to beat than usual, which is to say not at all. But as soon as I defeated him, when he died, yet another glitch happened. This happened extremely fast, so I was lucky to get a scream cap from it of it all. But what happened was that the giant Mogera spray started to shatter and melt. Also, if you if you look at the garbled text in the right corner of the screen, you'll notice what appears to be a bird in a cage. I I still have no idea what that meant. At this point, I was about to fight Titanosaurus. And I was worried as to what glitches would happen this time. But to my surprise, Titanosaurus looked just fine. Although all the game's bipedal monsters were the same height, Titanosaurus was a bit taller. But since Titanosaurus was actually taller than Godzilla in the film de- in his film debut, I thought it was actually kind of cool. After a very fun night with a monster that wasn't supposed to be in the game, I took over the enemy base and proceeded not to Jupiter like nor- normal, but instead to pathos chapter two pathos pathos was the same as jupiter in layout except the board was dark blue rather than green the first thing i noticed was that all of the usual level icons had been replaced by a blue rock and some kind of orange honeycomb shape there was one icon that had a part of the jungle icon shape, but I didn't pay much thought to it. I checked the other side of the board to see the new monster. Instead of Hedera, it was Bioanti. But that couldn't have been right. Godzilla vs. Bioanti didn't come out until 1989, and this game was made in 1988. Perhaps Toho put Bioanti in the game, to build excitement for the movie next year, but change their minds? I tried to rationalize the game's abnormalities any way I could, but this would prove to be futile. Pathos's map song was the first new song I heard in the game. Like most of the new songs, it was hard to describe, but in any case, I'll try. It started out slow and suspenseful, much slower than any song in the game. But every 12 seconds or so, there would be a loud clashing sound and the tempo changed. It was like the composer randomly started playing parts from five different songs with the same instruments. I moved Godzilla over to one of the many blue rocks that had been replaced, that had replaced the jungle icons and started the level. The level resembled a blue mountain range with a blood red planet in the sky, but but there was something odd about the mountains. They had a shredded paper look to them. I thought at first maybe the glitch had affected it, but It looked far too intentional. I quickly noticed something else about this new level. There were... There were no enemies. At all. Not even any obstacles. I should also mention that this was where the point meter started to become glitched beyond comprehension. But it didn't bother me much. I never keep up with the game points. So without having to focus on anything, I listened to the music while walking through the level unopposed. The music had a sorrowful feel to it. It would have been rather pleasant had I heard it in a normal game. The level went on for three screens, but with no obstacles I around, I finished it very quickly. I tried other levels of the same type to see if any of any enemies would appear, but there were none. There was little else to be seen in the Blue Mountains, so I tried the other te- level type. I started with 
Oh, I, I started one of the orange levels, and my eyes were assaulted with a grotesque background of tumorous orange eyes. The sky was the same as the ground, and I assumed the game was indicating that this level takes place in a cave. The only enemies here were Matango spawn, but as you can see, the little bastards were everywhere. The music certainly didn't help with a mixture of screeching sounds and loud drum beats that sounded like a monster's theme in a horror film. After completing it, I tried to avoid playing through any more of these levels whenever I could. The map was short, so it was only a few minutes before I headed out towards a rematch with Gizra and Mogera. But this time, their sprites and attack patterns were vastly different. I fought Mogera first. Mogera's replacement was a flying machine with slight resemblance to a, a Pascagoula alien. It was a bit like fighting Mothra, only it moved with a lot more grace. It attacked by spinning its te front tentacle like a corkscrew, and it still had an eye beam, except now it fired from the drill. This lanky aberration that re had replaced Gizera, and the new beast was even more of a challenge. It would run and jump at a fast pace, constantly swinging its arms, making it hard to get close. And of course, it tried to pin me into the corner with as much annoying resolve as ever. I defeated it using a combination of tails, whips, and heat beam spamming. I defeated them and then was going on to fight Titanosaurus. But when I started the fight, Titanosaurus was nowhere to be seen. And the game simply went back to the map with the Titanosaurus piece now missing. There was no one left to fight now but Bioanti, so I eagerly started the battle. I was quite surprised that Bioanti started the fight in her rose form. She was immobile and used tentacles to keep me away from her main body, which took the most damage. As expected, she turned into her final form after taking enough damage. The sprite looked pretty damn good for 8-bit. The battle technique was the same, except now Bioanti can move, albeit slower than any other monster. Being hit by the tentacles did more damage now, and Bioanti could do an acid spit, which I managed to avoid by jumping in the, in the screen cap. Not much more difficult to beat than Titanosaurus. It only took two rounds, but when Bioanti was gone, the music had stopped. And there was a new icon replacing the base. The icon wasn't there before. I beat Bioanti. It resembled a red tribal mask. And I had the feeling of dread when I saw it. But since it replaced the base, it must have been the only way to exit Pathos. I moved Godzilla to the square and started the level. It was a hellish looking place with no sky and a flickering fire in the background. The fire looked more, far more advanced than anything I'd seen on the NES. There was music in the form of a slow, steady drum sound re resembling a heartbeat. All the texts on the top of the screen and the life bar were gone. In their place was a single bit of text in the middle of the screen that said, run. My, my feeling of dread had intensified. I cautiously walked through the level, but like the Blue Mountains, there were no enemies. 
I paced around for a minute thinking, run. Run from what? The first time it hit me, I didn't even see it. I heard a noise outside my room. It turned back if something fell. And when I looked back, Godzilla was dying. I figured it must have just been a glitch, but I wasn't going to play through the game without Godzilla, so I, I restarted the game and went to the password screen. H have I mentioned how creepy the password screen music is? If, if, if you played the game, you know what I mean. It, it doesn't at all fit with the mood of the game. It's, it's more like something from a horror movie. Maybe it, maybe they maybe they made it like that so kids wouldn't cheat. But I was annoyed at this point <laughs> because I because I thought I was going to have to fight all the monsters again, but that didn't happen. The game started me off right where I was before. I saw I started the red face level, but so I tried it again making sure to pay attention this time. That's when I heard a low bellowing sound. And then, and then I saw it. This, this, this thing. Do you know that feeling your body has when you uh when you feel like you're in extreme danger? You start to recoil and tense up and as the adrenaline flows through your veins and, and your nerves start to feel very cold. That's the feeling I had when I took the screen cap. I have seen all of the Godzilla movies, but I'm pretty damn sure this was never in any of them. It had to be something the creators made up. But what kind of sick fuck would put this in a children's game? By sheer dumb luck, or, or perhaps the adrenaline boost, I managed to run fast enough to get away from it. It ran very fast, so much so that if you saw it, you would almost think you were certainly going to die. And when I say die, I mean your monster gets killed instantly if that creature touches you, if it touches them. Once I had gone back to the map, I was afraid that I, I was extremely tempted to shut off this game. I was so afraid I was extremely tempted to shut off this game and try to pretend this never happened. I, I couldn't believe what I had seen. It it couldn't have been real. And and even if I wanted to continue, I still had to get Mothra through the chase level, but as I stayed inactive on the map screen for a few minutes, my gear was replaced by, by burning curiosity. What in the hell just happened? What was the rest of this game like? I I only had to beat this level with Mothra and then it was on to the next world. But when I moved Mothra to the red face, the game registered me it as me beating the level. I was quite relieved. I I tried to prepare myself for the next world. Trance. Chapter 3. Trance. I was still pretty shook up from the last level when I started Trance. Trance's map music did nothing to ease the tension. As for how to describe it, um... Have you ever heard the theme from Videodrome? That's the that's the closest thing I can think of to compare it to. 
I checked to see who the new monster was. And it was Orga. A monster who didn't even make it in the film debut until 2000. Appearing in a game made in 1988. So much for my theories about Titanosaurus and Bioanti. There was no way this game was made in 1988. Those guys in Toho may have been smart, but I'm sure they couldn't see that far into the future. If they could, they would have never given Ronald Emmerich the rights to make a Godzilla movie. No, this, this had to be a hack of some kind. Which is... Which just opens up even more questions. Who made this hack? When? How? And and most importantly, why? The why was the question that bothered me the most. My immediate assumption was to think that Billy did this to pull a joke on me. But that couldn't be right either. Billy didn't know how to make a ROM hack. And if he did, he'd probably just do something simple and stupid, like replace all the monsters with crudely drawn genitalia. Unless Billy had amazing game editing skills and a serious dark streak to his imagination that he never told me about, he couldn't have made this. Is it even possible to put a hacked ROM into a cartridge? Aside from that, my eyes were drawn to a new icon on the map. A question mark. I was really curious, curious as to what it did. I'm sure you're also curious. So I'll explain the quiz levels now, since this was when they started appearing. There was one of these per map on here, from here on. And they always appeared near the start of the map. When you start on a quiz level, you appear on a screen like this. As you can see, there's a question at the top, a yes, no, but a yes and no button, and an emoticon at the center. I refer to this emoticon as face, real creative, I know. And for convenience, I'll refer to face as the one asking questions. The music for the quiz levels was a track actually in the game. It's the one that plays when you try to use the Ghidorah cheat and get sent to an unplayable level. Face asks you 12 yes or no questions. And you move your monster to the buttons for your answer. When you answer, the question disappears and Face changes his expression for about eight seconds and then he goes back to neutral and a new question comes up. There was no time limit, nor any right or wrong answers. Face had no respect for the player's personal boundaries and will sometimes ask deeply disturbing personal questions. For example, do you like hurting people? Have you ever killed or raped anyone? Have you ever been molested by a family member? Other times he would ask questions that were either mind-numbingly stupid. Is the sun hot? Is water wet? Or just flat out ridiculous. Does your dog like the president? And maybe once per quiz face would ask you a question like that about the ask you a question about the game with one exception faces expressions change change expression changes seem to have no effect on the game except for indicating what the creator thought of your answer his reactions rarely made sense and at first i thought they were randomly generated the questions never followed a pattern. Face never stayed on the same subject for more than 
two questions. Early on, there were questions that made me think Face was building up to something. Only then it asked some stupid garbage. Here are the expressions of Face that I saw while playing. I'll separate them into two categories. The expressions I understood, and then the expressions I didn't. First are the expressions I understood. Number one, neutral, his default position. Expression. Number two, angry. If you try to attack face, his expression changes to this, but nothing else happens. Number three, sad. Number four, happy. Number five, sick. Number six, maniacal. Face made this expression when he was being an asshole. You'll see what I mean later. Number seven, surprised. Number eight, love. Number nine, annoyed. Number 10, confused. Number 11, guilty or hurt. And here are the others. Two of these only appeared once, number one, numbers one and 12. And I suspected they might have been in jokes from the creator. Their respective questions were Do you like ice cream? and Are you a tough guy? As for the questions on the first quiz, Luckily, I had a notepad and pen handy. I have problems remembering things, so I often carry one around just to dot, jot things down, and sometimes I doodle in it when I'm bored. So when the first quiz started, I thought I'd record what happened. I'm glad I did. Here are the first series of questions, my answers, and faces reactions. Quiz one. One, do you like this game? Answer, yes. Reaction, happy. Well, question two, are you afraid? Answer, yes. Reaction, surprised. Question three, are you over 18? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face five. Do birds have teeth? Answer, no. Reaction, love. Or question five, is peanut butter good? Answer, no. Reaction, sick. Question six, does the moon rotate? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number 11. Question seven, have you had a job? Answer, yes. Reaction, confused. Question eight, do you like hurting people? Answer, no. Reaction, annoyed. Question nine, is the sun hot? Answer, yes. Reaction, sad. Question 10. Do you like dogs? Answer, yes. Reaction, happy. Question 11. Is the president good? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face three. Num question 12. Does your dog like the president? Answer, no. Reaction, angry. Now that I've explained all of that, time for the gameplay. After the quiz level, I tried the new green temple icon first. Wow. Maybe this was why the game was so weird. One of the developers was clearly drugged out of his mind. 
jokes aside, I am I was quite impressed by the graphics of this level, as disorienting as they were. But I hate those creepy, blank staring statue faces. The music had a hypnotic Indian techno vibe to it. There were two new enemies in this level. A flying ghost type thing with a trunk and a bat with a horse skull for a face. I appear at random, but I was lucky enough to get a screen cap of both of them. Then I proceeded to a blue mountain level, expecting another nice, calm stroll. I took my time walking, though, as I was completely taken by surprise when this happened. Not Magera came speeding towards me and took off quite a bit of health with his tentacle screws. It, it only took me, it, it took me two minutes. It only took me two minutes to kill him without having to worry about a time limit. But the boss monsters never show up in the scrolling levels in the normal game. I was worried as to what other rules this game would break. After another blue mountain stage, it was time to fight not, not Varan, whose replacement was one of the most bizarre creatures in the game. This strange creature attacks you by kicking and also opening its chest and firing heat-seeking missiles. Yeah, I, st I still don't get it. Um, the missiles were sometimes a pain to deal with, but I found out you can tail whip them out of the way. Not Varan is probably the easiest of the monster replacements. That cannot be said. The same could not be said for Not Hedera. Apparently the source of the horse bats, Not Hedera was the most aggravatingly difficult monster to fight yet. Mostly because of his special ability. He could shriek and summon a small swarm of those horse bat things. I know there's only two in the screen cap, but every time he did this, about ten would arrive. The AI took advantage of the distraction and attacked twice as fast while the horse bats were flying around. Once that annoyance was over with, I went through the Green Temple level to kill some enemies to restore my health. Interestingly, none of the horse bats showed up after Nahidaru was killed. And that was when I got an idea. If killing all the monsters made the red face show up, what would happen if I had avoid fighting Orga and go straight to the base? So I gave that a try. The game told me that there was no monster there when I tried to start the base level. And immediately afterward, the game took control of my Godzilla piece and moved it in front of Orca. My little trick didn't work, so... I tried to prepare myself for another chase. But first, I had to beat Orga. The fight with Orga confirmed another thing. Whoever created this game hack was clearly a Godzilla fan, not only because they picked a monster like Orga, but because they actually implemented something that happened in Godzilla 2000 in a really neat way. Uh, Orga's primary attacks were a punch and a heat beam from his shoulder cavity. But once you, but once you had got him down to half his health, he did something new. He would expand his jaws and try to swallow Godzilla in the process, stealing your health and energy. But in doing so, he gave himself a new weakness. Firing a heat beam into his mouth would take a devastating four bars off his life meter. With that weakness revealed, I soon beat Orga. And despite how much I 
hoped otherwise. The red face appeared on the map where the base was, and the music stopped. I readied myself as best I could. I started the level and seeing that it was basically the same as the first. I didn't waste a millisecond before I started hauling ass. I soon encountered obstacles in the form of the ground tile suspended in the air. Most of them you could jump over or destroy. Others you had to crouch under. About 40 seconds into it, I heard this horrible bellowing roar and saw that spider beast following close behind me. Stacks of obstacles barely slowed it down. It went back up and then charged its way through them, smashing them to bits. And when the smaller obstacles got in the way, it would expand his jaws and swallow them whole. I was afraid, but fast thinking and faster button pressing, but with fast thinking and faster button pressing, I escaped him yet again. I felt really excited. And so I laughed and said, not this time, asshole. I decided to take a screen cap to celebrate. But when I said that sentence, just before the level ended, the monster did something that made my blood run cold. It looked at me. That wave of mortal terror overtook me again. And I sure as hell wasn't laughing anymore. I took another screen cap of the next title. Right before I rushed, I rushed to the bathroom to splash some water on my face. And I take a piss that I nearly failed to contain when that fucking thing looked at me. Chapter four, dementia. When I got back to the game, I was getting very upset and confused. I thought about the way the monster looked at me. This game, the game couldn't have heard what I said. That's impossible. It had to be a random occurrence, but why did it happen precisely at the moment I insulted the monster? Nothing about this game made any sense. The new Godzilla monsters, the weird replacement monsters, out of the place imagery like the green temples, quiz levels, and the red monster chases, it, it didn't seem to add up in any meaningful way. If it was a prank, it wasn't funny in any way that I could understand, and they clearly put far too much effort in it, into it. If, if they were trying to make a genuine sequel with new Godzilla monsters, then, then why did they add everything else? Maybe it was some kind of art experiment, some group project made by a bunch of really talented and crazy people and they somehow lost the cartridge somehow. Or maybe they intended for some random person to find it. Hmm. It, it was all just fruitless guessing. As far as I could tell, there was only one way to figure out what 
the deal was with this game to play it through to the end maybe just maybe there was something there would be something in those credits an explanation by the creators as to why they made this or it could be something much more cryptic or strange maybe even something horrifying before i got a good look at the dimension dementia board i considered replaying trance to see if the red monster would look at me again but i decided against it i wanted to keep moving forward i was also somewhat worried that backtracking might cause the game to become even more strange the dementia board music sounded a lot like the Saturn music, except it was slowed down and played with a piano sounding instrument. Like most of these new maps, it had a dangerous, sus suspenseful feel. Um, while listening to the music, I looked at the dementia board. There were four new boss mo boss monsters this time. Or there were four boss monsters this time. Space Godzilla, Manda, Gigan, and Baragon. I was surprised that there were two new Toho monsters this time, but the best surprise was still to come. I started the quiz level. Here's another list of results in the same format as the last one. Quiz two. Question one. Can you swim? Answer, yes. Reaction, happy. Question two. Do you like fish? Answer, yes. Reaction, sick. Question three. Can plant penguins fly? Answer, no. Reaction, sad. Question four. Can it spin in all directions? There was no clarification of what face meant by it, so I just guessed. Answer, no. Reaction, surprised. Question five, do you breathe oxygen? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number eight. Question six, does it taste good when you bite a woman? I don't know who came up with this question, but I really hope they're getting mental help. Answer, no. Reaction, annoyed. Is it question seven? Is it night where you are? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number six. Question eight. Do you like cats? Answer, yes. Reaction, confused. Question nine, is water wet? Answer, yes. Reaction, angry. Question 10, have you ever broken a bone? Answer, no. Reaction, happy. Question 11, do you like your job? Answer, yes. Reaction, hurt. Question 12, would you like a new monster? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face 11. I wasn't entirely sure at the time what face meant by new 
monster, but I couldn't resist answering yes just to see what would happen. The result was mind-blowing. The game took me back to the board, and I had a new playable monster in the form of Angiris. Ever since I was a kid, I, I always wanted to play Angiris, since he was my second favorite Godzilla monster, and plus I never liked Mothra all that much. I moved my new Angiris piece over to the left right next to it, eager to test out my new monster. Before I get into the level description, I'll talk about Angiris a bit. Usually, using the up and down buttons, you could choose whether Angira stood in a bipedal stance or in a cr or crawled on all fours. It wasn't a huge difference, but being able to stand was helpful in boss fights, and crawling sometimes helped dodge obstacles and attacks. He could punch and kick like Godzilla, but no tail whip. Instead, he had something far more interesting. The ability to curl in up into a spiked ball of death and roll forward. You could still take damage, but it was lessened. It was a good way of clearing out stage enemies, but unfortunately, doing this also drained the power bar. But the spike ball wasn't his only special ability. When you press start, he would fire a beam of energy from his mouth. It resembled Titanosaurus's sonar attack, and if this were a hack, it may have been inspired by the roar attack from Atari's Godzilla fighting game. Uh, series. Also of note is that when playing Godzilla, the level meter glitched up. Uh, judging by the life and power bar, I'd say he's on level 10. Now on to the level. As you might have guessed from the level icon, these levels are green palette swaps of the ground and background titles from the Blue Mountains. But what immediately caught my attention was the water, which had a transparency effect. Was, was that even possible for an NES game? I know the Super Nintendo could do it, but I had never seen a transparency effect in a game on the NES. The Green Mountain music was played with the same instrument as the Blue Mountains, but the melody was totally different. It was a very simple song with a lot of abrupt pauses, followed by a loud noise, a loud note every few seconds. Anyway, I went through the usual strolling through the level. And again, there were no monsters or anything. But pretty soon, I had reached a cliff above the water. There was nowhere to go but into the water, so down I went. The water transparency made things a bit harder to see. But it's tolerable. After going underwater, I encountered two new enemies. A giant piranha and some kind of spiky bottom feeder thing. I liked the piranha because it, I could easily tell what it was. It was the same enemy design that would appear in a real game. Um, and there were very few enemies like this. They didn't take much hits to kill, but they were quite annoying and considerably trim down and would cons considerably trim down your life if you let, if they got close enough. They also tend to travel in packs. As for the bottom feeders, they're easy to deal with. They swim along the bottom of the screen towards you and are easily crushed with the roll attack or jumped over. In the screen cap, you can see me about to run one of them over, and there's a pack of piranhas behind it. After I beat that level, I moved Godzilla onto the blue castle icon. I started did the level, and I got a title screen with the text, Unforgiving Cold.
the level itself looked like a castle dungeon made of blue bricks with rows of identical white statue faces on the walls. These statue faces had a prominent look of horror on their faces. There was also some gray, flickering gray static, which didn't really obscure my vision, but it adds to the very unsettling mood of these levels. The music was 12 second loop of a low pitched choir vocalizing. That sounded very familiar to me. Whenever I played through one of these levels, I got this, this sudden, horrible feeling of anxiety. And the feeling that the farther I progressed through the level, the closer I was getting to something unspeakably evil. There weren't any enemies, but there was... These were some of the longest levels in the game. I only played one level, but it took seven minutes to complete. I didn't want to admit it to myself at the time, but I realized something playing the Blue Castle level. This game... This... Game has the power to make the player feel certain things. And I don't mean in the sense that you get irritated crap playing a crappy game or get unnerved by something scary in a game. What I mean is that certain events in this game can instantly make you start feeling something. I know that sounds completely insane. I don't blame you for not believing me. I wouldn't believe any of this either if I didn't play the game myself, but this is something very, there is something very, very wrong with this game, and I still don't know how to explain it. Then it was time to fight Baragon's replacement. Although Baragon was originally the smallest monster in the game, his replacement was the largest. It was so tall, in fact, that the ground was noticeably lowered and not Baragon's head was still barely avoided collision with the bar at the top of the screen. And it was frighteningly bizarre, as he was huge. You may be wondering how he attacks without arms. Well, he has the most powerful kick in the game, but his other fighting technique is much stranger. First, he blasts a cloudy breath of pixels at you, which cause you to freeze. Then he walks back to the right corner of the screen and extends a huge Gatling gun from his abdomen. This might seem amusing to you, but it certainly wasn't to me when I was playing the game. This attack is almost as annoying as Gagan saw, and not Baragon could have been unbeatable if he consistently used that. Thankfully, he only did it twice while fighting him. Once you unfreeze, you can run up and start take, damaging the gun, which does extra damage to him. This helped me to destroy him. And then it was time to play the third level. And I decided that I was going to use Anguirus and fight Manda and Gaigan and fight Space Godzilla with Godzilla. It was only fitting. Before getting into the battles, I'd I'll describe a third level type, the Arctic. The Arctic is exactly what you'd guess from the name, an icy tundra with few watery segments. Mm -hmm. 
the music reminded me a bit of Northern Hemispheres from Donkey Kong Country in 8-bit form. A very dangerous sounding song. It made me think of being trapped in the tundra and freezing to death. There were two new enemies in this stage. The first was a creature, frozen, and a block of ice. They block your way, and so you have to use your heat beam to follow them out of the ice. They look a bit like a smaller version of not Giza Road, only without the eye. When freed, they do a strange calling movement and push you backwards. It doesn't cause any damage, but it is a bit annoying. After dealing with the ice man, I kept walking for a minute or two and came upon a water segment. I jumped in and after, and this time I managed to get a screen cap of how the water splashes when you jump in it. Don't know how they program that, but it's pretty impressive. Another interesting thing is how the screen changes focus when you go underwater. Here, you can see the other new enemy, a little thing I like to call Spike Walker. They walk towards you and explode randomly or instantly if you attack them, sending spikes in every direction. These spikes don't do that much damage, but they did get me dangerously close to falling in a pit a few times. Oh, speaking of the pits down in the water, the game has a platformer element, bottomless pits. There weren't any of these in the original game, and it was strictly, since it was strictly an action game game, but the pits were a neat addition. After getting back on land, I encountered a very unexpected mini-boss, Maguma, the walrus kaiju. I know this game has some obscure monsters to begin with, but wow. Not that I'm complaining, it's pretty cool to it's a pretty cool camo you owe from an underappreciated kaiju. Maguma's fighting tactics were very simple. He had a freeze beam and he could charge at you. Not very mm, challenging, but certainly more entertaining than the Matango mini boss in the original game. One really interesting thing is that about Maguma is that he doesn't die when you defeat him. He turns tail and retreats. This was the first time I'd ever seen it. an enemy monster change direction, let alone retreat. I tried to chase after him, but he disappeared after I got into the water. Poor bastard. And that does it for the Arctic. Um, I'll talk about the Manda fight next. I forgot to mention before, but the music that played during the new monster fights is reused from themes actually in the game. So far, the themes have been as follows. Titanosaurus, Gizra's music. Biolanti, Hedera's music. Orga, Baragon, Magero's music. Mando, Varan's music. Space Godzilla, Mechagodzilla's music. As for the fight, Manda was a fairly crafty opponent. When he realized his one tactic was ineffective, he would immediately change to another one. Manda had quite a few tricks like spitting fire, biting, and most irritating, the most irritating of all, constricting. It doesn't mercilessly drain your life like Gigant's Cutter, but it was by far Manda's strongest attack. One last thing to note that I found pretty cool was that the Atric Gon showed up during the fight to help me out. Manda crushed you with ease, but it was still cool. After I slayed Manda, I played through the Arctic level for health power-ups, and then I was on to Gigan's replacement. When the fight started, I was very confused because there was nothing there. I, I thought this was going to be a, 
the Titanosaurus fight on Pathos, but then just about that time, it would have been going back to the map, a piranha appeared on screen. But it wasn't there for long. As soon as it appeared, the speakers emitted an ear-splitting screech, and not Gigan flew in and ripped the poor fish to pieces. Well, that's one way to get the player on their toes. That abrupt entrance scared the hell out of me, and I got my it got my adrenaline rushing, which, in retrospect, was a good thing because not Gigan was one of the fastest, most unrelenting opponents in the game. Not Gigan was tough, but my new skills with Angiris helped me score, even the score. It was still an incredibly intense fight. Not Gigan's attacks consisted of some kind of blood laser he spews from his mouth and a downward splash. Uh, slash. I was expecting some hellish variant of the buzzsaw attack, but thankfully there didn't seem to be one. The howl was invaluable in defeating him. I would have taken more screen caps of the fight, but it really it was really hard to concentrate. After that, there was just one monster left to take down. Space Godzilla. As I mentioned earlier, I used Godzilla in their fight. Space Godzilla's fighting technique was rather frustrating, but admittedly a very clever idea. Space Godzilla would use his energy to create two flying crystals, which would reach the ground and become crystal spires. Now, these spires not only block you from reaching Space Godzilla, but it also allowed him to constantly recharge to full energy and blast you with deadly charged Corona Beam until it broke the spires. Space Godzilla would eventually drain his own spires of energy until they shattered. And if you waited for that to happen, you'll probably lose a lot of life. Heat beams actually seem to re-energize the sprites, so you had to physical, use physical attacks. When you finally got close enough to hit Space Godzilla, he was no pushover. When I punched him, he hit me back just as hard. Space Godzilla does everything in his power to knock you back to the left corner of the screen so where he can so he can create more spikes. By the time this was over, I had only had five bars left, but it didn't matter because I didn't need to fight anyone. I needed to run. Here we go again. Ugh. I decided that right then that I really wanted to see this, to see the end of this game. As terrifying as these levels could be, I had to beat them to get through. I decided that no matter what happened, no matter what this game showed me, I was going to get to the end and also make sure not to say a damn word while playing a chase level from here on. <sighs> For this chase, I tried out Angiris since his roll attack allowed me to move faster than Godzilla and or Mothra. The chase started off like the first two, except there was a river of blood below the ground. I was beginning to get the hang of it and the extra speed from the Roll helped me get an edge on the red monster, especially since I didn't have to worry about a power limit that you keep rolling. It could keep rolling endlessly. Like the previous levels with water, the ground inevitably reached a stop, so I rolled off into the blood. To my surprise, the hell beast didn't follow me. It just stopped at the edge and grimaced. I guess I can't swim, I thought to myself. So I went under blood and continued moving. There wasn't anything else around, but I knew something. 
I knew something was up. The, the chase wasn't going to end that easily, could it? Surely something had to show up. And, and sure enough, I heard that bell roar sounding slightly different. And the monster was following me in a new aquatic body. I had no idea it was a shapeshifter. After it reappeared, the chase started to get into the difficulty I had expected. Being submerged slowed me down, putting me and the beast at about the same speed. The only thing that would have kept me alive was fast thinking and reflexes. I encountered some bottomless pits which, in which mines are floated up from. I assumed that if you hit one, it would damage you and knock you back. Considering how fast the red monster swims, hitting the mines would be an instant death. So I went through great effort to avoid them. But it wasn't all I had to be wary of. Halfway through the chase, the Hell Beast revealed yet another surprise. A tentacle formed of intestine and tipped with a clawed set of jaws burst from its mouth, trying to pull me in and devour me. Yeah. I only barely avoided the tentacle and the mines, but I could tell that the beast was getting desperate. But the chase was nearly over. And about a minute later, I had spotted a bit of ground that served as the exit. I leapt with all the might I could muster without breaking my controller. The beast screamed with rage and jumped out of the blood river in one last attempt to drag me down. But I escaped its grasp this time. I fell back on my bed and took a deep breath. Satisfied with another successful escape. Now I was headed for the fifth world. Entropy. Chapter 5. Entropy. Part 1. In the original game, the sixth world was Pluto. Ironically, despite being the smallest planet, Pluto was the largest and most diverse world in the game. Entropy had a different layout, but was similarly huge and diverse. The board music was played by a violin instrument. A melody that started out sounding mournful and then it gets rather, I guess I would call it distorted. It made me feel depressed and unnerved. Not something I would want to hear while trying to sleep. Strangely, none of the levels from the previous world were present here. Instead, there were eight brand new icons. The bosses this time were Megalon, Batra, and Mechagodzilla. As usual, the first thing I did was go out, was go to the quiz level for another interrogation from Face. But when I got there, I noticed something different. Instead of the usual goofy Ghidra music, it was the password theme. The music changed seemed to be inter uh, intentional because after the first two questions, at the start, the quiz started to take on a darker tone. Quiz 3. Question 1. Do you like ice cream? Answer. Yes. Reaction. Weird face number 1. Question 2. Do you like clowns? Answer. Yes. Reaction. Weird face number 10. Question 3. Is time slipping through your finger? Answer. Yes. Reaction. Weird face number 2. Question four. Do you have any regrets? Answer. Yes. Reaction. 
hurt. Question 5. Do some people deserve to die? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face 3. Question 6. Is it safe to go out at night? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number 5. Question 7. Do you find it hard to sleep at night? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number nine. Question eight. Have you killed, ever killed anyone? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number seven. Question nine. Do you want to kill anyone? Answer, no. Reaction. Angry. Question 10. Are you actually accomplishing anything? Answer. No. Reaction. Weird face number 4. Question 11. Does life have any real meaning? Answer. No. Reaction. Love. Question 12. Do you like Mothra? Answer, no. Reaction, maniacal. I knew the last one was going to be a gameplay-related question, but I had no idea what the results would be. I answered honestly because, as I said I, before, I never liked Mothra. Nobody liked playing as Mothra in the game. There was a good reason for that. Every other time Mothra gets hit, she gets slammed back to the left corner of the screen, and she sucks at fighting because her attacks are so weak. The only benefit Mothra had was being able to fly over obstacles in some levels. So I answered no, and Face actually replied back to me, not only with that maniacal expression, but with text. Too bad. I was taken back to the map screen, and I was shocked to see that Godzilla and, Gang and Anguirus had disappeared from the board, leaving only Mothra. Face had just fucked me over. N needless to say, I was pissed. But there wasn't anything I could do. And I'm willing to bet that even if I had said yes, I would have been stuck with Mothra anyway. Face giveth and face taketh away. I took a deep breath and got ready to explore. There were two paths I could take through the board. I decided to take the lower one. This turned out to be a good choice for reasons I'll get into momentarily. The first world ahead of me was a, for was a forest. So I started there. Almost immediately, I got an eerie feeling. There was something about this level that just seemed off to me, even more than the previous ones. Perhaps it was the pitch black background. I've always been afraid of being in the forest at night. Something about all those trees makes me feel surrounded and vulnerable. And the fact that I was stuck as Mothra didn't help. Playing the game's previous worlds as Godzilla gave me a feeling of bravery. Being in control of the king of mo the monsters. I'd, been able to I'd be able to handle just about anything in my way. But it's not like that with Mothra. No feeling of strength or security. Now I'm just a weak, overly, e easily overwhelmed bug traversing into the unknown. Back to the level. The music had new instruments, sounding like woodwinds, followed by slow rhythmic drums and chiming bells. Gave me the feeling that I was intruding into some dangerous place I really should not be. 
after a while, I encountered the first enemies of the stage. Or at least, I assumed they were enemies. They were strange, long-legged deer creatures. Instead of attacking, they just they were just idly waiting around. I went to approach them, and they ran away. I thought about shooting one with an eye beam to see what would happen, but it seemed wrong. These creatures were harmless. So I passed over them and continued through the level. About halfway through, I encountered a group, groups of the deer-like animals, and also two new creatures, a sloth-like creature with a beak climbing on a tree, and hairy raptor-esque beasts that were preying on the deer. It was very surreal watching these creatures interact. I didn't feel like I was playing a video game, but rather that I was traversing, traveling a world through a forest in some other dimension. The creatures ignored me for the most part, although the raptors did attack me when I got too close or if I attacked them first. I know I shot one of them to help one of the deer creatures escape. I got clawed at, but confrontation was easily avoided by flying up to the top of the screen. After that, I had to choose whether I wanted to play the levels with the hourglass glass, or the TV screen. I picked the latter. What I got was not at all what I expected. When I pressed the button to start the level on the TV screen like I normally would, this screen with an animation popped up. There was also music in the background, which was the goofy Ghidorah music that used to be playing in the quiz levels. I was somewhat unsettled by this because it was just so strange. I also found it a bit spooky because I had a shirt that looked just like that when I was a kid. After starting the animation, you could, you could go back to the board by pressing any button. After that, I had no... I had no idea what to expect of the rest of these icons. I went to try an hourglass icon next. I was somewhat relieved when an actual level came up. It was certainly an unorthodox looking level, all brown with time measuring instruments floating in the air and gigantic grandfather clocks in the background. The music was the same as the board screen. And very early in the level, I encountered something else I didn't expect to see. Original enemies from the game. And not just that, it seemed to be a whole fleet of them. And the yellow tanks, which were normally immobile, could now move. I took some damage, but it was nothing I couldn't handle. But the most interesting thing about this was the colored hourglass items. There were three of them. One, a blue hourglass that made time slow down and filled the level with enemies from the past. Two, a red hourglass that made time speed up and filled the level with enemies from the future. Three, a green hourglass that set time to normal speed and filled the level with the original game enemies. I encountered the blue hourglass first. As stated, the game started to slow down. And I saw the enemies from the past, which were five different types of prehistoric animals. I don't know much about prehistory, but I believe all of these enemies represent real animals. The level went into another segment, and I encountered the green hourglass. And then I thought, 
the original enemies again. It was the same five types, so I didn't take any screenshots. But in the last segment, I encountered the Red Hourglass and the enemies that must have been from the future. Now, whether or not the game was showing me an 8-bit eight, eight renditions of creatures that will actually exist thousands of years into Earth's future, I have no idea. But with that thought in mind, I found this particular segment to be very eerie, and it was made more tense because everything moved faster. One of the future enemies bore a striking resemblance to something I saw in a book once called a Troodon Man. Another looked like some quarter, kind of organic spaceship. There was only one of the fifth type of future creature, and when it appeared, all the others ran for their lives, leaving me alone to battle it. It could fly, but its sprite didn't actually move, and its single attack was firing a lightning bolt from its face. Even so, it was surprisingly powerful, and I suppose it could be considered a mini-boss. After defeating it, it left a health power-up that restored energy, the health and energy I had lost fighting it, which was convenient. It seemed that I would need all the help I could get to beat this world with Mothra alone. After that previous stage, I call Time Warp. The next stage appeared to be in a toxic waste dump. As you can see, the place looked grungy and inhospitable. The music was a short looping of an ambient synthesizer song. Listening to it made me feel like I had just sniffed some toxic fumes myself, and it was messing with my head the whole time. I even felt like I was choking while playing the level. The enemies all seemed to be mutated to some degree. In the above screenshot, you can see green mummies with bird skulls and that jump out of the waist and spit projectiles. There's also a brownish cow skeleton a monster with spider legs. Halfway through the level, I even saw one of the deer in the forest. It was alone, and when I saw it, it was drinking toxic waste out of a barrel with an anteater-like tongue. I was moving over to try to make it stop, but then the flock, this flock of skull birds came out of nowhere and started attacking. The deer was scared by this and ended up running off the ground into the toxic waste. I felt bad for it. One of the birds bit me, but I regained health quick from killing all of them. They were rather weak. Pressed onward. Of all the levels in Entropy, this was probably the most normal in that there were little de there was little deviance from the move forward smash things formula of the original gang. I encountered more creatures through the level, like tentacled blobs and some kind of deformed thing with human-like teeth. I didn't feel like provoking them into a fight, so I kept on flying it near to the top of the screen. I still had to deal with the occasional flock of birds now and then. At the end of that level, was a large, bluish-green lake. And there I encountered another mini-boss. Some kind of monster with a long neck and a whale skull. It attacks with a mouth projectile and by charging at you. 
It could also go underneath the water and rapidly emerge from a different place. It was harder to beat than the boss for the time warp. And it had a lot of health, because it must have taken me three minutes to defeat it. It let out a really loud noise when it died, and then sank back into the water as I left the screen. Back on board, back on the board, I went to the nearest icon that I hadn't seen yet, which was a white tree. As I guessed, the level was a winter-themed recolor of the forest stage. But unlike the regular forest, I didn't feel unnerved staring, starting this one. I think the music had a lot to do with it. It was a gentle, calm song. It almost sounded romantic. It was quite stress relieving and the forest itself looked much less ominous covered in snow. I traveled through the first segment, enjoying the atmosphere for four minutes. And then suddenly I realized something. I hadn't seen a single creature since I started the level. Where were all the animals? Soon after I left the screen and the next segment started. In the second segment, I was still in the winter forest, but now the music was gone. I started to feel suspicious, but then I reminded myself that there were other empty levels in the game, and this was likely one of the, another one of those. But then, I heard something familiar. It was the 12 second loop, looping music, from Unforgiving Cold starting up. I could feel my heart sink as I came across this horrible sight. It was a whole group of dead deer creatures, covered in snow. Judging from the blackish blue tone of their skin, they must have all frozen to death. On closer inspection, some were missing body parts. Now I was frightened, but I still had to keep going. Before exiting the level, I was really hoping to see something resembling the previous forest animals in a living state. And sure enough, I did. It was a creature much like the beaked sloth, except this thing had white fur and was more of a beaked gorilla. It was walking very slowly when I saw it, but I was happy to see something alive. However, it didn't stay that way for long. A pack of raptors who must have sensed that something else was alive came rushing in from the right side of the scream. The beaked gorilla didn't stand a chance as one of the raptors immediately lunged at it and ripped open its back legs. These winter raptors acted far more different from their temperate relatives. While the other raptors only attacked while hunting prey or when provoked, the winter raptors seem to have gone all gone insane. They attacked everything on sight. One was running back and forth, clawing at nothing. Even the noises they made sounded different, more high-pitched, and enraged. 
as I left the second segment, I even saw two raptors fighting to death. They were both covered in injuries, and one of the raptors had been blinded in one eye. I took a screenshot, but I didn't say to see who won the fight. I only had to get through one more segment before I could go back to the board screen. But in this segment, I was no longer in the winter forest, because, but instead a very empty grassy plain with a bright gray moon in the sky. The pleasant music of Winter Forest Part 1 had returned. And immediately, I started to feel dread. This is going to sound crazy, but it's the absolute truth. This game made... The game made this level from one of my memories. After a long stretch of nothing, I reached a lake. And then the moon moved down from the sky and began to hatch like an egg. When it did, a curled up humanoid figure fell into the lake as the moon halves quickly disintegrated. I heard a splash when it hit the water and then a moment of silence. And the screen began to shake. And a new creature emerged from the water. And thus I was introduced to a monster I call the Moon Beast. This was the only screenshot I took as I was focusing all my concentration on winning the fight. And it was the most difficult fight yet. Stronger than any of the previous bosses. This creature would have been hard to take down with Godzilla. And with Mothra, it seemed nearly impossible. I suppose I would consider myself fortunate that the beast lacked any of any attacks like Gigan saw, but because if it had, I would never have won this. I barely had three bars of health when I finally killed the of this abomination. But what happened afterward is hardly what I would call a reward. I've been trying to keep my promise and suppress this memory for years, but it seems that as if I have to get it off my chest. Uh, this is a very painful memory for me, but the game already knows about it, and I, I think you should too. I'll just tell you the important parts, because I don't like bringing this experience back into my head unless I have to. Back when I was in middle school, I had a girlfriend named Melissa. She suffered from some kind of mental disorder that caused her to go into episodes. When she was in an episode, she would stand or sit perfectly straight or still, and her face would instantly lose any expressions that she had before. She would speak very clearly, without any hint of emotion. When it was over, she would start trembling and sometimes bury her face in her hands and remain silent for several minutes. I can't really convey the feeling it gave me in words, and I won't try. You had to see this in person to understand. But despite this, she was a very kind person, and I cared about her dearly. We liked to hang out in the field at night and look at the stars. <laughs> but one night, she didn't say anything to me at all. She just 
stared directly into the moon, trembling. I tried to talk to her, but she suddenly sprang, sprung up and ran right into traffic. I, I tried to stop her, but it was too late. She got hit by a truck and was killed that night. I looked right into her eyes when the wheels went over her neck. That sight has always haunted me. I know that the game knows about this because After I defeated the Moon Beast, this happened. Chapter 5 Entropy, Part 2. After that. Screen. It was all I could do not to burst out screaming, and my hands were shaking so bad. I could barely hold my, the controller. I knew the game was going to test me if I kept playing, but I had no idea it would go so far, or that it was even capable of doing what it just did. I could feel my brain going haywire as I asked myself, did the, did the game just read my mind? That didn't seem possible, but what ex other explanation was there? It was then that I could no longer deny now what now seemed obvious. The game is alive. And not only that, it, it all it it also can establish some kind of mental connection with the player. To stop playing. I don't know if it was the game messing with my mind or just my stubborn curiosity, but even with the previous revelation, I really wanted to see this through to the end. Even more than I did before I beat Dementia. Terrifying as it may be, even dangerous, I knew that if I quit playing, I would never be able to stop thinking about it. If I tried to restart the game, it might go back to normal again. How many people ever got to witness something like this firsthand, let alone be able to take screenshots of the whole thing? Fucked up as it was, this was an experience of a lifetime. But even so, I couldn't take any chances with my health. I had the TV remote right next to me, ready to turn off the TV in case I felt I was in actual danger. And if that didn't work, I would plug it. I would pull the plug out of the wall and just run out of the room. Surely that would be enough. Whatever powers the game has, it seemed to be confined to what it can show on the TV and whatever its mental connection could do. The latter was what worried me. I, I still didn't know what I was dealing with, so I wasn't about to underestimate it. I took a break for a few minutes to calm my nerves. And then it was back to the game. And speaking of TVs, uh, there was a TV screen icon right below the white forest I had just left. And because the first animation was so bizarre, I figured I'd try another to see what happens. Although I expected the same animation, I actually got a totally different one. 
weird. The music for this one was the Neptune board music. Fitting, I suppose, since it's a fish man and all. I can't help but wonder what the point of all these things are. There was one more TV screen icon, so I figured it must have had have a unique animation on it of its own. I was going to make sure to see what it was before I left Entropy. Then it was time for another level. The gold brick icon was the closest thing, so I went to that and I started up a gold labyrinth level. My health and power were refilled. refilled. Not sure how or why, but I was glad not to be heading into the unknown nearly dead. I also noticed that my Mothra sprite had shrunk to half its original size. The music was slow. It was a slow, ominous beat. With female voice vocals kicking in about a minute into it. Quite haunting. The gold labyrinth itself was an anomaly. I'm not sure how this level would have played out if I was using Godzilla or Anguirus. This flying seemed necessary just to get around this place. Another thing that caught my attention was that when you go left, your monster actually turns and faces to the left. This sounds stupidly obvious, but in the original game, you were only supposed to move to the right, so when you tried to move to the left, your monster ended up walking or flying backwards. This level was apparently gigantic in size because every time I thought I had reached to the end of it or thought I was going to end up back where I started, I encountered something totally new, like lava blockades, new enemies, and statue faces. And when I, and I found one statue face at a dead end with a wide, open-eyed stare. The night Melissa died, she had an expression on her face that looked exactly like this the whole time. Even when she got hit by the truck, she she still had that same expression. I can't help but feel like something really is staring at me from behind the screen when I look at this. I really didn't want to be reminded of that night anymore, so I left the statue almost as soon as I found it. I needed to find an exit, the exit anyway, which proved to be no simple task. It felt like this level stretched on forever in all directions. I must have wandered around the level for at least 15 minutes before I finally saw something. It was a creature that wasn't gold. Seemingly the only one of its kind in the level, lacking any kind of hover ability like the other creatures. It just walked him back for it just walked back and forth on the platform. But it wasn't long after I found it that a flying machine swooped down and grabbed it. And then flew off with it. The machine apparently had not seen me, so I decided to follow it to see where it was taking the creature. The machine stopped at a room with a large cauldron-like object in the center. The machine hovered over to the cauldron and dropped the creature into it. The 
the creature came, emerged from a hole in the cauldron's side, now adorned in the same gold color as everything else. The machine flew off. I'm not really sure what to make of all this, but I'm glad I claim, came upon it because I found the exit soon after. When I got back to the board, I realized that the bosses hadn't moved at all. A bit odd, but it didn't bother me. It made plan planning my route through Entropy easier. There were still two new icons to explore. The Indigo Cliffs and the Black version of the Labyrinth. Since there were only three labyrinth icons, which were surrounded by bosses, I played the indigo kip cliffs first. It was a lot of the blue-green mountains. The level graphics had the same shredded look to it. There's also a, malt, a recolor of the clouds and moon from the to toxic waste dump. The music, if you can call it that, was merely a deep rumbling noise. One of the few things I encountered were these multicolored creatures with big heads emerging from a small cave in the ground. They all made a synchronized shaking sound as they, and they walked to the right in a group after emerging from the cave, ignoring me. Having no other way to go, I followed them through the through. I, fo I followed them on their route. More and more emerged from the cave until the group had about a hundred creatures. Eventually, the pathway ended in a cliff. I was shocked to see that upon reaching the cliff, all the creatures began jumping off into the abyss. I've seen enemies walk off cliffs before, but, but I've never seen NPCs commit mass suicide like this. Very unsettling way to start off a level. I continued on, flying over the various strange animals like the one shown here. Another group of multicolored bobbleheads was jumping up and down only to be snatched up by large birds, which I'm fairly certain are sprite versions of the giant condor from Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. I've defeated some of the condors in battle, but it bothered me that these bobbleheads seem to be so eager to die. If the game itself is alive, perhaps the creatures in these levels are also alive. And some have very unhappy lives if this behavior is any indication. But what provokes them to do this? In the back of my mind, I'm almost suspect that the glowing moon in the sky is the reason. At the end of the level, I saw yet another group of bobbleheads marching up to a large monster and being devoured. This was starting to disgust me, so acting on impulse, I fired off eye beams at both the monster and the bobbleheads. I destroyed the cave. The monster became angry and ran through the remaining bobbleheads to fight me. Although it lacked any ranged attacks, 
It was relentless. But it was no match for me. I was in the home stretch now. Up to the bosses. My plan was to go through Batra first, then Megalon, and after that, I would watch the last TV screen, play the Black Labyrinth before fighting Mechagodzilla, and lastly, go through the chase with the Hell Beast. I was curious to see if it would be in a new form again. But first things first, time to beat up Batra. As I expected, he started off in his larva form. The music was Varan's battle theme. Whenever the game puts in a new Godzilla kaiju with one form or another, that other form always shows up. For a game that's otherwise inexplicable, it's rather startling in its consistency and accuracy with the new kaiju bosses. The fight started off simple. Larval ba Larva Batra fought in a similar fashion as Magu Maguma did, charging back and forth and occasionally firing lightning with its horn. During the fight, I noticed that Matra's combative abilities have been altered in my favor. One, the eye beams did twice as much damage as they did originally. Now they were as strong as Godzilla's punches. The poison power was, powder was similarly improved. It also did this nice thing where it would actually hit an enemy when you used it. In the original game, even though Mothra could fly, she was unable to fly over an opponent. You would get knocked back the same way uh, as if you just ran into them, which was extremely annoying. But not anymore. I could change direction and fly around, which was a big help because fighting Imago Bat Batra was much like fighting a clone Mothra, but although Batra is distinctly faster and stronger, no longer impeded by its slow moving larva form, Imago Batra was a fearsome opponent. Although it lacked the horn lightning, it now had a new, more powerful eye beam. Batra could change direction just like I could. So this battle involved a lot of flipping and flying around. It was pretty damn fun, to be honest. So after defeating Batra, I was excited to see what Megalon would be like. But first, I went through an Indigo Cliffs level and shot through a lot of creatures for the health power-ups. So, about Megalon. His music was Gigan's theme. Makes sense, since Gigan was his battle partner in Megalon's one and only film appearance. He was a lot like Mogera, but faster and with more weapons. He starts out by charging off with his drills. I like to fly back and forth around him, which seemed to really annoy him. After a few seconds, he stepped back, turned around, and started spitting out grenades. Those were a pain because they bounce off. Because they bounce when they hit the ground. Lastly, he started spamming his lightning beam. It only went straight forward, so it was easy to duck under and then shoot him with his eye beams. With eye beams. Overall, I'd describe him as strong, persistent, but dumb. I was now nearing the end of Entropy. I had just taken down Megalon. And I started up the last TV screen to see what I'd get this time. The result was unpleasant.
the music for this gruesome scene was the password theme. Couldn't figure out why this animation was so sinister and violent in comparison to the other two. This whole game seemed to be growing more malevolent. As I went on to finish Entropy, I began to feel drained. It's hard to describe. Like I had suddenly become tired when I wasn't before. Most likely it was just the tension from all that had, that had happened in the game getting to me, but who knows. The last level type on Entropy is what I call the Shadow Labyrinth. The scenery was recorded from gold to black, recolored from gold to black. The music was an um, evil ambiance similar to the unforgiving cold loop, but distinctly different. The music was my first sign that this level was going to be distressing. I traveled through the maze for about a minute and I noticed there weren't any creatures hovering around. It was an odd transmission from transition from the gold labyrinth, which was overrun with creatures, to this level that had nothing at all. But then it might be a good thing. But then this might be a good thing. Maybe there would be wouldn't be any obstacles and I could get through this level with ease. Then the screen went dark. And almost and immediately I snapped out of my daze from a few seconds earlier. Everything had been darkened so that the only thing I could see was the Mothra sprite. I couldn't tell where I was going or I ended up frantically running into walls. I heard a noise, the sound of a crowd running through a hallway. And along with the running came the roars. Loud, roaring sounds which I would describe as something like a rabbit dog the size of an elephant screaming in fury. And I could tell that whatever was making this noise, there were lots of them. I knew there was something there, but I wasn't sure until I did some screen cap editing that I got to see what my pursuers looked like. But at this time, all I, I couldn't see where they were or where I was going. I was literally running blind and, and this mob of beasts eventually caught up with me. All I could think was no, as I saw my life bar rapidly declining. The monsters had taken me down to half of my total health when I was saved. The light came on and the attackers had disappeared. So the challenge to, of this level was revealed. Find an exit. Find the exit before the lights go out and a pack of monsters maul you to death. I was in panic mode now, moving as fast as I could go, while trying every path I could find for a way out. As I played through the level, the lights went out a total of three times. The second time I would have been dead in meat if I hadn't, if it had not been for the wide, one of the wide-eyed statues. As I stayed close to it, the monster seemed to avoid me. Until the light came out, came back. 
the statue warded them away somehow. I was safe as long as I stayed near the statue, but at the same time, I had to leave to find the exit. The Shadow Labyrinth turned out to be much smaller than the Gold Labyrinth, as it not only took six minutes, six minutes to navigate to the end, but before the exit, there was a row of halls leading straight down, with no way out once entered. You either got to go to the exit before the monsters reach you, or you died. Thankfully, I made it out. Only one more boss, Mechagodzilla. I started the battle and got something unexpected. Not only did my life shoot back up to 100% again, it seemed to do that randomly, but instead of a replacement boss, I was, I was fighting Godzilla. But any Godzilla fan worth their salt can figure this out. Mega Godzilla started off like fighting a clone Godzilla, but his disguise burned away after only two, only three life bars. Usually, a transformation only occurred at the halfway point. At this point, it was like fighting Mega Godzilla in the normal game. Felt kind of nice to fight one of the original game enemies for a change. Although he wasn't exactly normal, say he also had a rainbow beam and finger missiles. This prevented me from doing the old trick of backing him into a corner and hitting him with eye beams in a spot where he can't hit me, but that was always a cheek trick anyway. But after getting him down to half health, something weird started to happen. His sprite started to glitch in much the same way as Gizaru's had back at the first world. After a few seconds, the glitches began to form a new shape. And thus the game had created not Mecha Godzilla. And I discovered that his visual glitch was somehow related to the game recreating things. The human face on this one gives it a very uncanny look. It was on one of the stronger, stronger replacement monsters and had the most firepower. Pictured here is its mouth beam, which I almost got caught in the middle of. Which I got caught in the middle of. Even though it was a bit stronger, it was also slower than its original counterpart and couldn't jump around as much. I won the fight by constantly staying out of its line of fire, bombarding the machine with poison powder as it f flew over it. One last thing to do. The Hell Beast Chase. Oh boy, might as well get this over with, I thought. The entropy and chase ended up being exactly what I was afraid of it would be. A labyrinth level. All the other chases, although difficult, were extremely straightforward. You just had to run to the right and not get touched. But this took all the simplicity out of it. There was no telling how big so that this labyrinth would be or where the exit was. And now, not only did I have to constantly backtrack to find my way out, I also have to avoid getting one hit by the one hit killed by the red monster. And for those first 30 seconds, it didn't show up. But I knew it would. 
as I started picking up the pace, I heard a loud flapping noise. And there it was, in a flying form. It flew with bat-like wings and was as fast and relentless as ever. For reasons already stated, this was probably the most nerve-wracking of all the end chases. And as such, I had to keep my focus on the game and not taking screen caps. However, I did take one of the Red Monster doing something I found very interesting. I had managed to lose it by going through a different path than it apparently expected, and it was blocked from attacking me by one of the organic walls of the Red Labyrinth. Or so I thought. It tried clawing through the wall for a second before opening up its mouth and tearing the wall apart with the intestine jaw. But those brief milliseconds that the monster was held back might have been the key to finding the exit. The path to exit was long and complex. From what I remember when I went up and then back towards the left, I'm still not sure why I chose those particular ways. Just a lucky hunch, I guess. I suppose. I was sweating profusely, but my wor but my luck had saved me yet again. I had hoped that it wouldn't run out before I finished the game. There were only two more worlds to go. Next was the penultimate world, called Extus. Chapter 6, Extus. In the brief instant before the transition between entropy and Extus, I was hoping that I would get Godzilla and Anguirus back. As the board appeared, I saw that my wish was half granted. I had Godzilla back, but no Anguirus. I would have preferred both. But despite Anguirus's neat abilities, I would have chosen Godzilla if I had to pick between the two. Extus had two different color temples, white and pink. A white, a pyramid, what looked like some modern buildings, and two icons I couldn't figure out at the time. Their new bosses were Kumonga, Gorosaurus, and not Ghidorah who I was dreading to see, let alone fight. With Godzilla back, I was expected, I was excited, again, and eager to explore, yet still cautious. I went to the quiz level first, just as before. This time, Face's questions were more random than ever. Quiz four. Question one, do elephants breathe? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number two. Question two, have you ever been molested by a family member? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number six. Question three, have you ever raped anyone? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number eight. Question four, is green your favorite color? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number 10. Question five, is the computer the pinnacle of modern technology? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number four. Question six, are you a tough guy? 
Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number 12. Question seven, can you fly? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number nine. Question eight, can you stand on your head? Answer, yes. Reaction, weird face number seven. Question nine, do you hate raccoons? Answer, no. Reaction, confused. Question 10, do you feel blame? Answer, no. Reaction, weird face number 11. Question 11, would you like a new monster? Answer, yes. Reaction, surprised. Question 12, will you miss me? Answer, yes. Reaction, sad. I was happy that I was getting a new monster, but that last question bothered me. Will you miss me? Is face referring to when I finished the game, I thought? Since the revelation of the game was truly otherworldly nature, I wasn't sure what to think of face or anything else, but something about that last statement gave me a genuine feeling of sadness from face. As I was thinking about this, the game had gone back to the board. I had a new monster, but I had no idea what it was supposed to be. The sprite had a slight resemblance to Rodan, but the head was totally off. I moved this mysterious newcomer to a white temple icon and started the level. When I started the level, the screen appeared with the text, Find the Gem. Presumably instructions for beating the level. After that, I got my first look at my new playable monster. A hairy, dark blue creature with bat wings and a skull-like face named Solomon. And also, and I also found that my path was blocked by a beam of light and a small pillar with a plate on it. I figured that the beam of light was blocking the exit. So I have to find the gem to drop it on the plate to deactivate the beam. How exactly I was going to do that, I don't know. There wasn't anything in the original game requiring you to find an item to beat a level. I'd have to find out when I obtained the gem. The only direction I had to go was left, and so on I proceeded. So on I proceeded. Solomon was an interesting monster, to say the least. He was capable of both flight and a heat beam, both of which proved to be very useful. He could also kick and slash with his wings, but he couldn't duck. The White Temple's music was a vocalizing choir, or a video game approximation of such. It's hard to describe, but it had a very holy sound to it. It wasn't long before I started running into waves of strange new enemies. They did little to stop me. I ran past them while slashing and didn't take any damage. There was a pause behind each new wave of enemies. After you had killed about ten, there wouldn't be any for about a minute. Then the next wave would appear. After five minutes, I noticed holes in the floor and ceiling.
guillotine-mouthed creatures were rapidly flying up and down the crevices. So I had to time my jumps carefully because I didn't know if I'd get another shot at this. Luckily, I managed to get through without a scratch. I'm just lucky, I guess. After that, I found myself at the end of a hallway, facing some kind of mini-boss monster. It moved fast, and it had some projectile that it shot in four directions, but I killed it quite easily using Solomon's heat beam. When the battle was over, I had my gem, which was inside the creature's head. I found that I could pick up and hold the gem by walking over to it and holding down B. I made the long trek back to the start, deposited the gem on the plate, which deactivated the beam. I left the sage and was shown what was probably the strangest quirk relating to the Solomon monster. Every time you complete the stage, or defeat a boss with Solomon, this screen appears. I have no idea what still the best 1973 means. Neither did the date nor the phrase have any meaning or significance to me that I can think of, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. The next level I played was the one that I call Bronze Pyramids. I used Godzilla and found that he had been leveled up to 12 since I last played him in Dementia. The Bronze Pyramids were fairly normal as far as levels go, but the visuals were quite interesting. Almost unusually colorful and lively. The music had a fittingly Egyptian style to it. It was a slow and mysterious sounding. I strolled through the level fighting off various enemies and none were too difficult, although the ants could be a pain if you ran across, ran into too many at once. My favorite enemy was this giant reptile I encountered about halfway through. the end of the level, I came to a pyramid and I engaged in yet another mini-boss fight. Although this one was a bit different because I had to fight two of these monsters at the same time. Individually, I could have dealt with them easily, but fighting both of them at once was challenging but I sped things up by tricking one of the twin beasts into barbecuing his brother by jumping when he used the flame breath. After defeating the twin monsters, I noticed something strange after returning to the board. I was now able to move my monster piece anywhere on the board without limits. Normally, Godzilla could only move three spaces each turn, and Mothra could move five. I wanted to try out Solomon some more, so I moved his piece to one of the brown pillars, looking icons with colored dots, and started the level. When I got to the level, I then realized what the level icon represented. Totem poles. I was greeted by two of them right at the beginning. The music had a Native American sound to it. It seemed to be using the same instruments as, entropy, as the Entropy Forest. It was noticeably different, but just as foreboding. I walked around for three minutes with nothing else in sight besides the totem poles. I didn't realize it until then, but I was expecting another level of with nothing alive in it. 
after all the activity and entropy, walking around all those multicolored faces, this unnerving level hit me, left me feeling like I was being watched. Only about ten minutes after I started Extus, I was already halfway through. After getting back from the totem pole level, I tried out one of the TV screens to see how strange they were this time. Even more strange than before, apparently. The music for this was the Uranus theme. I switched back to Godzilla to play another level. This level was quite a surprise. It was a normal city level. The colors were gloomy, but even still, this was quite a shock. This was the kind of level I would expect to see in a Godzilla game, and I was kind of mad that I didn't get to play it earlier. The music was the Earth theme. I found it strange that a level fitting in a Godzilla game would show up this late. But there's no point crying over spilled milk. I suppose. I moved Solomon to a grayish green icon that which turned out to be a high tech lab laboratory of some sort. Lots of mechanical drones in this level. But Solomon cleared the through them just like the white temple enemies. The music was a gritty industrial beat. There was also a strange flying cyborg enemy, which was annoying because it would fly away when you jumped to attack it. Also of interest were these large stasis tanks holding some kind of monster inside. As you would guess, sometimes the monsters awaken and shatter through the glass. I tried to get past the stasis tanks as far as possible, but because the monsters inside proved to be vicious little bastards and upon release. At the end of the level was an elevator, which I used to go down to the bottom of the level where the exit was. Along the way, I was shot at by security drones. I couldn't leave my elevator, so my only defense was the heat beam. The last level type was this simple thing I called the heart temple for obvious reasons. Nothing but a big hallway filled with floating enemies like shaped like human hearts. They're incapable of causing you damage. So what you do is run through the level, smashing as many as you can to get all the power-ups. One run through these levels would get you would get the life meter back up to full and I would greatly appreciate these levels later the heart's temple music reminded me of a circus tune had an overly chill for sound to it which gave the level a really weird feeling Having seen all the level types, I chose to fight Gorosaurus using Solomon. The music for this fight was Gizaru's theme. It was during the fight that I realized that Solomon is overpowered. A single well-aimed slash can take down as many as four of the enemy's life bars. Due to this, the match was over very quickly. Gorosaurus had no projectile attacks, 
or anything else that can match Solomon's deadly claws. But I kept the fight going just long enough to see if Gorosaurus would use his iconic kangaroo kick. And I was greatly pleased when he did. Even though I knew Solomon, Solomon was my fighting ace, I used Godzilla to battle Kamonga just for variety. I briefly considered using Mothra, but of course Godzilla won out. Kamonga was also a simple opponent, no heat beams or anything. He attacks you by jumping on you, stabbing with his mandibles, and also using his signature webbing stream to paralyze you. Once you get webbed, Kamonga will sometimes take the opportunity to attack, but it's mostly just a way to buy some time, like Gizara backing you up to a corner until the time runs out, to the, into the corner until the time runs out. His music was Heatera's theme. With Gorosaurus and Kamonga defeated, I was at the end of Extus. Before I fought not Ghidorah, Ghidorah, there was something I had to do. I wasn't expecting much from it, but for documentation's sake, I took another look at, I took a look at the other TV screen. This is what it was. I, I. I don't think there ever was much reason behind the TV screens. If I were to guess, I'd say it's some random uncontrolled manifestation of the cartridge's abilities, or maybe all this makes perfect sense to the game. Who knows? Anyway, Mr. Fawcett's theme was the Saturn music. It was time for the opponent that I had been treading. Not Ghidorah. Although I'd gained courage with Solomon's combat advantages, I was still nervous. And when the fight started, I was immediately confused. My opponent was not Gizera. I defeated the imposter with a few strikes, and then not Magera appeared. Did it... Did it... It didn't make sense. In order to not to get in order to get to not not Ghidorah I had to battle the previous replacements first and battle them I did I tore my way through every single one of them until I finally made it to not Ghidorah who was a Dorad <laughs> once once I stopped laughing I destroyed him with only two slashes the music stopped and I thought I was going to go back to the board but the battle wasn't over yet the real fight was against the chimera a monstrous hybrid of all the replacement beasts this was by far the most difficult boss yet. Every attack of his would cut down whole life bars per use, while attacks against him were greatly weakened. Solomon Slash, for example, was now lucky to take away one half a bar life. During the battle, I gained a great appreciation for two things. The boss fight time limit, and the heart temple. Had it not been for those things, I might never have beaten this boss. Take down this behemoth, I came up with a strategy. I would switch between Godzilla and Solomon as one began to get dangerously low on health, I would take them through the heart temple while fighting Chimera with the other. I should count my blessings that Chimera couldn't regain lost health. A very interesting thing about Chimera was that the colored sections on his body corresponded to his different body parts. 
so each body part effectively had its own life meter the head was invincible as long as it was as the other parts were present and would always be the last part to be destroyed In addition to being difficult, it was the longest fight so far. I tried to rem to remember how many times I got taken out of the fight by this time, but I had lost count around 13. Eventually, I had destroyed all components but the head, which now flew around on its, uh, on its own with an incredible speed. Chimera fought well, but I was extremely determined and once he had reduced to a head, he was no longer the had the power to defeat Solomon. When I heat and I heat beam, beamed him into oblivion. And then the Chimera was no more. <sighs> I was exhausted after the fight. After that drawn out fight. And worried that might affect my performance in the and world chase level. The headquarters icon was replaced, but not by the hell beast face. Instead, it was a crucifix. I was completely stunned. I. I wasn't excited about seeing the Hellbeast icon again, but if there was one, only one good thing about these levels, that is that they were predictable. I had a basic idea of what to expect, but now, now here I was at the end, and the icon was completely different. What did it mean? And, and why a crucifix? It made me very uneasy. I attempted to start the level with Solomon, but couldn't. I got a no I got this notice that simply stated, Solomon can't enter here. It didn't say why, but it, I think it maybe it has to do with. Solomon's demonic appearance. Since Solomon was out of the question, I went with Godzilla instead. Once I saw the level, the crucifix made sense. The level was a graveyard. I was still on edge thinking that this was some kind of trick. The last level had always involved running from the demonic beast, but I wasn't going to be fooled into thinking this would be any different. So I started running, but after a minute without interruption, I, I slowed down. It was during this time that the music caught my attention. I knew it sounded familiar when I first heard it, but it took a while before I realized what it was. An 8-bit rendition of Prayer for Peace from the first Godzilla movie. A very sad, powerful song, even in this form. After two minutes into the level, I encountered something that I... I wasn't sure how to react to. My first instinct was to run, but this blue statue-esque being simply floated in place. And I felt just compelled to stare at it for a time. Since this was a grave and it was floating over a chapel, I 
I guess that this was some kind of angel watching over the deceased. It gave me a strange but warm feeling. I wouldn't say happy, but... But I felt that I was at peace somehow. I had never seen this thing before, and yet it seemed very familiar to me. Just as I was going to leave, the hell beast appeared. And its presence warped the music into a terrifying discordance, screeching, screeching, and transformed the level, desecrating the tombs as a new ground appeared, comprised of blood-soaked bodies. I could feel my heart now beating out of control. I had no chance to escape with a monster that close. He lunged in for the kill, but the angel got in the way. The demon started, roared, and started clawing through the angel's leg. Tears of blood streamed from its eyes. I wanted to save the angel, but there was nothing I could do. I had to honor its sacrifice and run. And so I ran through the hellish landscape as fast as I could. The beast soon caught up with me, still swallowing the body of the angel whose legs it had torn off. And this height made my terror change to anger. I found now found myself hating this horrible monster. There was no doubt in my mind that it was pure evil, and I wanted it to die. When I got to the end, I remember how I, respond, I responded to it how it responded to my insult and trance. I spoke to it and said, You're going to pay. This was its response. I had no idea. <laughs> no idea how I'd follow up to that threat. And nothing could have prepared me for the horrors of the final world. Zenith. Chapter 7. Zenith. And here we are at the final world. I don't like to discuss this part, and it still bothers me very much, but it's something I have to do so that I can put this behind me. People deserve to know. At this point, I was well aware of the game's unnatural nature, but Zenith was different than the other worlds. While the others were certainly strange and sometimes frightening, the world of Zenith was like a nightmare. And I didn't have to go any further than the board screen for an indication that something was wrong with Zenith. The first thing that I noticed was the blood red texture of the board and the music, which was an eerie whistling tune. I noticed that I had Solomon and Angiris back, and I felt better for a second. Then I scrolled over to the right to see who my next enemies would be this time. This time, it was Destroya and Ghidorah, Ghidorah. But judging from the icon, it was a different Ghidorah than the original, standing on the ground instead of flying. The grotesquely detailed pinkish red icon also caught my eye. I could tell what it was supposed to be, and I was afraid to find out. Going back to my side of the board, I decided that there 
wasn't much of a choice but to do my usual routine and going to the quiz level before doing anything else. I was not ready for what happened. I jumped back when this first appeared, accompanied by a terribly distorted vision of the password theme. It looked at this as if face had fallen victim to some terrible glitch. Is this what he meant? But will you miss me? Did he know this would happen? My thoughts were stopped short when I noticed the screen was glitching and seeming to fall apart while I was inactive. So I quickly rushed out. <sighs> and when I got back to the board, it, I somehow had a new monster. I, I hadn't even been asked if I wanted one. I, I tried to select it. And this happened. No. What the hell is going on? The game's behavior was scaring me. And I hadn't even started the levels yet. I, I couldn't understand why I was randomly given a new character, and, but then denied use of it. But for the time being, there was little that could be done. And I viewed the last TV screen. No animation. No music. Just dead. Every instinct I had was telling me to stop playing. To just turn the game off. And something in the game itself might have been trying to warn me as to just how horrible this last world was. But, but then every stretch of the way, I was compelled to give up. I, I couldn't do that now on the last world. Besides, after taunting me with memories of Melissa, I felt this game owed me some answers. I noticed that the first level was a red temple. So at least I would be familiar with the level graphics, if nothing else. And I went in with Godzilla, the monster I'm most familiar with. Godzilla had been shrunk. The level in score meters had vanished and the blue temple faces were back the music was similar to the blue temple also strange haunting vocalization i tried to get my spirits up by thinking well if this level is like the blue level blue temple then it might mean there are no monsters to deal with how wrong I was. After a short walk, all the statue eyes started glowing, and a pack of the beasts from Shadow Labyrinth came charging at me. Since they were coming from the right side of the screen, I had to fight my way through them. The battle greatly tested my reflexes, but Thanks to my speed, I plowed through the beasts. They gave off health power-ups after dying, which helped recover the damage they had given me. However, as I continued through the hallway, the statue's eyes glowed again, summoning another wave. It seemed to be the same number of them. 
but I was less prepared this time and took more damage. I had gone through four of these waves until I reached the end of the hall, where I heat beamed the last of the monsters over the edge of the abyss. At first, it seemed as though I'd reached a dead end, but after the statue's eyes stopped glowing, a brick path appeared before me. I followed the path, which kept me moving towards the right until it stopped at a wall. Where I was to go vertically by jumping up ledges. Along the way, I had encountered new creatures and some sort of strange shrine, which I had a statue of the Hell Beast and some other creature I didn't recognize. As I went through, the path took a downward direction. I had to carefully aim my jumps to avoid the enemies. Which were plentiful in this part of the stage. They didn't have many attacks, but they could easily shove you over the plat off the edge of the platform. At the end of this tunnel, there were a few small platforms floating above nothingness. I landed on one towards the left of the screen. And then something came down from above. It looked like the blue angel from the graveyard, except now it was red, had a skull face. Any of the pleasant feelings I had from the blue angel were not present with this red one. And as it hovered around, its eye sockets started glowing just like the statue, summoning monsters to attack me. Surely this was not the benevolent thing I encountered before. This must be some kind of imposter. The battle was nerve-wracking. And I started off with nearly half my health and had to go deal with multiple opponents as well as the threat of gravity. To make things worse, as the Red Angel took damage, some of the panels fell until only three remained. But my luck had not ran out yet. Just when I thought it was over, I struck the angel, Red Angel one more time, and it turned out one last hit was all it could take. just as the red angel completely disintegrated. The game instantly went back to the zenith board. I moved Mothra over to the nearest stage from the red temple, which seemed to be a garbled mess of the letters spelling kill, and began playing. I suspected all of the level graphics were made of jumbled letters, and Mothra, just like Godzilla, were shrunk to half size. I began to suspect that all of the Zenith levels would be like this. The background music was terrible, as if someone put all the sounds the NES and NES was capable of making into a blender and then piecing them back together into a song. I had to turn the volume down because of it. Playing as Mothra made avoiding the enemies easier, but they were nonetheless determined to get at me. The first enemies were I saw were headless guy games, and later on there were hybrid monsters pieced together from previous bosses, like the bio anti headed thing seen above. Five minutes had gone by. I didn't see anything new. And the level shifted into another segment. The music changed from the loud and annoying beeps into something far more ambient and menacing. The level graphics also changed. 
now looking like a blood trunched junkyard. The way everything in this level was red made it sickening to look at. The enemy is multiplied in number, never ceasing to follow after me. It became harder and harder to avoid. And at the end of the level, the situation reached a climax. As swarms of the monsters fused into one enormous, terrifying hybrid. Once I had gotten through the initial so shock, I discovered the way of to destroy this thing, constantly shooting eye beams at the Hedora cluster that formed its heads. If you attacked anywhere else, it would regenerate the damage. Even with that knowledge, this was an extremely difficult fight. I'd say it was as hard as fighting the Moon Beast was, if not harder. Its most common attack was lunging forward with its arms covered in Gigant saws and blades, and if they touched, they would instantly drain health. When it was over, the remaining monsters collapsed in a heap. Then they got on the ground, and then they and the ground below them started to disintegrate and sink towards the bottom of the screen. When I came back to the board, I thought to myself, so far, the game's been putting the easiest levels first. If this is the case, how bad will the rest of Zenith be? Ruth. Two levels down and three to go. My monster is, and I had taken our foothold in the world of nightmares that was Zenith. This by what action? to take next, deciding what action to take next was more tense and difficult than before. But ultimately, I had no way of knowing what the next levels would be like, or how well my monsters would be prepared for them. So my only opinion was to guess. I tried to interpret what the icons of the next level was ahead of me were. The last level before the boss battles was obviously representing some type of volcano, volcanic area with lava and open flames. The middle icon I still didn't get except that it looked fleshy and vaguely organ, like an organ of some kind, oddly oversized as well. As well. The one I was nearest to and about the to enter next looked like thorny vines covered in covering in a puddle of blood. I guess this would be the one with blood rivers that like the chase level in dementia. As such I went down there with I went with Angiris. Because due to his rolling move he would have the fastest speed while submerged. This level, which I call Blood Lake, looked as I expected. Rivers of blood accompanied by thorn-covered vines, which scattered all along the sides of the ground. The music was rather faint, but I could hear a distinct drum beat underwater. Oh, well. And a few other, uh, I can hear a distinctive drum beat and a few other instruments, a lot of echoes. And sometimes it sounded like someone was hitting a drum underwater. I was disappointed to see that Angiris had shrunk just as Godzilla and Mothra had. And apparently, the zenith levels, apparently, all the zenith levels, zenith levels would be like this.
I felt less secure with my giant monsters no longer so giant. I walked along without uh, interruption for only a minute until my path reached a dead end. There was a massive gap between the ground I was walking on and the ground to the right side of the screen. I would have sailed across and I, uh, I would have continued walking to the right with a huge mass of brambles in the way. There was nowhere to go. Two creatures with gliding membranes on their arms and lamprey-like mouths were perched on the outstretched vines and screeching at me, much like a crow does to an invader of its territory. Another unnerving display, possible sentience by these creatures of the game. If, if it's even accurate to refer, to refer them as being part of the game, that is. I descended into the blood, slowly sinking to the floor. Aquatic animals were everywhere, and they were hard to avoid. The black shark in particular was very aggressive and hard to deal with, but thankfully I only encountered it once. As the screen became more and more crowded, I swam up to the surface to find what was littered, find that it was littered with floating corpses. Creepy, but at least that's not a threat. Or so I thought. Until they sprang out to life and leaped on me. They were trying to pull me under. And they were draining my health as they did it. They all attacked as a group. And when I got one off of me, another one would jump on me from behind. I had to curl up into a ball and roll for them to get loose, to loosen their grip. And when they did, I quickly retreated. It wasn't long before I had reached another land path. I know regarding the brambles, you could stand on them, but it causes pain, and you also don't want to destroy some of the vines, but only the thinner ones. I destroy multiple vines as well as dealing with more enemies. I was interrupted by a screen. The screen was about was up for about oh 30 seconds then it went back to the level i was facing another dead end and a pregnant humanoid creature being hanged from the top right of the screen by a spinal umbilical cord A niche instantly. The creature's belly was split open from the inside. And as the lower part of its body was ripped apart and fell into the river below, the blood lake's boss was revealed. came flying towards me, making a shrill, hacking scream. I was forced to move back. The bat was highly mobile boss, fast and difficult to hit. As I moved back along the ground, the monster opened its mouth and shot out a barrage of, a barrage of needles. I jumped over them and managed to give it a blow to the head, and it started flying out of my reach. As the bat was flying, it shot a stream of fire from its eye sockets.
I rolled on the ground, which drained my power, but put us at equal speed. This cycle repeated around three times until the monster was defeated. With most of my health drained, I went back to the edge of the level, and with a large bramble vine blocking the exit, was now gone. Now only two levels left to go. Who to send this time? Godzilla, Mothra, and Angiris had all completed one level, leaving Solomon. Also the mysterious fifth monster. I tried again to access it, but with no luck. I chose to use Godzilla again for the next level and Solomon for the final one. The second to last level was what I referred to as the organic level. It was the most which was the most physically visually unpleasant of them all. Right from the start I could see that the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was so gruesome and foreboding. Right from the start, I could see the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was gruesome and foreboding with the addition of the loud droning music. I was dreading what I would see in these levels, and it was only a few seconds before something appeared. Two hideous things. It's hard to describe what most of this level even everything has this disturbing semi-real look to it. Most of the monsters look halfway between real monsters and misshapen lumps of gore with teeth. It's also worth noting that all of them were considerably larger than Godzilla, and all of the majority were not very intelligent. Each of them took around 30-plus hits. To kill. Due to this, it was a better idea to run away from them than fight. But it was never clear exactly what the direction to run me to. To run and to run to. While most levels involve going to the right to get the access, the path of this level is primarily going down by walking to the edge of one platform and jumping down to a lower one. There was no way to make sure that you were going the right way, nor any apparent means of getting back up to the higher platform, if necessary. There's no way to make sure you were getting back to the going the right way, nor, nor any apparent means of getting back up to higher platforms, if necessary. Also, certain enemies acted as if they were aware you had to jump down and would stand at the edge of a lower platform waiting for you. When this happened, I would have to walk back and wait until the monster would leave. As I went on, I came across platforms stacked above each other with little space in between, looking like a maze. This meant that I couldn't jump, and it made escape from enemies difficult. Thankfully, the only enemies able to fit through these mazes were the four-legged beasts I had seen at the beginning of the level. to the difficulty were long tapeworm-esque monsters that would rise themselves between the platforms and trap you. The only thing they responded to was the heat beam, which would cause them to shrink back down, but the, this was costing even more power. And I couldn't afford to do without the heat beam for long. While trying to avoid the abominations that dwell in this level, 
I found out that if you stand idle for one place for too long, the crown tries to absorb your monster. I think it was about four minutes before the end that this level is was making me physically sick. The tension was getting to me and having to take all taken all these disgusting sights made me want to puke. I nearly did pause the game and look for a bag, but I was able to hold it together. I found also a trick at the end of the level that it was too late for me to do and a real good. But if two different species of monster run into each other face to face, then they would fight each other and leave me alone. I didn't intentionally cause this, it just happened. Finally, at the end, it was time for another boss fight. It was certainly ugly, but not quite as horrific as I feared it would be. But more important than dealing with the appearance of defeating it, with, with its appearance was defeating it. And since I had less than half my bar to start with, there was no room for errors. It was attached to the floor when I first saw it, but after 10 fit hits, it detached to the floor and began floating. It moved fast, but unlike the Blood Lakes boss, it, he'll, he wasn't impeded by any sort of gravity. It was even able to fly through the ground without collision event. Without any collision effect. It used this to its advantage. It also would float between, uh, beneath the ground and the spring and spring up and randomly bite it to bite you. But it stopped doing this after a few well-aimed kicks to the face. The pink area on its upper jaws was a weak point too. Many hits would cause them to spasm uncontrollably. The neutral strategy was rapidly was to rapidly float up and down while moving back and forth across her age. Health was getting crucial at this point, and I spammed the heat wave, which from which it had no defense. And the last stretch of this battle, the monster rapidly rushing back and forth and gnashing its jaws. I had to duck under it and then strike when its back was turned. 20 more hits and it was destroyed. And it was on to one last level. I didn't hesitate. I selected Solomon and entered. Perhaps a little too fast. This last level was definitely the peak of disconnect between what the NAS was graphically capable of and what this game could create. The music also caught my attention. It was one of the only songs that appeared more than once. The, the horrible screeching from what the Hell Beast from when the Hell Beast appeared in the graveyard. And as soon as I started, the, there was already an enemy prepared to attack, a centaur wielding a whip, and it wasn't alone. When I started fighting, several more centaurs appeared. From both sides of the scream at the same time, it was too much to handle. Solomon's flight saved me from taking too much damage at the start of the level. The centaurs followed him, but seemed unable to be unable to jump. After escaping the centaurs, I noticed gaps in the ground.
yeah, if the, while trying to avoid the jumping sword mouthed enemies in mid flight, I got close to the surface of the lava, and a creature emerged and tried to grab me. But it didn't succeed, but I was startled. Careful maneuvering would be needed here to avoid instant death. As new enemies appeared, the level soon became very difficult. A lot of the trouble came from stocky red demons that t stood on top of tall, narrow mountains and spewed fire. I got them by waiting until their back was turned and then hitting them with a flying kip, which made them fall, fall off the lava. It was at this time that I noticed that I wasn't gaining any health from killing enemies. Not at all. The ground was... Not all the ground was stable. At one point, the ground was reduced to small chunks that slowly drifted towards the right. Some of them would sink to the lava upon repeating... upon uh, landing on them. And there was no way they could tell which ones would sink and which ones would not. Being close to the lava added the threat of the lava creatures, and this was very frustrating. I was also feeling hot, which made concentrating hard. If you ever had a heat rash, it felt similar to that. I had to periodically stop for water because of it. This was almost certainly due to the game and not my imagination, but I kept pushing through the thought out of my head. I didn't want to think about it. At the end of the stage, I encountered the boss rising from the lava. Its arrival noted with a godly, unhowling roar. When it walked onto the land, I could saw how gigantic it was. Several times the size of Solomon. I was about to fly up and attack it when it opened its mouth and let out a huge blast of fire. I had to fly to dodge the flames and then get close enough to the boss to fire a heat beam at its face, causing it to stumble backward. If it didn't stumble backward, it would have kept moving left until... It was forced Solomon into the lava, and as there was no more guard within reach. The beast had to wait between uses of its fire breath, and it seemed to cost a great deal of energy. I used this time to attack it. But fire wasn't the only weapon, and I had to wear, be wary of the monster swatting at me with its clawed hands. Its, its health decreased, it moved faster, and the battle felt like a tug of war between two monsters over the, this bridge of land. After about 40 hits, it was defeated, tumbling backwards into the lava from whence it came. And then the final stage had been completed. At last, it was down to two bosses and a final encounter with the Hell Beast. For some reason, I thought Ghidorah would be easier, so I confronted him first. The classic Ghidorah battle music from the original started up when I was faced with a new King Ghidorah. King Ghidorah was as powerful and unrelenting as ever. He instantly lashed out with gravity beams, which were damaging, more damaging than Godzilla's heat beam. It became a struggle of constantly beating Ghidorah at every opportunity to keep him from using the attack. 
Oh, Ghidorah saw soon that you know, my tactic. I started using physical attacks as well. He was striking with each of the necks, knocking me backward and making it impossible to get close enough to punch him, but I had an idea. To wait for him to lung his way out and then heads out. Wait for him to lunge with one of the heads and immediately blast it with a heat beam. It worked, and to my surprise, the heat beam actually obliterated Ghidorah's middle head. It was only a few seconds before I realized what this led to, and sure enough, King Ghidorah was using the power of the glitch to transform into Mecha King Ghidorah. But what really shocked me was the sudden change in music. I had heard it before, but it wasn't in the original NES game. It was from the game Super Godzilla during the Mecha King Ghidorah fight. Mecha King Ghidorah's first attack was its most deadly, the Machine Hand. Very similar to Gigan saw, it immobilizes the monster and rapidly drains its health, the health bar. Fortunately, before King Ghidorah could do a lot of damage, the timer ran out. I would need to defeat Mecha King God, uh, Ghidorah, Mecha King Ghidorah, quickly to prevent him from using the mecha machine time. So I sent Sol uh, Solomon to fight him. The two monsters were infinitely matched in strength. When with Ghidorah defeated, I returned to the baseball. Uh, I, retur I returned to the board. I now outnumbered the enemy by four monsters to one, and victory seemed soon at hand. The base icon had changed to a blood red color. I could feel hatred emanating from it. I started with the fight with Destroya and Angiris, and the music was the same as Ghidorah's. When the fight began, Destroya was in microscopic mode. After one hit, it changed to the Juvenile, which had few attacks. I was also deadly with, uh, I was also dealt with easily. Their fight became serious once Destroy entered his aggregate form, gaining the use of large arms and micro oxygen beam. Angiris' roll attack, which had been useful up till now, was rendered useless by Destroy constantly attacking me with his large arms when I tried to use it. For this part, I had to really rely on brute strength. Just before the time ran out, Destroy had changed to his flying form, which Angiris was ill suited to fight against. Going against him, I fought, going back in, and I fought the flying form with King Mothra before. Mothra was weaker than Angiris, but was much better equipped to dodge the encounter flying Destroyer's attacks. So the fight was in my favor. However, the Mecha Ghidorah fight started playing and Destroyer's change to his final form sooner than I expected, which drastically turned the tables. Mothra's attacks were doing very little to Destroyer. I had to move fiercely to avoid damage while waiting for the timer to run out. Even though it would be near impossible to beat Destroy with Mothra, I still had three other monsters. Final form of Destroy was very resilient to taking damage, and the heavily armored foe would not be so defeated without a long foe. Oh, without a long fight. In the last part of the fight, I wasn't using much strategy, just attacking as brutally and as fast as I could. On the last bar of health, Destroyer tried one last counterattack, a beam of energy from his chest. I 
I don't know how powerful it would have been because just before it could fire, I punched destroy in the chest cavity, destroying it. And then that was it. The last kaiju boss was gone. In the midst of all the excitement, I had briefly forgotten that there was still one last thing to do before the game was over. Seeing the icon again hit me like a ton of bricks, and I froze for a few minutes. I'd come so far to get this to this point, but I was terrified. I really did not want to know what this last encounter was going to be like before I could let myself think about it any longer. I moved Godzilla over and began the stage. You're here now. This is the end. Just one last thing and then it's all over. And when the screen changed, there was nothing. Just Godzilla on a black screen. I walked back and forth. Fired a heat beam. Nothing happened. Until I heard something. The faint sound of a familiar drumbeat. Chapter 8, Finale Part 1. Oh dear God. This was my first thought on realizing that I would have to fight Red, the creature that tormented me through nearly the whole game. How would I be able to be fight something that can kill me with one touch? It seemed totally impossible. Thankfully, Red was no longer able to deliver one-hit kills. But despite that, this is the most, still the most difficult battle I've ever faced, in this game or otherwise. If I had any real comprehension, comprehension of what, was, what I was getting myself into before I started the fight, I never would have done it. I very soon learned what a horrible mistake I had made. Red reached out and clawed at Godzilla. And when those claws cut through him, I felt it. I, I know it's not, I know that it's common for people to cringe up when their video game characters get hit or lose a life, but this was not that. This was genuine physical pain. When the, when the pain struck me i paused the game i hadn't suffered any actual injury but it felt like my shoulder had just been clawed through i had seen and experienced many unpleasant things at this point but but the game causing me real pain was where i drew the line yes i, I would be disappointed that i wouldn't get to see the ending, but the risk was no longer worth it. I was about to get up and take one last screenshot and turn off the NES when I realized something else. I couldn't get up. <laughs> I was paralyzed to my seat. The only muscles I could move were my fingers and thumbs. As the terror set in, a new message appeared on the screen. You are not I started to scream, but only a weak choking sound was coming out. I desperately tried to get my body to move, but it, it did nothing. I was looking every direction, and then I looked over at the computer. Somehow the computer screen was taking screenshots 
of the game on its own when I began the fight. I still don't know how or why. Something in the game. Must have been causing it. Since Red could hear what I was saying, I tried begging him to let me go. From here, things start to get hazy as I was under extreme stress at the time. But from what I could remember, I said, I I'm sorry. I I'm sorry I, I insulted you. I, you I, I, I didn't mean it. I, I didn't, th I didn't, th I didn't know things would get this serious. Please just let me go. Let's just let me go, yo. Uh, if you let me go, I promise I will never tell anyone. I, 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 I turn on the game ever again. Please, please. And Red replied. Survive. The statement could not be any more clear. If I couldn't kill Red, then he would kill me. Like an idiot, I had played around with something I didn't understand, and now, now it might cost me my life. I stopped struggling to move and accepted the reality of the situation. There was only one way to get out of this alive. I had to kill Red. It all went by so fast. If it weren't for the screenshots, I might not have remembered any of this. Just like in the chase level, Red moved at a horrifyingly fast speed. There was barely enough time to process a thought. And thus, there was no time to form a strategy. I had to rely solely on my wits and reflexes. To make things worse, there was no way to predict what kind of attacks Red might use. So I constantly had to be on the offensive and defensive. I felt every hit that Godzilla took. They all hurt. I tried so hard to avoid the damage, but every attack that I dodged left me vulnerable to another, and the pain would only get worse. After he jumped over me, Red's eyes started to glow. I moved back as far as I could and ducked. But there was no dodging this one. When this hit me, I really did scream. I screamed so loud that someone else in the apartment should have heard me, but they didn't. Just looking at this image hurt, hurts me. Making me remember the incinerating pain. I paused the game because it hurt so bad. But Red unpaused the game to attack me again. Which Red, which made me furious. I immediately counterattacked with the heat beam again and again until the power meter was totally diminished. I wanted Red to hurt like I did. Just before the timer ran out, Red transitioned into his swimming form. I didn't think the timer would still be affecting a battle like this, but I'm thankful for it. Because it gave me a few minutes to collect my thoughts and decide what to do next. I chose to fight Red's two next two forms with the monsters I had encountered them with. So, I, so Angiris was next. It probably wasn't all that smart of an idea, but that's what I did. I jumped up and heat beamed Red in the face, and he moved off screen where I couldn't reach him. And then a wave of large minds started to fall from above. 
I felt that this was unfair, so I shouted, If you're going to cheat, then why do you even let me use the controller? Cats break the rules. And then he came at me, rushing from the top left to the screen downwards. Yeah, damn it! Now I wouldn't be able to see where the next attack was coming from. Red continued to strike from different angles. I constantly moved to swerve around him. Another 40 seconds went by, and Angiris was nearly gone. But together we had forced Red into his flying form. So it was Mothra's turn next. Deciding to fight Red with Mothra was a terrible idea. Mothra was instantly overwhelmed by Red, and the life meter was devastated in a mere 15 seconds. And once Mothra's life was down to two bars, Red did something I did not see coming. He reached out, grabbed Mothra, and ate her. After Mothra was devoured, I, I felt an agonizing pain. Like being crushed to death. Mothra had been killed for my stupidity and I would share the pain. It was a short transition from the battle to the board, but it felt like an hour. The pain combined with being unable to move was driving me insane. I wanted so badly for this to end. I never wanted anything so much. But I, I still had hope. There was only one monster left that could be brought to full health. By engaging Red in battle, Solomon, if any of them had a chance to save my life now, it would be him. Solomon apparently had history with Red, as when the fight started, this dialogue happened. Red took me by surprise again by immediately burning me with his demonic fire a second time. As much as it hurt, it actually worked to my advantage. Since Solomon started at full life, he still had some to spare, but now Red had used up all his energy and could not use his ultimate weapon any longer. Now he would die. As he drew close to the end of his life bar, Red turned his whole body to face the screen and flew upwards, and then slamming back down in an attempt to crush Solomon. When that failed, he tried to devour Solomon like he did with Mothra, but he wouldn't be eating my monster this time. I thought I had won, but something was wrong. Red wasn't sinking to the bottom, and I still couldn't move. Red was still alive. Chapter 8, Finale, Part 2 After his seeming defeat by Solomon, Red had reconstructed his body into his gigantic final form, transporting us to a blazing inferno in the process. It was reminiscent of our first encounter, except now the scenery 
much like the true power of red had become very real. The music had erupted into a loud blaring sound, a furious drum of death. Faced against red and insane amount of health, my own demise. Solomon was my strongest monster, but he never, not even he stood a chance. It was like trying to fight a mountain. Within seconds, Solomon was overpowered and dropped to the floor. When Red crushed him to death underfoot, underneath his foot, the sadistic demon took his time as he snapped Solomon's vertebrae and ribs like dry, brittle twigs. I could tell he was enjoying our pain. This is hopeless. I'm a dead man. I had no choice but to send another monster to its death. We were all going to die. I only hoped they would forgive me. After decreasing Red's health by a minuscule amount, Angiris was also obliterated. Red unleashed a hail of blazing hot needles into his face until he collapsed. Another moment of unspeakable agony. The nothingness as my ally faded away. I asked Red how he knew my name. And then he said it. <laughs> I killed Melissa! For years, she was being tortured by something nobody understood. Now, I knew what it was. Now I understood why I was mocked about Melissa's death and how the game knew about it. Because he knew about it. Because he was the one responsible. And this time, he was going to kill me. Send your last monster. I will end this futile struggle. Those taken back to the boards to send Godzilla to his final stand. Barely anything was left on the board, just Godzilla and Red's icons and... The fifth monster. In the midst of everything that was happening, I, I had completely forgotten about it. I tried yet again to select it. I cursed, I, I begged, I screamed at it to do something, anything to help me. To no avail. There was only one thing to do. I knew Godzilla didn't stand any more of a chance than the rest did. But maybe now that all the other monsters were gone, the, the fifth monster would find, might finally awaken. I managed to get to the creature's icon selected, I, and I pressed the A button as fast as I could. The, the icon started to shake as if I were desperately trying to move. It was then that Red decided that he was done playing fair. And before I could activate the monster, he went for the killing blow. Paralyzing my heart. 
my hands started to become numb and unfeeling. But even as my vision was fading away, I still tried to press the A button. Game over. Red Shirley was breaking one of his rules, but he must have thought that if he could kill me quickly, then it would be too late for any consequences to matter. He would have won. He was wrong. Red's power was being challenged by another force. It prevented him from killing me. And then when I regained my vision, I saw a familiar sight. Heck, you don't have much time. Who are you? You already know me. I am Melissa. What? How is that possible? Rhea told me that he killed you. It it's true. Even after death, he tortures me. If you can't stop him, he'll do the same to you. How will I be able to stop him now? I can't find Red, but there is one who can. I will release him from Red's grasp. Don't give up. I love you. Her words stirred something inside me. I wasn't gonna die like this. And I had more to fight. I had more to fight her for I, than just my own life. I had to fight to save Melissa and the world she inhabits. With her help, the final monster was finally unleashed. It was time to end this. Once and for all, together, we would take this damned hell spawn out of existence. Asius was by far the strongest playable monster in the game. He had to be if we were to have any chance of surviving. His punch involved turning his hands into blades, which caused tremendous damage. But Red had more than enough life to spare. In the end, it would come down to pure skill. With one final strike, Red was destroyed. His body disintegrated and sank below, accompanied by a soar of triumphant music. Slowly, the paralysis wore off. And I was able to stand again. We had done it. Melissa's death had been avenged. And I felt overwhelming happiness. Until I remembered all the death and pain that led up to this point. All the monsters who had fought and died. I was about to mourn them, but, but the game had yet to conclude. <laughs> Tears of joy streamed down my face, and I broke down crying. I cried harder than I had in several years, maybe in my whole life. All I'd been through, all I'd discovered, and now the game was coming to an end. But before she and the others left, Melissa had something to tell me. You have saved us, and we'll, we are forever grateful. We'll be together again, someday. Yes, Godzilla. Epilogue. I am Zachary, and at the time I write this, it has been three weeks since that fateful night I played the NAS Godzilla game.
going back to that night to immediately after I turned off the NES. Once I was able to start walking around again, the first thing I did was unplug the NES, take out the cartridge and then put them in separate sock drawers. I looked over at the computer. All the screenshots you've seen in the story were saved. I backed up all the images on a flash drive before I turned the computer off, just in case. After that, I hit the bed and instantly passed out. It was not a restful sleep, but one of complete exhaustion. It felt like no time had passed before I'd woke again. And what a day that was. I first thought, but the first thought I recall coming to mind was, what the hell happened last night? I thought about it for a short while until it occurred to me to contact the person I got the game from to begin with, Billy. So I called him up and told him just to just come over to my apartment, which he did. And I showed him the screenshots and gave him a very basic summary of what happened. At first, he thought it was pulling a joke on him, but he soon realized that, that was not the case. Once it hit him, this was real. He was speechless. He, he made it clear that he had absolutely not tampered with the game and had no idea about any of this. So then the obvious question to Billy was, where did you get it from? I got the simple answer of, another friend of mine that I trade games with, he assured me that this was a trustworthy person and he had never had any issues with games he had got from them before. So then Billy called him. But when we told this guy the story, he was as shocked and surprised as anyone, except he abruptly hung up on us. This was clearly glowing nowhere. Before Billy left that day, he asked me if I wanted to, him to take the cartridge and dispose of it. I sharply declined. He asked how I could possibly still want to keep the thing. I told him that I needed time to think it over, and that was that. Billy and I haven't talked much since. Even though I've told him that this isn't the case, I get the impression that Billy thinks what happened to the, with the game is my, his fault. After he left that day, I did a lot of thinking. It was very hard for me to do anything else, really. I couldn't stop thinking about that game. There were so many questions left unanswered. What was Red? Was Melissa really in the game? How did she even get there? Why did all this happen with this game? But the question that kept me up for so many nights was, Red said he had known me for a long time. How? Ever since then, I can't shake the feeling of being watched. The game made me ask myself questions about death and reality in ways that I never wanted to think about. I'm not too sure of anything anymore. Constantly thinking about it soon began to have a negative impact on my life. I just didn't care about anything else at that point. By comparison, all the other day-to-day -day activities just seemed utterly pointless. I eventually decided that I had to choose between one or two things. Try to play the thing game again, or destroy it. I tried several times to convince myself to try to do the former, but I never got farther than plugging the NES back up. Just touching the cartridge made me remember the faint pain I felt during the fight with Red. I wondered if perhaps playing the game again myself might cause something terrible to happen. I didn't know anything about how this game worked, and it was too risky. I, I wasn't sure I could stand another round of the game anyway.
then it was time to take the other option. Wanting to get some fresh air, I took the game with me and drove to the lake, planning to throw it in. Got up to the lake with the cartridge in my hands, and I looked down on it and I, I thought of Melissa. If what had experienced if what I had experienced in the game was indeed genuine, doing what I did may have been the only way to save her from endless torture. In a way, this warped game might have saved her soul. Once that thought came into my head, I knew that I would, wouldn't be able to destroy it. So I sat down in a bench, gazing at the lake for about an hour. Ultimately, I decided on a third option. Selling the game on eBay. It may be selfish, but I promise you that it had nothing to do with money. I don't care how much or little I get paid for this game, believe me. It's selfish because I don't want the responsibility of owning this cartridge anymore. I cannot dwell on it this forever. And the only way I can deal with this is by putting the game out of my life. So this brings me to the main reason I created the summary of these events. First is to record the details while I can remember them, and second is that whoever bids on this game knows what they're getting into. I can't guarantee the safety of anyone else who plays this game or that anything will happen, but to the new owner of this game, remember this. Be careful. And if you feel as if the game is literally messing with your head, shut the damn thing off.